Chapter 17, Part 2 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 17, Part 2 Questions Regarding the Aramaic Language, Rabbinic Parallels, and Buddhistic Influence. Broadly speaking, therefore, the Son of Man problem is both historically solvable and has been solved. The authentic passages are those in which the expression is used in that apocalyptic sense which goes back to Daniel. But we have to distinguish two different uses of the term according to the degree of knowledge assumed in the hearers. If the secret of Jesus is unknown to them, then in that case they understand simply that Jesus is speaking of the Son of Man and his coming without having any suspicion that he and the Son of Man have any connection. It would be thus, for instance, when in sending out the disciples in Matthew chapter 10 verse 23, or when he pictured the judgment which the Son of Man would hold from Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46, if we may imagine it to have been spoken to the people at Jerusalem. Or, on the other hand, the secret is known to the hearers. In that case, they understand that the term Son of Man points to the position to which he himself is to be exalted when the present era passes into the age to come. It was thus, no doubt, in the case of the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, and of the high priest to whom Jesus, after answering his demand with a simple yea, from Mark chapter 14, verse 62, goes on immediately to speak of the exaltation of the Son of Man to the right hand of God, and of his coming upon the clouds of heaven. Jesus did not, therefore, veil his messiahship by using the expression Son of Man, much less did he transform it, but he used the expression to refer, in the only possible way, to his messianic office as destined to be realized at his coming and did so in such a manner that only the initiated understood that he was speaking of his own coming, while others understood him as referring to the coming of a son of man who was other than himself. The passages where the title has not this apocalyptic reference, or where, previous to the incident at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus, in speaking to the disciples, equates the son of man with his own ego, are to be explained as of literary origin. This set of secondary occurrences of the title has nothing to do with early church theology. It is merely a question of phenomena of translation and tradition. In the saying about the Sabbath in Mark chapter 2 verse 28, and perhaps also in the saying about the right to forgive sins in Mark chapter 2 verse 10, Son of Man doubtless stood in the original in the general sense of man, but was later, certainly by our evangelists, understood as referring to Jesus as the Son of Man. In other passages, tradition, following the analogy of those passages in which the title is authentic, put in place of the simple I, expressed in the Aramaic by the man, the self-designation Son of Man, as we can clearly show by comparing Matthew chapter 16 verse 13, who do men say that the Son of Man is, with Mark chapter 8 verse 27, who do men say that I am? Three passages call for special discussion. In the statement that a man may be forgiven for blasphemy against the Son of Man, but not for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, the Son of Man may be authentic. But of course it would not, even in that case, give any hint that Son of Man designates the Messiah in his humiliation as Dalman wished to infer from the passage, but would mean that Jesus was speaking of the Son of Man, here as elsewhere, in the third person, without reference to himself, and was thinking of a contemptuous denial of the parousia, such as might have been uttered by a Sadducee. But if we take into account the parallel in Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29, where blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is spoken of without any mention of blasphemy against the Son of Man, it seems more natural to take the mention of the Son of Man as a secondary interpolation, derived from the same line of tradition, perhaps from the same hand as the Son of Man, 
in the question to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. The two other sayings, the one about the Son of Man who hath not where to lay his head, from Matthew chapter 8 verse 20, and that about the Son of Man who must submit to the reproach of being a glutton and a wine-bibber, from Matthew chapter 11 verse 19, belong together. If we assume it to be possible, in conformity with the saying about the purpose of the parables, in Mark chapter 4 verses 11 and 12, that Jesus sometimes spoke in words which he did not intend to be understood, we may, if we are unwilling to accept the supposition of a later paraphrasis for the ego, which would certainly be the most natural explanation, recognize in these sayings two obscure declarations regarding the Son of Man. They would then be supposed to have meant in the original form, which is no longer clearly recognizable, that the Son of Man would in some way justify the conduct of Jesus of Nazareth. But the way in which this idea is expressed was not such as to make it easy for the hearers to identify him with the Son of Man. Moreover, it was for them a conception impossible to realize, since Jesus was a natural, and the Son of Man a supernatural being, and the eschatological scheme of things had not provided for a man who, at the end of the existing era, should hint to others that at the great transformation of all things he would be manifested as the Son of Man. This case presented itself only in the course of history and it created a preparatory stage of eschatology which does not answer to any traditional scheme. The act of the self-consciousness of Jesus, by which he recognized himself in his earthly existence as the future Messiah, is the act in which eschatology supremely affirms itself. At the same time, since it brings spiritually that which is to come into the unaltered present, into the existing era, it is the end of eschatology. For it is its spiritualization, a spiritualization of which the ultimate consequence was to be that all its supersensuous elements were to be realized only spiritually in the present earthly conditions, and all that is affirmed as supersensuous in the transcendental sense was to be regarded as only the ruined remains of an eschatological world view. The messianic secret of Jesus is the basis of Christianity since it involves the denationalizing and the spiritualization of Jewish eschatology. Yet more, it is the primal fact, the starting point, of a process which manifests itself, indeed, in Christianity, but cannot fully work itself out even here, of a movement in the direction of inwardness which brings all religious magnitudes into the one individual spiritual present, and which Christian dogmatic has not ventured to carry to its completion. The messianic consciousness of the uniquely great man of Nazareth sets up a struggle between the present and the beyond, and introduces that resolute absorption of the beyond by the present, which, in looking back, we recognize as the history of Christianity, and of which we are conscious in ourselves as the essence of religious progress and experience, a process of which the end is not yet in sight. In this sense, Jesus did accept the world, and did stand in conflict with Judaism. Protestantism was a step, a step on which hung weighty consequences, in the progress of that acceptance of the world which was constantly developing itself from within. By a mighty revolution which was in harmony with the spirit of that great primal act of the consciousness of Jesus, though in opposition to some of the most certain of his sayings, Ethics became world-accepting. But it will be a mightier revolution still when the last remaining ruins of the supersensuous, otherworldly system of thought are swept away in order to clear the sight for a new spiritual, purely real and present world. All the inconsistent compromises and constructions of modern theology are merely an attempt to stave off the final expulsion of eschatology from religion, an inevitable but a hopeless attempt. That proleptic messianic consciousness of Jesus, which was in reality the only possible actualization of the messianic idea, carries these consequences with it inexorably and unfailingly. At that last cry upon the cross, the whole eschatological supersensuous world fell in upon itself in ruins, and there remained as a spiritual reality 
only that present spiritual world, bound as it is to sense, which Jesus, by his all-powerful word, had called into being within the world which he condemned. That last cry, with its despairing abandonment of the eschatological future, is his real acceptance of the world. The Son of Man was buried in the ruins of the falling eschatological world. There remained alive only Jesus, the man. Thus, these two Aramaic synonyms include in themselves, as in a symbol of reality, all that was to come. If theology has found it so hard a task to arrive at an historical comprehension of the secret of this self-designation, this is due to the fact that the question is not a purely historical one. In this word there lies the transformation of a whole system of thought, the inexorable consequence of the elimination of eschatology from religion. It was only in this future form, not as actual, that Jesus spoke of his messiahship. Modern theology keeps on endeavoring to discover in the title of Son of Man, which is bound up with the future, a humanized present messiahship. It does so in the conviction that the recognition of a purely future reference in the messianic consciousness of Jesus would lead, in the last result, to a modification of the historic basis of our faith, which has itself become historical, and therefore true and self-justifying. The recognition of the claims of eschatology signifies for our dogmatic a burning of the boats by which it felt itself able to return at any moment from the time of Jesus direct to the present. One point that is worthy of notice in this connection is the trustworthiness of the tradition. The evangelists, writing in Greek and the Greek-speaking early church, can hardly have retained an understanding of the purely eschatological character of that self-designation of Jesus. It had become for them merely an indirect method of self-designation. And nevertheless, the evangelists, especially Mark, record the sayings of Jesus in such a way that the original significance and application of the designation in his mouth is still clearly recognizable, and we are able to determine with certainty the isolated cases in which this self-designation in his discourses is of a secondary origin. Thus, the use of the term Son of Man, which, if we admitted the sweeping proposal of Lietzmann and Wellhausen to cancel it everywhere as an interpolation of Greek early church theology, would throw doubt on the whole of the gospel tradition, becomes a proof of the certainty and trustworthiness of that tradition. We may, in fact, say that the progressive recognition of the eschatological character of the teaching and action of Jesus carries with it a progressive justification of the gospel tradition. A series of passages and discourses which had been endangered because, from the modern theological point of view which had been made the criterion of the tradition, they appeared to be without meaning, are now secured. The stone which the critics rejected has become the cornerstone of the tradition. If Aramaic scholarship appears in regard to the Son of Man question among the opponents of the thorough-going eschatological view, it takes no other position in connection with the retranslations and the application of illustrative parallels from the rabbinic literature. In looking at the earlier works in this department, one is struck with the smallness of the result in proportion to the labor expended. The names that call for mention here are those of John Lightfoot, Christian Schachten, Johann Muschen, J. J. Wittstein, F. Nork, Franz Dielich, Karl Siegfried, and A. Wunschler. But even a work like F. Weber's System der Alt-Synagogelen Palestinensischen Theologie, which does not confine itself to single sayings and thoughts, but aims at exhibiting the rabbinic system of thought as a whole, throws, in the main, but little light on the thoughts of Jesus. The rabbinic parables supply, according to Ulicker, but little of value for the explanation of the parables of Jesus. In this method of discourse, Jesus is so preeminently original that any other productions of the Jewish parabolic literature are like stunted undergrowth beside a great tree, though that has not prevented his originality from being challenged in this very department both in earlier times and at the present. As early as 1648, 
Robert Sherringham of Cambridge suggested that the parables in Matthew chapter 20 verse 1 and following, chapter 25 verse 1 and following, and Luke chapter 16 were derived from Talmudic sources, an opinion against which J. B. Karpzolf the Younger raised a protest. In 1839, F. Nork asserted in his work on Rabbinic Sources and Parallels for the New Testament Writings, that the best thoughts in the discourses of Jesus are to be attributed to his Jewish teachers. In 1880, the Dutch rabbi T. Tall maintained the thesis that the parables of the New Testament are all borrowed from the Talmud. Theories of this kind cannot be refuted, because they lack the foundation necessary to any theory which is to be capable of being rationally discussed, that of plain common sense. We possess, however, really scientific attempts to define more closely the thoughts of Jesus by the aid of the rabbinic language and rabbinic ideas in the works of Arnold Meyer and Dahlmann. It cannot, indeed, be said that the obscure sayings which form the problem of present-day exegesis are in all cases made clearer by them, much as we may admire the comprehensive knowledge of these scholars. Sometimes, indeed, they become more obscure than ever. According to Meyer, for instance, the question of Jesus whether his disciples can drink of his cup and be baptized with his baptism means, if put back into Aramaic, Can you drink as bitter a drink as I? Can you eat as sharply salted meat as I? Nor does Dolman's Aramaic retranslation help us much with the saying about the violent who take the kingdom of heaven by force. According to him, it is not spoken of the faithful, but of the rulers of this world, and refers to the epoch of the divine rule which has been introduced by the imprisonment of the Baptist. No one can violently possess himself of the divine reign, and Jesus can therefore only mean that violence is done to it in the person of its subjects. On this, it must be remarked, that if the saying really means this, it is about as appropriate to its setting as a rock in the sky. Jesus is not speaking of the imprisonment of the Baptist. By the days of John the Baptist, he means the time of his public ministry. It is equally open to question whether, in putting that crucial question regarding the Messiah in Mark chapter 12, verse 37, he really intended to show, as Dalman thinks, quote, that physical descent from David was not of decisive importance. It did not belong to the essence of the messiahship. Close quote. But a point in regard to which Dalman's remarks are of great value for the reconstruction of the life of Jesus is the entry into Jerusalem. Dalman thinks that the simple Hosanna, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord, from Mark chapter eleven verse nine, was what the people really shouted in acclamation and that the additional words in Mark and Matthew are simply an interpretive expansion. This acclamation did not itself contain any messianic reference. This explains, quote, why the entry into Jerusalem was not made a count in the charge urged against him before Pilate, close quote. The events of Palm Sunday only received their distinctively messianic color later. It was not the Messiah, but the prophet and wonder-worker of Galilee, whom the people hailed with rejoicing and accompanied with the invocations of blessing. Generally speaking, the value of Dalman's work lies less in the solutions which it offers than in the problems which it raises. By its very thorough discussions, it challenges historical theology to test its most cherished assumptions regarding the teaching of Jesus, and make sure whether they are really so certain and self-evident. Thus, in opposition to Schurer, he denies that the thought of the pre-existence in heaven of all the good things belonging to the kingdom of God was at all generally current in the late Jewish world of ideas, and thinks that the occasional references to a pre-existing Jerusalem, which shall finally be brought down to the earth, do not suffice to establish the theory. Similarly, he thinks it doubtful whether Jesus used the term this world or this age, the world or age to come, in the eschatological sense which is generally attached to them, and doubts, on linguistic grounds, whether they could have been used at all. 
Even the use of the Hebrew Aulam for world cannot be proved. In the pre-Christian period, there is much reason to doubt its occurrence, though in later Jewish literature it is frequent. The expression en te palagenesia in Matthew chapter 19 verse 28 is specifically Greek and cannot be reproduced in either Hebrew or Aramaic. It is very strange that the use which Jesus makes of amen is unknown in the whole of Jewish literature. According to the proper idiom of the language, the Hebrew amen is never used to emphasize one's own speech, but always with reference to the speech, prayer, benediction, oath, or curse of another. Close quote. Jesus, therefore, if he used the expression in this sense, must have given it a new meaning as a formula of asservation, in place of the oath which he forbade. All these acute observations are marked by the general tendency which was observable in the interpretation of the term son of man, that is, by the endeavor so to weaken down the eschatological conceptions of the kingdom and the Messiah, that the hypothesis of a making present and spiritualizing of these conceptions in the teaching of Jesus might appear inherently and linguistically possible and natural. The polemic against the pre-existing realities of the kingdom of God is intended to show that for Jesus the reign of God is a present benefit which can be sought after, given, possessed, and taken. Even before the time of Jesus, according to Dalman, a tendency had shown itself to lay less emphasis, in connection with the hope of the future, upon the national Jewish element. Jesus forced this element still farther into the background, and gave a more decided prominence to the purely religious element. Quote, for him, the reign of God was the divine power, which from this time onward was steadily to carry forward the renewal of the world, and also the renewed world, into which men shall one day enter, which even now offers itself, and therefore can be grasped and received as a present good. Close quote. The supernatural coming of the kingdom is only the final stage of the coming which is now being inwardly spiritually brought about by the preaching of Jesus. Though he may perhaps have spoken of this world and the world to come, these expressions had in use of them no very special importance. It is for him less a question of an antithesis between then and now than in establishing a connection between them by which the transition from one to the other is to be effected. It is the same in regard to Jesus' consciousness of his messiahship, says Dalman, quote, In Jesus' view, the period before the commencement of the reign of God was organically connected with the actual period of his reign, close quote. He was the messiah because he knew himself to stand in a unique ethico-religious relation to God. His messiahship was not something wholly incomprehensible to those about him. If redemption was regarded as being close at hand, the messiah must be assumed to be in some sense already present. Therefore, Jesus is both directly and indirectly spoken of as messiah. Thus, the most important work in the department of Aramaic scholarship shows clearly the anti-eschatological tendency which characterized it from the beginning. The work of Lietzmann, Meyer, Wellhausen, and Dahlmann forms a distinct episode in the general resistance to eschatology. That Aramaic scholarship should have taken up a hostile attitude towards the eschatological system of thought of Jesus lies in the nature of things. The thoughts which it takes as its standard of comparison were only reduced to writing long after the period of Jesus, and, moreover, in a lifeless and distorted form at a time when the apocalyptic temper no longer existed as the living counterpoise to the legal righteousness, and this legal righteousness had allowed only so much of apocalyptic to survive as could be brought into direct connection with it. In fact, the distance between Jesus' world of thought and this form of Judaism is as great as that which separates it from modern ideas. Thus, in Dalman, Modernizing tendencies and Aramaic scholarship were able to combine in conducting a criticism of the eschatology in the teaching of Jesus, in which the modern man thought the thoughts 
and the expert in Aramaic formulated and supported them, yet without being able, in the end, to make any impression upon the well-rounded whole formed by Jesus' eschatological preaching of the kingdom. Whether Aramaic scholarship will contribute to the investigation of the life and teaching of Jesus along other lines, and in a direct and positive fashion, only the future can show. But certainly, if theologians will give heed to the question marks so acutely placed by Dalman, and recognize it as one of their first duties to test carefully whether a thought or a connection of thought is linguistically or inherently Greek, and only Greek in character, they will derive a notable advantage from what has already been done in the department of Aramaic study. But if the service rendered by Aramaic studies has been hitherto mainly indirect, no success whatever has attended, or seems likely to attend, the attempt to apply Buddhist ideas to the explanation of the thoughts of Jesus. It could only indeed appear to have some prospect of success if we could make up our minds to follow the example of the author of one of the most recent of fictitious lives of Jesus, in putting Jesus to school to the Buddhist priests, in which case, the six years which Monsieur Nicolas Notowich allots to this purpose would certainly be none too much for the completion of the course. If imagine boggles at this, there remains no possibility of showing that Buddhist ideas exercised any direct influence upon Jesus. That Buddhism may have had some kind of influence upon late Judaism and thus indirectly upon Jesus is not inherently impossible if we are prepared to recognize Buddhist influence on the Babylonian and Persian civilizations. But it is unproved, unprovable, and unthinkable that Jesus derived the suggestion of the new and creative ideas which emerge in his teaching from Buddhism. The most that can be done in this direction is to point to certain analogies. For the parables of Jesus, Buddhist parables were suggested by Renan and Havet, how little these analogies mean in the eyes of a cautious observer is evident from the attitude which Max Muller took up towards the question. He remarks in one passage, quote, that there are startling coincidences between Buddhism and Christianity cannot be denied, and it must likewise be admitted that Buddhism existed at least 400 years before Christianity. I go even further and say that I should be extremely grateful if anybody would point out to me the historical channels through which Buddhism had influenced early Christianity. I have been looking for such channels all my life, but hitherto I have found none. What I have found is that for some of the most startling coincidences, there are historical antecedents on both sides, and, if we once know these antecedents, the coincidences become far less startling. Close quote. A year before Max Muller formulated his impression in these terms, Rudolf Seidel had endeavored to explain the analogies which had been noticed by supposing Christianity to have been influenced by Buddhism. He distinguishes three distinct classes of analogies. 1. Those of which the points of resemblance can without difficulty be explained as due to the influence of similar sources and motives in the two cases. 2 those which show a so special and unexpected agreement that it appears artificial to explain it from the action of similar causes, and the dependence of one upon the other commends itself as the most natural explanation. 3. Those in which there exists a reason for the occurrence of the idea only within the sphere of one of the two religions or in which at least it can very much more easily be conceived as originating within the one than within the other, so that the inexplicability of the phenomenon within the one domain gives ground for seeking its source within the other. This last class demands a literary explanation of the analogy. Seidel therefore postulates, alongside of primitive forms of Matthew and Luke, a third source, quote, a poetic apocalyptic gospel of very early date, which fitted its Christian material into the frame of a Buddhist type of gospel, transforming, purifying, and ennobling the material taken from the foreign but related literature by a kind of rebirth inspired by the Christian spirit. Matthew and Luke, especially Luke, 
follow this poetic gospel up to the point where historic sources become more abundant, and the primitive form of Mark begins to dominate their narrative. But even in later parts, the influence of this poetical source, which, as an independent document, was subsequently lost, continued to make itself felt. The strongest point of support for this hypothesis, if a mere conjecture can be described as such, is found by Seidel in the introductory narratives in Luke. Now it is not inherently impossible that Buddhist legends, which in one form or another were widely current in the East, may have contributed more or less to the formulation of the mythical preliminary history. Who knows the laws of the formation of legend? Who can follow the course of the wind which carries the seed over land and sea? But in general, it may be said that Seidel actually refutes the hypothesis which he is defending. If the material which he brings forward is all that there is to suggest a relation between Buddhism and Christianity, we are justified in waiting until new discoveries are made in that quarter before asserting the necessity of a Buddhist primitive gospel. That will not prevent a succession of theosophic lives of Jesus from finding their account in Seidel's classical work. Seidel indeed delivered himself into their hands because he did not entirely avoid the rash assumption of theosophic historical science that Jewish eschatology can be equated with Buddhistic. Edward von Hartmann, in the second edition of his work, The Christianity of the New Testament, roundly asserts that there can be no question of any relation of Jesus to Buddha, nor of any indebtedness either in his teaching or in the later molding of the story of his life, but only of a parallel formation of myth. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18, Part 1 of the Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 18, Part 1. The Position of the Subject at the Close of the Nineteenth Century. Bibliography Oscar Holtzmann, The Life of Jesus, Tumingen, 1901, 417 pages. The Messianic Consciousness of Jesus and the Most Recent Denial of It, A Lecture Against Vreda, 1902, 26 pages. Was Jesus an Ecstatic? Tumingen, 1903, 139 pages. Paul Wilhelm Schmidt, The History of Jesus, Freiburg, 1899, 175 pages, Fourth Impression. The History of Jesus, Preliminary Discussions, with three maps by Professor K. Fuhrer of Zurich. Tumingen, 1904, 414 pages. Otto Schmiedel, The Main Problems in the Study of the Life of Jesus. Tumingen, 1902, 71 pages, Second Edition, 1906. Hermann Freidherr von Zoden, The Most Important Questions About the Life of Jesus, Vacation Lectures, Berlin, 1904, 111 pages. Gustav Frenzen, The Manuscript, in which a life of Jesus, written by one of the characters of the story, is given in full. Berlin, 1905, pages 462 through 593. Otto Fleiderer, Primitive Christianity, Its Documents and Doctrines in Their Historical Context. Second Edition, Berlin, 1902. Volume 1, 696 pages. How Primitive Christianity Arose. Munich, 1905, 255 pages. Albert Kaltoff, The Christ Problem, The Ground Plan of a Social Theology. Leipzig, 1902, 87 pages. How Christianity Arose, New Contributions to the Christ Problem, Leipzig, 1904, 155 pages. Edward von Hartmann, The Christianity of the New Testament, Second Revised Edition of Letters on the Christian Religion. Satya in the Hars, 
1905, 311 pages. De Jong, Yeshua, the classical Jewish man, in which the Jewish picture of Jesus is unveiled and the ecclesiastical picture destroyed. Berlin, 1904, 112 pages. Wolfgang Kirchbach, What Was the Teaching of Jesus? Two Primitive Gospels. Berlin, 1897, 248 pages. Second Revised and Greatly Enlarged Edition, 1902, 339 pages. Albert Dulk, The False Step in the Life of Jesus, in Historical View. First Part, 1884, 395 pages. Second Part, 1885, 302 pages. Paul de Regia, Jesus of Nazareth, Leipzig, 1894, 435 pages. Ernest Bosque, The Secret Life of Jesus of Nazareth and the Oriental Origins of Christianity, Paris, 1902. The ideal life of Jesus of the close of the 19th century is the life which Heinrich Julius Holtzmann did not write, but which can be pieced together from his commentary on the Synoptic Gospels and his New Testament theology. It is ideal because, for one thing, it is unwritten, and arises only in the idea of the reader by the aid of his own imagination, and, for another, because it is traced only in the most general outline. What Holtzmann gives us is a sketch of the public ministry, a critical examination of details, and a full account of the teaching of Jesus. He provides, therefore, the plan and the prepared building material, so that anyone can carry out the construction in his own way and on his own responsibility. The cement and the mortar are not provided by Holtzmann. Everyone must decide for himself how he will combine the teaching and the life, and arrange the details within each. We may recall the fact that Weisse, too, the other founder of the Markan hypothesis, avoided writing a life of Jesus, because the difficulty of fitting the details into the ground plan appeared to him so great, not to say insuperable. It is just this modesty which constitutes his greatness and Holtzmann's. Thus, the Markan hypothesis ends, as it had begun, with a certain historical skepticism. The subordinates, it is true, do not allow themselves to be disturbed by the change of attitude at headquarters. They keep busily at work. That is their right, and therein consists their significance. By keeping on trying to take the positions, and constantly failing, they furnish a practical proof that the plan of operations worked out by the general staff is not capable of being carried out, and show why it is so and what kind of new tactics will have to be evolved. The credit of having written a life of Jesus which is strictly scientific, in its own way very remarkable, and yet foredoomed to failure, belongs to Oskar Holtzmann. He has complete confidence in the Markan plan, and makes it his task to fit all the sayings of Jesus into this framework, to show, quote, what can belong to each period of the preaching of Jesus, and what cannot. Close quote. His method is to give free play to the magnetic power of the most important passages in the Markan text, making other sayings of similar import detach themselves from their present connection and come and group themselves round the main passages. For example, the controversy with the scribes at Jerusalem regarding the charge of doing miracles by the help of Satan from Mark chapter 3, verses 22 through 30, belongs, according to Holtzmann, as regards content and chronology, to the same period as the controversy in Mark chapter 7, about the ordinances of men which results in Jesus being obliged to take flight, the woes pronounced upon Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, which now follow on the eulogy upon the Baptist, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 21 through 23, and are, accordingly, represented as having been spoken at the time of the sending forth of the twelve, are drawn by the same kind of magnetic force into the neighborhood of Mark chapter 7, and, quote, express very clearly the attitude of Jesus at the time of his withdrawal from the scene of his earlier ministry, close quote. 
The saying in Matthew chapter 7 verse 6 about not giving that which is holy to the dogs or casting pearls before a swine does not belong to the Sermon on the Mount but to the time when Jesus, after Caesarea Philippi, forbids the disciples to reveal the secret of his messiahship to the multitude. Jesus' action in cursing the fig tree so that it should henceforth bring no fruit to its owner, who was perhaps a poor man, is to be brought into relation with the words spoken on the evening before, with reference to the lavish expenditure involved in his anointing, The poor ye have always with you. The point being that Jesus now, quote, in the clear consciousness of his approaching death, feels his own worth, and dismisses the contingency of even the poor having to lose something for his sake. Close quote. With the words, quote, it does not matter. Close quote. All these transpositions and new connections mean, it is clear, a great deal of internal and external violence to the text. A further service rendered by this very thorough work of Oscar Holtzmann's is that of showing how much reading between the lines is necessary in order to construct a life of Jesus on the basis of the Markan hypothesis in its modern interpretation. It is thus, for instance, that the author must have acquired the knowledge that the controversy about the ordinances of purification in Mark chapter 7 forced the people, quote, to choose between the old and the new religion, close quote. in which case it is no wonder that many turned back from following Jesus. Where are we told that there was any question of an old and a new religion? The disciples certainly did not think of things in this way, as is shown by their conduct at the time of his death and the discourses of Peter in Acts. Where do we read that the people turned away from Jesus? In Mark chapter 7, verses 17 and 24, all that is said is that Jesus left the people. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 33, the same multitude is still assembled when Jesus returns from the banishment into which Holtzmann relegates him. Oscar Holtzmann declares that we cannot tell what was the size of the following which accompanied Jesus in his journey northwards and is inclined to assume that others besides the twelve shared his exile. The evangelists, however, say clearly that it was only the mathetai, that is, the twelve, who were with him. The value which this special knowledge, independent of the text, has for the author, becomes evident a little further on. After Peter's confession, Jesus calls the multitude to him, from Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and speaks to them of his sufferings, and of taking up the cross and following him. This multitude, Holtzmann wants to make, quote, the whole company of Jesus' followers, to which belonged not only the twelve, whom Jesus had formerly sent out to preach, but many others also. Close quote. The knowledge drawn from outside the text is therefore required to solve a difficulty in the text, but how did his companions in exile, the remnant of the previous multitude, themselves become a multitude, the same multitude as before? Would it not be better to admit that we do not know how, in a Gentile country, the multitude could suddenly rise out of the ground, as it were, continue with him until Mark chapter 9 verse 30, and then disappear into the earth as suddenly as they came? leaving him to pursue his journey towards Galilee and Jerusalem alone. Another thing which Oscar Holtzmann knows is that it required a good deal of courage for Peter to hail Jesus as Messiah, since the, quote, exile wandering about with his small following in a Gentile country answered so badly to the general picture which people had formed of the coming of the Messiah, close quote. He knows, too, that in the moment of Peter's confession, quote, Christianity was complete, in the sense that a community separate from Judaism and centering about a new ideal then arose, Close quote. This community frequently appears from this point onwards. There is nothing about it in the narratives which know only the twelve and the people, Oscar Holtzmann's knowledge even extends to dialogues which are not reported in the Gospels. 
After the incident at Caesarea Philippi, the minds of the disciples were, according to him, preoccupied by two questions. How did Jesus know that he was the Messiah? And what will be the future fate of this Messiah? The Lord answered both questions. He spoke to them of his baptism, and, quote, doubtless in close connection with that, close quote, he told them the story of his temptation, during which he had laid down the lines which he was determined to follow as Messiah. Of the transfiguration, Oscar Holtzmann can state with confidence, quote, that it merely represents the inner experience of the disciples at the moment of Peter's confession, close quote. How is it, then, that Mark expressly dates that scene, placing it, in Mark chapter 9, verse 2, six days after the discourse of Jesus about taking up the cross and following him? The fact is that the time indications of the text are treated as non-existent whenever the Markan hypothesis requires an order determined by inner connection. The statement of Luke that the transfiguration took place eight days after is dismissed in the remark, quote, The motive of this indication of time is doubtless to be found in the use of the gospel narratives for reading in public worship. The idea was that the section about the transfiguration should be read on the Sunday following that on which the confession of Peter formed the lesson. Close quote. Where did Oscar Holtzmann suddenly discover this information about the order of the Sunday lessons? at the time when Luke's gospel was written. It was doubtless from the same private source of information that the author derived his knowledge regarding the gradual development of the thought of the passion in the consciousness of Jesus. He explains, quote, After the confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus' death became for him only the necessary point of transition to the glory beyond. In the discourse of Jesus, to which the request of Salome gave occasion, the death of Jesus already appears as the means of saving many from death, because his death makes possible the coming of the kingdom of God. At the institution of the supper, Jesus regards his imminent death as the meritorious deed by which the blessings of the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins and victory over sin, are permanently secured to his community. We see Jesus constantly becoming more and more at home with the idea of his death, and constantly giving it a deeper interpretation. Close quote. Anyone who is less skilled in reading the thoughts of Jesus, and more simple and natural in his reading of the text of Mark, cannot fail to observe that Jesus speaks in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, of his death as an expiation, not as a means of saving others from death, and that at the Lord's Supper there was no reference to his community, but only to the inexplicable many, which is also the word in Mark chapter 10 verse 45. We ought to admit freely that we do not know what the thoughts of Jesus about his death were at the time of the first prediction of the Passion after Peter's confession and to be on our guard against the original sin of theology, that of exalting the argument from silence, when it appears to be useful, to the rank of positive realities. Is there not a certain irony in the fact that the application of natural psychology to the explanation of the thoughts of Jesus compels the assumption of supra-historical private information such as this? Bart and Venturini hardly read more subjective interpretations into the text than many modern lives of Jesus. And the hypothesis of the secret society, which, after all, did recognize and do justice to the inexplicability, from an external standpoint, of the relations of events and of the conduct of Jesus, was, in many respects, more historical than the psychological links of connection which our modernizing historians discover without having any foundation for them in the text. In the end, this supplementary knowledge destroys the historicity of the simplest sections. Oscar Holtzmann ventures to conjecture that the healing of the blind man at Jericho, quote, is to be understood as a symbolical representation of the conversion of Zacchaeus, close quote. 
which, of course, is found only in Luke. Here, then, the defender of the Markan hypothesis rejects the incident by which the evangelist explains the enthusiasm of the entry into Jerusalem, not to mention that Luke tells us nothing whatever about a conversion of Zacchaeus, but only that Jesus was invited to his house and graciously accepted the invitation. It would be something if this almost Alexandrian symbolical exegesis contributed in some way to the removal of difficulties and to the solution of the main problem, that, namely, of the present or future Messiah, the present or future kingdom. Oscar Holtzmann lays great stress upon the eschatological character of the preaching of Jesus regarding the kingdom, and assumes that, at least at the beginning, it would not have been natural for his hearers to understand that Jesus, the herald of the Messiah, was himself the Messiah. Nevertheless, he is of opinion that, in a certain sense, the presence of Jesus implied the presence of the kingdom, that Peter and the rest of the disciples, advancing beyond the ideas of the multitude, recognized him as Messiah, that this recognition ought to have been possible for the people also, and, in that case, would have been, quote, the strongest incentive to abandon evil ways, and that Jesus, at the time of his entry into Jerusalem, seems to have felt that in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 11, there was a direct command not to withhold the knowledge of his messiahship from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Close quote. But if this Jesus made a messianic entry, he must thereafter have given himself out as messiah, and the whole controversy would necessarily have turned upon this claim. This, however, was not the case. According to Holtzmann, all that the hearers could make out of that crucial question for the messiahship in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37, was only, quote, that Jesus clearly showed from the scriptures that the Messiah was not in reality the son of David. Close quote. But how was it that the messianic enthusiasm on the part of the people did not lead to a messianic controversy, in spite of the fact that Jesus, quote, from the first came forward in Jerusalem as Messiah, close quote. This difficulty Holtzmann seems to be trying to provide against when he remarks in a footnote, quote, We have no evidence that Jesus, even during the last sojourn in Jerusalem, was recognized as Messiah except by those who belonged to the inner circle of disciples. The repetition by the children of the acclamations of the disciple, from Matthew chapter 21, verses 15 and 16, can hardly be considered of much importance in this connection. Close quote. According to this, Jesus entered Jerusalem as Messiah, but except for the disciples and a few children, no one recognized his entry as having a messianic significance. But Mark states that many spread their garments upon the way, and others plucked down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way and that those that went before and those that followed after cried, Hosanna! The Mark and narrative must therefore be kept out of sight for the moment, in order that the life of Jesus as conceived by the modern Mark and hypothesis may not be endangered. We should not, however, regard the evidence of supernatural knowledge and the self-contradictions of this life of Jesus as a matter for censure but rather as a proof of the merits of Oscar Holtzmann's work. He has written the last large-scale life of Jesus, the only one which the Markan hypothesis has produced, and aims at providing a scientific basis for the assumptions which the general lines of that hypothesis compel him to make. And in this process, it becomes clearly apparent that the connection of events can only be carried through at the decisive passages by violent treatment, or even by rejection of the Markan text in the interests of the Markan hypothesis. These merits do not belong in the same measure to the other modern lives of Jesus, which follow more or less the same lines. They are short sketches, in some cases based on lectures, and their brevity makes them perhaps more lively and convincing than Holtzmann's work, but they take for granted just what he felt it necessary to prove. P. W. Schmidt's Geschichte Jesu from 1899, 
which as a work of literary art has few rivals among theological works of recent years confines itself to pure narrative the volume of prolegomena which appeared in 1904 and is intended to exhibit the foundations of the narrative treats of the sources of the kingdom of god of the son of man and of the law it makes the most of the weakening of the eschatological standpoint which is manifested in the second edition of johannes weiss's preaching of jesus but it does not give sufficient prominence to the difficulties of reconstructing the public ministry of jesus neither otto schmiedel's the principal problems of the study of the life of jesus nor von soden's vacation lectures on the principal questions in the life of jesus fulfills the promise of its title they both aim rather at solving new problems proposed by themselves than at restating the old ones and adding new they hope to meet the views of johannes weiss by strongly emphasizing the eschatology and think they can escape the critical skepticism of writers like volkmar and brand by assuming an ur marcus their view is therefore that with a few modifications dictated by the eschatological and skeptical school the traditional conception of the life of jesus is still tenable whereas it is just the a priori presuppositions of this conception hitherto held to be self-evident which constitute the main problems says von soden in one passage quote, it is self-evident in view of the inner connection in which the kingdom of god and the messiah stood in the thoughts of the people that in all classes the question must have been discussed so that jesus could not permanently have avoided their question what of the messiah art thou not he Close quote. where in the synoptics is there a word to show that this is self-evident when the disciples in mark chapter eight tell jesus who men held him to be none of them suggests that any one had been tempted to regard him as the messiah and that was shortly before jesus set out for jerusalem from the day when the envoys of the scribes from jerusalem first appeared in the north the easily influenced galilean multitude began according to von soden to waver how does he know that the galileans were easily influenced how does he know they wavered the gospels tell us neither one nor the other the demand for a sign was to quote von soden again a demand for a proof of his messiahship adds the author quote, yet another indication that later christianity in putting so high a value on the miracles of jesus as a proof of his messiahship departed widely from the thoughts of jesus Close quote before leveling reproaches of this kind against later christianity it would be well to point to some passages of mark or matthew in which there is mention of a demand for a sign as a proof of his messiahship when the appearance of jesus in the south we are still following von soden aroused the messianic expectations of the people as they had formerly been aroused in his native country quote, they once more failed to understand the correction of them which jesus had made by the manner of his entry and his conduct in jerusalem Close quote. they are unable to understand this transvaluation of values and as often as the impression made by his personality suggested the thought that he was the messiah they became doubtful again wherein consisted the correction of the messianic expectation given at the triumphal entry was it that he rode upon an ass would it not be better if modern historical theology instead of always making the people grow doubtful were to grow a little doubtful of itself and to begin to look for the evidence of that transvaluation of values which according to them the contemporaries of jesus were not able to follow von soden also possesses special information about the quote, peculiar history of the origin close quote, of the messianic consciousness of jesus he knows that it was subsidiary to a primary general religious consciousness of sonship the rise of this messianic consciousness implies in its turn the quote, transformation of the conception of the kingdom of god 
and explains how, in the mind of Jesus, this conception was both present and future. Close quote. The greatness of Jesus is, he thinks, to be found in the fact that for him this kingdom of God was only a limiting conception, the ultimate goal of a gradual process of approximation. Quote, to the question whether it was to be realized here or in the beyond, Jesus would have answered as he answered a similar question. That no man knoweth, no, not the Son. Close quote. As if he had not answered that question in the petition, Thy kingdom come, supposing that such a question could ever have occurred to a contemporary, in the sense that the kingdom was to pass from the beyond into the present. This modern historical theology will not allow Jesus to have formed a theory to explain his thoughts about his passion. Quote, For him, the certainty was amply sufficient. My death will affect what my life has not been able to accomplish. Close quote. Is there, then, no theory implied in the saying about the ransom for many, and in that about my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, although Jesus does not explain it? How does von Soden know what was amply sufficient for Jesus or what was not? Otto Schmiedel goes so far as to deny that Jesus gave distinct expression to an expectation of suffering. The most he can have done, and this is only a perhaps, is to have hinted at it in his discourses. In strong contrast with this confidence in committing themselves to historical conjectures, stands the skepticism with which von Soden and Schmiedel approach the Gospels. Says Schmiedel, quote, It is at once evident that the great groups of discourses in Matthew, such as the Sermon on the Mount, the Seven Parables of the Kingdom, and so forth, were not arranged in this order in the source, that is, the Logia, still less by Jesus himself. The order is, doubtless, due to the evangelist, but what is the answer to the question, on what grounds is this at once clear? Close quote. Von Soden's pronouncement is even more radical. He says, quote, In the composition of the discourses, no regard is paid in Matthew any more than in John to the supposed audience, or to the point of time in the life of Jesus to which they are attributed. Close quote. As early as the Sermon on the Mount, we find references to persecutions and warnings against false prophets. Similarly, in the charge to the Twelve, there are also warnings, which undoubtedly belong to a later time. Intimate sayings, evidently intended for the inner circle of the disciples, have the widest publicity given to them. But why should whatever is incomprehensible to us be unhistorical? Would it not be better simply to admit that we do not understand certain connections of ideas and turns of expression in the discourses of Jesus? But instead, even of making an analytical examination of the apparent connections and stating them as problems, the discourses of Jesus and the sections of the Gospels are tricked out with ingenious headings which have nothing to do with them. Thus, for instance, von Soden heads the Beatitudes, from Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, what Jesus brings to men. The following verses, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, what he makes of men. P. W. Schmidt, in his History of Jesus, shows himself a past master in this art. The rights of the wife is the title of the dialogue about divorce, as if the question at stake had been for Jesus the equality of the sexes, and not simply and solely the sanctity of marriage. Sunshine for the children is the heading for the scene where Jesus takes the children in his arms, as if the purpose of Jesus had been to protest against severity in the upbringing of children. Again, he brings together the stories of the man who must first bury his father, of the rich young man, of the dispute about precedence, of Zacchaeus, and others which have equally little connection under the heading Discipline for Jesus' Followers. 
these often brilliant creations of artificial connections of thought give a curious attractiveness to the works of schmidt and von soden the latter's survey of the gospels is a really delightful performance but this kind of thing is not consistent with pure objective history end of chapter eighteen part one Chapter 18, Part 2 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 18, Part 2 The Position of the Subject at the Close of the Nineteenth Century disposing in this lofty fashion of the connection of events schmiedel and von soden do not find it difficult to distinguish between mark and ur marcus that is to retain just so much of the gospel as will fit to their construction schmiedel feels sure that mark was a skilful writer and that the redactor was quote, a christian of pauline sympathies close quote. according to ur marcus to which mark chapter four verse thirty three belongs the lord speaks in parables in order that the people may understand him the better Quote, it was only by the redactor that the pauline theory about the hardening of the hearts from romans chapters nine through eleven was interpolated in mark chapter four verse ten and following and the meaning of mark chapter four verse thirty three was thus obscured Close quote. It is high time that instead of merely asserting Pauline influences in Mark, some proof of the assertion should be given. What kind of appearance would Mark have presented if it had really passed through the hands of a Pauline Christian? Von Soden's analysis is no less confident. The three outstanding miracles, the stilling of the storm, the casting out of the legion of devils, the overcoming of death, from Mark chapter 4, verse 35, and mark chapter five verse forty three the romantically told story of the death of the baptist from mark chapter six verses seventeen through twenty nine the story of the feeding of the multitudes in the desert of jesus's walking on the water and of the transfiguration upon an high mountain and the healing of the lunatic boy all these are dashed in with a broad brush and offer many analogies to old testament stories and some suggestions of Pauline conceptions and reflections of experiences of individual believers and of the Christian community. Quote, All these passages were, doubtless, first written down by the compiler of our gospel. Close quote. But how can Schmiedel and von Soden fail to see that they are heading straight for Bruno Bauer's position? They assert that there is no distinction of principle between the way in which the Johannine and the synoptic discourses are composed. The recognition of this was Bruno Bauer's starting point. They propose to find experiences of the Christian community and Pauling teaching reflected in the Gospel of Mark. Bruno Bauer asserted the same. The only difference is that he was consistent and extended his criticisms to those portions of the Gospel which do not present the stumbling block of the supernatural. Why should these not also contain the theology and the experiences of the community transformed into history? Is it only because they remain within the limits of the natural? The real difficulty consists in the fact that all the passages which von Soden ascribes to the redactor's stand, in spite of their mythical coloring, in a closely knit historical connection, in fact, the historical connection is nowhere so close. How can any one cut out the feeding of the multitudes and the transfiguration as narratives of secondary origin without destroying the whole of the historical fabric of the Gospel of Mark? Or was it the redactor who created the plan of the Gospel of Mark, as von Soden seems to imply? But in that case, how can a modern life of Jesus be founded on the Markan plan? How much of Mark is, in the end, historical? Why should not Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi 
have been derived from the theology of the primitive church just as well as the transfiguration. The only difference is that the incident at Caesarea Philippi is more within the limits of the possible, whereas the scene upon the mountain has a supernatural coloring. But is the incident at Philippi so entirely natural? Whence does Peter know that Jesus is the Messiah? This semi-skepticism is therefore quite unjustifiable, since in Mark, natural and supernatural both stand in an equally good and close historical connection. Either, then, one must be completely skeptical, like Bruno Bauer, and challenge without exception all the facts and connections of events asserted by Mark. Or, if one means to found an historical life of Jesus upon Mark, one must take the gospel as a whole because of the plan which runs right through it, accepting it as historical, and then endeavoring to explain why certain narratives, like the feeding of the multitude and the transfiguration, are bathed in a supernatural light, and what is the historical basis which underlies them. A division between the natural and supernatural in Mark is purely arbitrary, because the supernatural is an essential part of the history. The mere fact that he has not adopted the mythical material of the childhood stories and the post-resurrection scenes ought to have been accepted as evidence that the supernatural material which he does embody belongs to a category of its own, and cannot be simply rejected as due to the invention of the primitive Christian community. It must belong in some way to the original tradition. Oscar Holtzmann realizes that to a certain extent. According to him, Mark is a writer, quote, who embodied the materials which he received from the tradition more faithfully than discriminatingly. That which was related as a symbol of inner events, he takes as history. In the case, for example, of the temptation, the walking on the sea, the transfiguration of Jesus. Again, in other cases, he has made a remarkable occurrence into a supernatural miracle, as in the case of the feeding of the multitude, where Jesus' courageous love and ready organizing skill overcame a momentary difficulty, whereas the evangelist represent it as an amazing miracle of divine omnipotence. Close quote. Oscar Holtzmann is thus more cautious than von Soden. He is inclined to see in the material which he wishes to exclude from the history not so much inventions of the church as mistaken shaping of the history by Mark, and in this way he gets back to genuine old-fashioned rationalism. In the feeding of the multitude, Jesus showed, quote, the confidence of a courageous housewife who shows how to provide skillfully for a great crowd of children from small resources. Close quote. Perhaps in a future work, Oscar Holtzmann will be less reserved, not for the sake of theology, but of national well-being, and will inform his contemporaries what kind of domestic economy it was which made it possible for our Lord to satisfy with five loaves and two fishes several thousand hungry men. Modern historical theology, therefore, with its three-quarters skepticism, is left at last with only a torn and tattered gospel of Mark in its hands. One would naturally suppose that these preliminary operations upon the source would lead to the production of a life of Jesus of a similarly fragmentary character. Nothing of the kind. The outline is still the same as in Schenkel's day, and the confidence with which the construction is carried out is not less complete. Only the catchwords with which the narrative is enlivened have been changed, being now taken in part from Nietzsche, the liberal Jesus has given place to the Germanic Jesus. This is a figure which has a little to do with the Markan hypothesis, as the liberal Jesus had which preceded it. Otherwise, it could not so easily have survived the downfall of the Gospel of Mark as an historical source. It is evident, therefore, that this professedly historical Jesus is not a purely historical figure, but one which has been artificially transplanted into history. As formerly in Renan, the Romantic spirit created the personality of Jesus in its own image, so at the present day the Germanic spirit is making a Jesus after its own likeness. 
what is admitted as historic is just what the spirit of the time can take out of the records in order to assimilate it to itself and bring out of it a living form Frensen betrays the secret of his teachers when in hillen genlai he confidently superscribes the narrative drawn from the quote, latest critical investigations close quote, with the title the life of the savior portrayed according to german research as the basis for a spiritual rebirth of the german nation as a matter of fact the life of jesus of the manuscript is unsatisfactory both scientifically and artistically just because it aims at being at once scientific and artistic if only frensen with his strongly life-accepting instinct which gives to his thinking at least in his earliest writings where he reveals himself without artificiality such a wonderful simplicity and force had dared to read his jesus boldly from the original records without following modern historical theology in all its meanderings he would have been able to force his way through the underwood well enough if only he had been content to break the branches that got in his way instead of always waiting until someone went in front to disentwine them for him the dependence to which he surrenders himself is really distressing in reading almost every paragraph one can tell whether kai jans was looking as he wrote it into oscar holtzmann or p w schmidt or von soden franzen resigns the dramatic scene of the healing of the blind man at jericho why because at this point he was listening to holtzmann who proposes to regard the healing of the blind man as only a symbolical representation of the quote, conversion of zacchaeus close quote. Frenzen's masters have robbed him of all creative spontaneity he does not permit himself to discover motifs for himself but confines himself to working over and treating in cruder colors those which he finds his teachers and since he cannot veil his assumptions in the cautious carefully modulated language of the theologians the faults of the modern treatment of the life of jesus appear in him exaggerated and hundredfold the violent dislocation of narratives from their connection and the forcing upon them of modern interpretation becomes a mania with the writer and a torture to the reader the range of knowledge not drawn from the text is infinitely increased kai jans sees jesus after the temptation cowering beneath the brow of the hill quote, a poor lonely man torn by fearful doubts a man of the deepest distress Close quote. he knows too that there was often great danger that jesus would quote, betray the father in heaven and go back to his village to take up his handicraft again but now as a man with a torn and distracted soul and a conscience tortured by the gnawings of remorse Close quote. the pupil is not content as his teachers had been merely to make the people sometimes believe in jesus and sometimes doubt him he makes the enthusiastic earthly messianic belief of the people tug and tear at jesus himself sometimes one is tempted to ask whether the author in his zeal quote, to use conscientiously the results of the whole range of scientific criticism close quote, has not forgotten the main thing the study of the gospels themselves and is all this science supposed to be new is this picture of jesus really the outcome of the latest criticism has it not been in existence since the beginning of the forties since vice's criticism of the gospel history is it not in principle the same as renan's only that germanic lapses of taste here take the place of gallic and quote, german art for german people close quote, here quite out of place has done its best to remove from the picture every trace of fidelity kai jan's manuscript represents the limits of the process of diminishing the personality of jesus Weisse left him still some greatness something unexplained and did not venture to apply to everything the petty standards of inquisitive modern psychology in the sixties 
psychology became more confident and Jesus smaller. At the close of the century, the confidence of psychology is at its greatest, and the figure of Jesus at its smallest. So small that Franz ventures to let his life be projected and written by one who is in the midst of a love affair. This human life of Jesus is to be heart-stirring from beginning to end, and, quote, in no respect to go beyond human standards, close quote. And this Jesus, who, quote, racks his brains and shapes his plans, close quote, is to contribute to bring about a rebirth of the German people. How could he? He is himself only a phantom created by the Germanic mind in pursuit of a religious will-o'-the-wisp. It is possible, however, to do injustice to Frenzen's presentation, and to the whole of the confident, unconsciously modernizing criticism, of which he here acts as a mouthpiece. These writers have the great merit of having brought certain cultured circles nearer to Jesus, and made them more sympathetic towards him. Their fault lies in their confidence, which has blinded them to what Jesus is and is not, what he can and cannot do, so that, in the end, they fail to understand the signs of the times, either as historians or as men of the present. If the Jesus who owes his birth to the Markan hypothesis and modern psychology were capable of regenerating the world, he would have done it long ago, for he is nearly sixty years old, and his latest portraits are much less lifelike than those drawn by Weisse, Schenkel, and Renan, or by Keim, the most brilliant painter of them all. For the last ten years, modern historical theology has more and more adapted itself to the needs of the man in the street. More and more, even in the best class of works, it makes use of attractive headlines as a means of presenting its results in a lively form to the masses. Intoxicated with its own ingenuity in inventing these, it becomes more and more confident in its cause, and has come to believe that the world's salvation depends in no small measure upon the spreading of its own assured results, broadcast among the people. It is time that it should begin to doubt itself, to doubt its historical Jesus, to doubt the confidence with which it has looked to its own construction for the moral and religious regeneration of our time. Its Jesus is not alive, however Germanic they may make him. It is no accident that the chief priest of German art for German people found himself at one with the modern theologians and offered them his alliance. Since the sixties, the critical study of the life of Jesus in Germany has been unconsciously under the influence of an imposing modern religious nationalism in art. It has been deflected by it as by an underground magnetic current. It was in vain that a few purely historical investigators uplifted their voices in protest. The process had to work itself out. For historical criticism had become, in the hands of most of those who practiced it, a secret struggle to reconcile the Germanic religious spirit with the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. It was concerned for the religious interests of the present. Therefore, its error had a kind of greatness. It was, in fact, the greatest thing about it, and the severity with which the pure historian treats it is in proportion to his respect for its spirit. For this German critical study of the life of Jesus is an essential part of German religion. As of old Jacob wrestled with the angel, so German theology wrestles with Jesus of Nazareth, and will not let him go until he bless it, that is, until he will consent to serve it, and will suffer himself to be drawn by the Germanic spirit into the midst of our time and our civilization. But when the day breaks, the wrestler must let him go. He will not cross the ford with us. Jesus of Nazareth will not suffer himself to be modernized. As an historic figure, he refuses to be detached from his own time. He has no answer for the question, Tell us thy name in our speech and for our day. But he does bless those who have wrestled with him, so that, though they cannot take him with him, yet, 
like men who have seen God face to face and received strength in their souls, they go on their way with renewed courage, ready to do battle with the world and its powers. But the historic Jesus and the Germanic spirit cannot be brought together except by an act of historic violence, which, in the end, injures both religion and history. A time will come when our theology, with its pride in its historical character, will get rid of its rationalistic bias. This bias leads it to project back into history what belongs to our own time, the eager struggle of the modern religious spirit with the spirit of Jesus, and seek in history justification and authority for its beginning. The consequence is that it creates the historical Jesus in its own image, so that it is not the modern spirit influenced by the spirit of Jesus, but the Jesus of Nazareth constructed by modern historical theology that is set to work upon our race. Therefore, both the theology and its picture of Jesus are poor and weak. Its Jesus, because he has been measured by the petty standard of modern man at variance with himself, not to say of the modern candidate in theology who has made shipwreck. The theologians themselves, because instead of seeking, for themselves and others, how they may best bring the spirit of Jesus in living power into our world, they keep continually forging new portraits of the historical Jesus, and think they have accomplished something great when they have drawn an O oh, of astonishment from the multitude, such as the crowds of a great city emit on catching sight of a new advertisement in colored lights. Anyone who, admiring the force and authority of genuine rationalism, has got rid of the naive self-satisfaction of modern theology, which is, in essence, only the degenerate offspring of rationalism with a tincture of history, rejoices in the feebleness and smallness of its professedly historical Jesus, rejoices in all those who are beginning to doubt the truth of this portrait, rejoices in the over-severity with which it is attacked, rejoices to take a share in its destruction. Those who have begun to doubt are many, but most of them only make known their doubts by their silence. There is one, however, who has spoken out, and one of the greatest, Otto Pfleiderer. In the first edition of his Ur Christentum, published in 1887, he still shared the current conceptions and constructions, except that he held the credibility of Mark to be more affected than was usually supposed by hypothetical Pauline influences. In the second edition, his positive knowledge has been ground down in the struggle with the skeptics. It is Brandt who has especially affected him and with the partisans of eschatology. This is the first advance guard action of modern theology coming into touch with the troops of Reimarus and Bruno Bauer. Fleiderer accepts the purely eschatological conception of the kingdom of God, and holds also that the ethics of Jesus were wholly conditioned by eschatology. But in regard to the question of the messiahship of Jesus, he takes his stand with the skeptics. He rejects the hypothesis of a messiah who, as being a spiritual messiah, conceals his claim, but on the other hand, he cannot accept the eschatological son of man messiahship having reference to the future, which the eschatological school finds in the utterances of Jesus, since it implies prophecies of his suffering, death, and resurrection which criticism cannot admit. Quote, Instead of finding the explanation of how the messianic title arose in the reflections of Jesus about the death which lay before him, close quote, he is inclined to find it, quote, rather in the reflection of the Christian community upon the catastrophic death and exaltation of its Lord after this had actually taken place. Close quote. Even the Markan narrative is not history. The skepticism in regard to the main source with which writers like Oskar Holtzmann, Schmiedel, and von Soden conduct a kind of intellectual flirtation, is here erected into a principle. Says Fleiderer, quote, It must be recognized that in respect of the recasting of the history under theological influences, the whole of our Gospels stands in principle on the same footing. The distinction between Mark, the other two synoptists, and John is only relative a distinction of degree corresponding to different stages of theological reflection, 
and the development of the ecclesiastical consciousness. Close quote. If only Bruno Bauer could have lived to see this triumph of his opinion. Fleiderer, however, is conscious that skepticism, too, has its difficulties. He wishes, indeed, to reject the confession of Jesus before the Sanhedrin, quote, because its historicity is not well established, that is, none of the disciples were present to hear it, and the apocalyptic prophecy which is added in Mark chapter 14, verse 62, is certainly derived from the ideas of the primitive church. Close quote. On the other hand, he is inclined to admit as possibilities, though marking them with a note of interrogation, that Jesus may have accepted the homage of the Passover pilgrims, and that the controversy with the scribes about the son of David had some kind of reference to Jesus himself. On the other hand, he takes it for granted that Jesus did not prophesy his death, on the ground that the arrest, trial, and betrayal must have lain outside all possibility of calculation even for him. All these, he thinks, came upon Jesus quite unexpectedly. The only thing that he might have apprehended was, quote, an attack of hired assassins, close quote. And it is to this that he refers in the saying about the two swords in Luke chapter 22, verse 36 and verse 38, seeing that two swords would have sufficed as a protection against such an attack as that, though hardly for anything further. When, however, he remarks in this connection that this has been constantly overlooked in the romances dealing with the life of Jesus, he does injustice to Bart and Venturini, since, according to them, the chief concern of the secret society in the later period of the life of Jesus was to protect Jesus from the assassination with which he was menaced, and to secure his formal arrest and trial by the Sanhedrin. Their view of the historical situation is therefore identical with Fleiderer's, viz. that assassination was possible, but that administrative action was unexpected and is inexplicable. But how is this Jesus to be connected with primitive Christianity? How did the primitive church's belief in the messiahship of Jesus arise? To that question, Fleiderer can give no other answer than that of Volkmar and Brandt, that is to say, none. He laboriously brings together wood, straw, and stubble, but where he gets the fire from to kindle the whole into the ardent faith of primitive Christianity, he is unable to make clear. According to Albert Kaltoff, the fire lighted itself. Christianity arose by spontaneous combustion, when the inflammable material, religious and social, which had collected together in the Roman Empire, came in contact with the Jewish messianic expectations. Jesus of Nazareth never existed, and even supposing he had been one of the numerous Jewish messiahs who were put to death by crucifixion, he certainly did not found Christianity. The story of Jesus which lies before us in the Gospels is, in reality, only the story of the way in which the picture of Christ arose, that is to say, the story of the growth of the Christian community. There is, therefore, no problem of the life of Jesus, but only a problem of Christ. Kaltoff has not, indeed, always been so negative. When, in the year 1880, he gave a series of lectures on the life of Jesus, he felt himself justified, quote, in taking as his basis, without further argument, the generally accepted results of modern theology, close quote. Afterwards, he became so completely doubtful about the Christ after the flesh, whom he had at that time depicted before his hearers, that he wished to exclude him even from the register of theological literature, and omitted to enter these lectures in the list of his writings, although they had appeared in print. His quarrel with the historical Jesus of modern theology was that he could find no connecting link between the life of Jesus constructed by the later and primitive Christianity. Modern theology, he remarks in one passage with great justice, finds itself obliged to assume, at the point where the history of the church begins, quote, an immediate declension from and falsification of a pure original principle, close quote, and that in so doing, quote, it is deserting the recognized methods of historical science, close quote. If, then, we cannot trace the path from its beginnings onward, 
we had better try to work backwards, endeavoring first to define in the theology of the primitive church the values which we shall look to find again in the life of Jesus. In that he is right. Modern historical theology will not have refuted him until it has explained how Christianity arose out of the life of Jesus without calling in that theory of an initial fall, of which Harnack, Wernle, and all the rest make use. Until this modern theology has made it, in some measure, intelligible how, under the influence of the Jewish messianic sect, in the twinkling of an eye, in every direction at once, Greco-Roman popular Christianity arose, until at least it has described the popular Christianity of the first three generations, it must concede to all hypotheses which fairly face this problem and endeavor to solve it their formal right of existence. The criticism which Kaltoff directs against the positive accounts of the life of Jesus is, in part, very much to the point. He says in one place, quote, Jesus has been made the receptacle into which every theologian pours his own ideas. Close quote. He rightly remarks that if we follow the Christ backwards from the epistles and gospels of the New Testament right to the apocalyptic vision of Daniel, we always find in him superhuman traits alongside of the human. He insists, quote, Never and nowhere is he that which critical theology has endeavored to make out of him a purely natural man, an indivisible historical unit. The title of Christ had been raised by the messianic apocalyptic writings so completely into the sphere of the heroic that it had become impossible to apply it to a mere historical man. Close quote. Bruno Bauer had urged the same considerations upon the theology of his time, declaring it to be unthinkable, that a man could have arisen among the Jews and declared, I am the Messiah. But the unfortunate thing is that Kaltoff has not worked through Bruno Bauer's criticism, and does not appear to assume it as a basis, but remains standing halfway, instead of thinking the questions through to the end, as that keen critic did. According to Kaltoff, it would appear that, year in, year out, there was a constant succession of messianic disturbances among the Jews and of crucified claimants of the messiahship. He says in one place, quote, There had been many a Christ before there was any question of a Jesus in connection with this title. Close quote. How does Kaltoff know that? If he had fairly considered and felt the force of Bruno Bauer's arguments, he would never have ventured on this assertion he would have learned that it is not only historically unproved, but intrinsically impossible. But Kaltoff was in far too great a hurry to present to his readers a description of the growth of Christianity, and therewith of the picture of the Christ, to absorb thoroughly the criticism of his great predecessor. He soon leads his reader away from the high road of criticism into a morass of speculation, in order to arrive by a short cut at Greco-Roman primitive Christianity. But the trouble is that while the guide walks lightly and safely, the ordinary man, weighed down by the pressure of historical considerations, sinks to rise no more. The conjectural argument which Kaltoff follows out is in itself acute, and forms a suitable pendant to Bauer's reconstruction of the course of events. Bauer proposed to derive Christianity from the Greco-Roman philosophy. Kaltoff, recognizing that the origin of popular Christianity constitutes the main question, takes as his starting point the social movements of the time. In the Roman Empire, so runs his argument, among the oppressed masses of the slaves and the populace, eruptive forces were concentrated under high tension. A communistic movement arose, to which the influence of the Jewish element in the proletariat gave a messianic apocalyptic coloring. The Jewish synagogue influenced Roman social conditions, so that, quote, the crude social ferment at work in the Roman Empire amalgamated itself with the religious and philosophical forces of the time to form the new Christian social movement, close quote. Early Christian writers had learned in the synagogue to construct 
personifications. The whole late Jewish literature rests upon this principle. Thus, the Christ became the ideal hero of the Christian community. Quote, from the socio-religious standpoint, the figure of Christ is the sublimated religious expression for the sum of the social and ethical forces which were at work at a certain period. Close quote. The Lord's Supper was the memorial feast of this ideal hero. Quote, As the Christ to whose parousia the community looks forward, this hero-god of the community bears within himself the capacity for expansion into the God of the universe, into the Christ of the Church, who is identical in essential nature with God the Father. Thus, the belief in the Christ brought the messianic hope of the future into the minds of the masses, who had already a certain organization, and by directing their thoughts towards the future, it won all those who were sick of the past and despairing about the present. Close quote. The death and resurrection of Jesus represent experiences of the community. Quote, For a Jew crucified under Pontius Pilate, there was certainly no resurrection. All that is possible is a vague hypothesis of a vision lacking all historical reality, or an escape into the vaguenesses of theological phraseology. But for the Christian community, the resurrection was something real, a matter of fact. For the community as such was not annihilated in that persecution. It drew from it, rather, new strength and life. Close quote. But what about the foundations of this imposing structure? For what he has to tell us about the condition of the Roman Empire and the social organization of the proletariat in the time of Trajan, for it was then that the church first came out into the light, we may leave the responsibility with Kaltoff but we must inquire more closely how he brings the Jewish apocalyptic into contact with the Roman proletariat. Communism, he says, was common to both. It was the bond which united the apocalyptic otherworldliness with reality. The only difficulty is that Kaltoff omits to produce any proof out of the Jewish apocalypses that communism was, quote, the fundamental economic idea of the apocalyptic writers, close quote. He operates from the first with a special preparation of apocalyptic thought, of a socialistic or Hellenistic character. Messianism is supposed to have taken its rise from the Deuteronomic reform as, quote, a social theory which strives to realize itself in practice, close quote. The apocalyptic of Daniel arose, according to him, under Platonic influence, quote, the figure of the Messiah thus became a human figure. It lost its specifically Jewish traits. Close quote. He is the heavenly, prototypal, ideal man. Along with this thought, and similarly derived from Plato, the conception of immortality makes its appearance in apocalyptic. This Platonic apocalyptic never had any existence, or at least to speak with the utmost possible caution, its existence must not be asserted in the absence of all proof. But, supposing it were admitted, that Jewish apocalyptic had some affinity for the Hellenic world, that it was Platonic and communistic, how are we to explain the fact that the Gospels, which describe the genesis of Christ and Christianity, imply a Galilean and not a Roman environment? As a matter of fact, Kaltoff says, they do imply a Roman environment. The scene of the gospel history is laid in Palestine, but it is drawn in Rome. The agrarian conditions implied in the narratives and parables are Roman. A vineyard with a winepress of its own could only be found, according to Kaltoff, on the large Roman estates. So too the legal conditions. The right of the creditor to sell the debtor with his wife and children is a feature of Roman, not Jewish law. Peter everywhere symbolizes the church at Rome. The confession of Peter had to be transferred to Caesarea Philippi because this town, quote, as the seat of the Roman administration, close quote, symbolized for Palestine the political presence of Rome. The woman with the issue was perhaps Popea Sabina, the wife of Nero, quote, 
who, in view of her strong leaning towards Judaism, might well be described in the symbolical style of the apocalyptic writings as the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Close quote. The story of the unfaithful steward alludes to Pope Calixtus, who, when the slave of a Christian in high position, was condemned to the mines for the crime of embezzlement. That of the woman who was a sinner refers to Marcia, the powerful mistress of Commodus, at whose intercession Calixtus was released, to be advanced soon afterwards to the bishopric of Rome. Kaltoff suggests, quote, These two narratives, therefore, which very clearly allude to events well known at that time, and doubtless much discussed in the Christian community, were admitted into the gospel to express the views of the church regarding the life story of a Roman bishop which had run its course under the eyes of the community, and thereby to give to the events themselves the church's sanction and interpretation. Close quote. Kaltoff does not, unfortunately, mention whether this is a case of simple ingenuous or of conscious didactic early Christian imagination. That kind of criticism is a casting out of Satan by the aid of Beelzebub. If he was going to invent on this scale, Kaltoff need not have found any difficulty in accepting the figure of Jesus evolved by modern theology. One feels annoyed with him because, while his thesis is ingenious, and, as against modern theology, has a considerable measure of justification, he has worked it out in so uninteresting a fashion. He has no one but himself to blame for the fact that instead of leading to the right explanation, it only introduced a wearisome and unproductive controversy. In the end, there remains scarcely a shade of distinction between Kaltoff and his opponents. They want to bring their historical Jesus into the midst of our time. He wants to do the same with his Christ. He says, quote, A secularized Christ, as the type of the self-determined man, who, amid strife and suffering, carries through victoriously and fully realizes his own personality, in order to give the infinite fullness of love which he bears within himself as a blessing to mankind. A Christ such as that, can awaken to new life the antique Christ type of the church. He is no longer the Christ of the scholar, of the abstract theological thinker with his scholastic rules and methods. He is the people's Christ, the Christ of the ordinary man, the figure in which all those powers of the human soul which are most natural and simple, and therefore most exalted and divine, find an expression at once sensible and spiritual. Close quote. But that is precisely the description of Jesus of modern historical theology. Why then make this long roundabout through skepticism? The Christ of Kaltoff is nothing else than the Jesus of those whom he combats in such a lofty fashion. The only difference is that he draws his figure of Christ in red ink on blotting paper, and because it is red in color and smudgy in outline, wants to make out that it is something new. End of chapter 18, part 2《The Quest of the Historical Jesus》by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 18, Part 3. The Position of the Subject at the Close of the Nineteenth Century. It is on ethical grounds that Edward von Hartmann refuses to accept the Jesus of modern theology. He finds fault with it because in its anxiety to retain a personality which would be of value to religion, it does not sufficiently distinguish between the authentic and the historical Jesus. When criticism has removed the paintings over and retouchings to which this authentic portrait of Jesus has been subjected, it reaches, according to him, an unrecognizable painting below, in which it is impossible to discover any clear likeness, least of all one of any religious use and value. 
were it not for the tenacity and the simple fidelity of the epic tradition nothing whatever would have remained of the historic jesus what has remained is merely of historical and psychological interest at his first appearance the historic jesus was according to edward von hartmann almost an impersonal being since he regarded himself so exclusively as the vehicle of his message that his personality hardly came into question as time went on however he developed a taste for glory and for wonderful deeds and fell at last into a condition of quote, abnormal exaltation of personality close quote. in the end he declares himself to his disciples and before the council as messiah quote, when he felt his death drawing nigh he struck the balance of his life found his mission a failure his person and his cause abandoned by god and died with the unanswered question on his lips my god why hast thou forsaken me Close quote. it is significant that edward von hartmann has not fallen into the mistake of schopenhauer and many other philosophers of identifying the pessimism of jesus with the indian speculative pessimism of buddha the pessimism of jesus he says is not metaphysical it is a pessimism of indignation born of the intolerable social and political conditions of the time von hartmann also clearly recognizes the significance of eschatology but he does not define its character quite correctly since he bases his impressions solely on the talmud hardly making any use of the old testament of enoch the psalms of solomon baruch or fourth ezra he has an irritating way of still using the name jehovah like rimarus von hartmann's positions are simply modernized rimarus he is anxious to show that christian theology has lost the right quote, to treat the ideal kingdom of god as belonging to itself Close quote jesus and his teaching so far as they have been preserved belong to judaism his ethic is for us strange and full of stumbling blocks he despises work property and the duties of family life his gospel is fundamentally plebeian and completely excludes the idea of any aristocracy except in so far as it consents to plebeianize itself and this is true not only as regards the aristocracy of rank property and fortune but also the aristocracy of intellect von hartmann cannot resist the temptation to accuse jesus of quote, semitic harshness close quote, finding the evidence of this chiefly in mark chapter four verse twelve where jesus declares that the purpose of his parables was to obscure his teaching and cause the hearts of the people to be hardened his judgment upon jesus is quote, he had no genius but a certain talent which in the complete absence of any sound education produced in general only moderate results and was not sufficient to preserve him from numerous weaknesses and serious errors at heart a fanatic and a transcendental enthusiast who in spite of an inborn kindliness of disposition hates and despises the world and everything it contains and holds any interest in it to be injurious to the sole true transcendental interest an amiable and modest youth who through a remarkable concatenation of circumstances arrived at the idea which was at that time epidemic that he was himself the expected messiah and in consequence of this met his fate Close quote. it is to be regretted that a mind like edward von hartmann's should not have got beyond the externals of the history and made an effort to grasp the simple and impressive greatness of the figure of jesus in its eschatological setting and that he should imagine he has disposed of the strangeness which he finds in jesus when he has made it as small as possible and yet in another respect there is something satisfactory about his book it is the open struggle of the germanic spirit with jesus in this battle the victory will rest with true greatness others wanted to make peace before the struggle or thought that theologians could fight the battle alone and spare their contemporaries the doubts about the historical jesus through which it was necessary to pass in order to reach the eternal jesus and to this end 
they kept preaching reconciliation while fighting the battle. They could only preach it on a basis of postulates, and postulates make poor preaching. Thus, Ulliger, for example, in his latest sketches of the life of Jesus, distinguishes between Jewish and supra-Jewish in Jesus, and holds that Jesus transferred the ideal of the kingdom of God, quote, to the solid ground of the present, bringing it into the course of historical events, close quote and further associated with the kingdom of God, the idea of development which was utterly opposed to all Jewish ideas about the kingdom. Yuliger also desires to raise, quote, the strongest protest against the poor little definition of his preaching, which makes it consist in nothing further than an announcement of the nearness of the kingdom, an exhortation to the repentance necessary as a condition for attaining the kingdom. Close quote. But when has a protest against the pure truth of history ever been of any avail? Why proclaim peace when there is no peace, and attempt to put back the clock of time? It is not enough that Schleiermacher and Ritschel succeeded again and again in making theology send on earth peace instead of a sword, and does not the weakness of Christian thought, as compared with the general culture of our time, result from the fact that it did not face the battle when it ought to have faced it, but persisted in appealing to a court of arbitration on which all the sciences were represented, but which it had successfully bribed in advance. Now there comes to join the philosophers a jurist. Herr Dr. Jurist de Jong lends his aid to Eduard von Hartmann in, quote, destroying the ecclesiastical and unveiling the Jewish picture of Jesus. De Jong is a Jew by birth, baptized in 1889, who, on the 22nd of November, 1902, again separated himself from the Christian communion, and was desirous of being received back, with certain evangelical reservations, into the Jewish community. In spite of his faithful observance of the law, this was refused. Now he is waiting, quote, until, in the synagogue of the twentieth century, a freedom of conscience is accorded to him equal to that which in the first century was enjoyed by John, the beloved disciple of Yeshua of Nazareth. In the meantime, he beguiles the period of waiting by describing Jesus and his earliest followers in the character of pattern Jews, and sets them to work in the interest of his quote, Jewish views with evangelical reservations. Close quote. It is the colorless, characterless Jesus of the superintendents and consistorial rats, which especially arouses his enmity. With this figure, he contrasts his own Jesus, the man of holy anger, the man of holy calm, the man of holy melancholy, the master of dialectic, the imperious ruler, the man of high gifts and practical ability, the man of inexorable consistency and reformed vigor. Jesus was, according to De Jong, a pupil of Hillel. He demanded voluntary poverty only in special cases, not as a general principle. In the case of the rich young man, he knew, quote, that the property which he had inherited was derived in this particular case from impure sources which must be cut off at once and forever, Close quote. But how does De Jong know that Jesus knew this? A writer who is attacking the common theological picture of Jesus, and who displays, in this process, as De Jong does, not only wit and address, but historical intuition, ought not to fall into the error of the theology with which he is at feud. He ought to use sober history as his weapon against the supplementary knowledge which his opponents seem to find between the lines, instead of meeting it with an esoteric historical knowledge of his own. De Jong knows that Jesus possessed property inherited from his father. Quote, One proof may serve where many might be given, the hasty flight into Egypt with his whole family to escape from Herod, and the long sojourn in that country. Close quote. De Jong knows, he is here, however, following the Gospel of John, to which he everywhere gives the preference, that Jesus was between forty and fifty years old, at the time of his first coming forward publicly. The statement in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, that he was 30 years old, 
can only mislead those who do not remember that Luke was a portrait painter, and only meant that, quote, Yeshua, in consequence of his glorious beauty and his ever youthful appearance, looked ten years younger than he really was. Close quote. De Jong knows also that Jesus, at the time when he first emerged from obscurity, was a widower and had a little son, the lad of John chapter 6 verse 9, who had the five barley loaves and two fishes, was in fact his son. This and many other things the author finds in the glorious John. According to De Jong too, we ought to think of Jesus as the aristocratic Jew, more accustomed to a dress coat than to a workman's blouse, something of an expert, as appears from some of the parables, in matters of the table, and conning the menu with interest when he dined with privy finance counsellor Zacchaeus. But this is to modernize more distressingly than even the theologians. De Jong's one-sided preference for the fourth gospel is shared by Kirkbach's book, What Did Jesus Teach? But here, everything, instead of being Judaized, is spiritualized. Kirkbach does not seem to have been acquainted with Noack's History of Jesus. Otherwise, he would hardly have ventured to repeat the same experiment without the latter's touch of genius and with much less skill and knowledge. The teaching of Jesus is interpreted on the lines of the Kantian philosophy. The saying, No man hath seen God at any time, is to be understood as if it were derived from the same system of thought as the critique of pure reason. Jesus always used the words death and life in a purely metaphorical sense. Eternal life is for him not a life in another world, but in the present. He speaks of himself as the Son of God, not as the Jewish Messiah. Son of man is only the ethical explanation of Son of God. The only reason why a Son of Man problem has arisen is because Matthew translated the ancient term Son of Man in the original collection of Logia with extreme literality. The great discourse of Matthew chapter 23 with its warnings and threatenings is, according to Kirkbach, merely, quote, a patriotic oration in which Jesus gives expression in moving words to his opposition to the Pharisees and his inborn love of his native land. Close quote. The teaching of Jesus is not ascetic. It closely resembles the real teaching of Epicurus. Quote, that is, the rejection of all false metaphysics and the resulting condition of blessedness, of Makaria. Close quote. The only purpose of the demand addressed to the rich young man was to try him. Quote, if the youth, instead of slinking away dejectedly because he was called upon to sell all his goods, had replied, confident in the possession of a rich fund of courage, energy, ability, and knowledge, write, gladly, it will not go to my heart to part with my little bit of property. If I'm not to have it, why then I can do without it. The rabbi would probably, in that case, not have taken him at his word, but would have said, Young man, I like you. You have a good chance before you. You may do something in the kingdom of God, and in any case, for my sake, you may attach yourself to me by way of trial. We can talk about your stocks and bonds later. Close quote. Finally, Kirkbach succeeds, though only, it must be admitted, by the aid of some rather awkward phraseology, in spiritualizing John chapter 6. He explains, quote, It is not the body of the long-departed thinker who apparently attached no importance whatever to the question of personal survival, that we, who understand him in the right Greek sense, eat, in the sense which he intended, we eat and drink and absorb into ourselves his teaching, his spirit, his sublime conception of life, by constantly recalling them in connection with the symbol of bread and flesh, the symbol of blood, the symbol of water. Worthless as Kirkbach's Life of Jesus is from an historical point of view, it is quite comprehensible as a phase in the struggle between the modern view of the world and Jesus. The aim of the work is to retain his significance for a metaphysical and non-ascetic time, and since it is not possible to do this in the case of the historical Jesus, 
the author denies his existence in favor of an apocryphal Jesus. It is, in fact, the characteristic feature of the life of Jesus' literature on the threshold of the new century, even in their productions of professedly historical and scientific theology, to subordinate the historical interest to the interest of the general worldview. And those who wrest the kingdom of heaven are beginning to wrest Jesus himself along with it. Men who have no qualifications for the task, whose ignorance is nothing less than criminal, who loftily anathematize scientific theology instead of making themselves in some measure acquainted with the researches which it has carried out, feel impelled to write a life of Jesus, in order to set forth their general religious view in a portrait of Jesus which has not the faintest claim to be historical, and the most far-fetched of these find favor and are eagerly absorbed by the multitude. It would be something to be thankful for if all these lives of Jesus were based on as definite an idea and as acute historical observation as we find in Albert Dulk's The False Step in the Life of Jesus. In Dulk, the story of the fate of Jesus is also the story of the fate of religion. The Galilean teacher, whose true character was marked by deep religious inwardness, was doomed to destruction from the moment when he set himself upon the dizzy heights of the divine sonship and the eschatological expectation. He died in despair, having vainly expected, down to the very last, a telegram from heaven. Religion as a whole can only avoid the same fate by renouncing all transcendental elements. The vast numbers of imaginative lives of Jesus shrink into remarkably small compass on a close examination. When one knows two or three of them, one knows them all. They have scarcely altered since Venturini's time, except that some of the cures performed by Jesus are handled in the modern lives from the point of view of the recent investigations in hypnotism and suggestion. According to Paul de Regla, Jesus was born out of wedlock. Joseph, however, gave shelter and protection to the mother. De Regla dwells on the beauty of the child. Quote, His eyes were not exceptionally large, but were well opened, and were shaded by long, silky, dark-brown eyelashes, and rather deep-set. They were of a blue-gray color, which changed with changing emotions, taking on various shades, especially blue and brownish-gray. He and his disciples were Essenes, as was also the Baptist. That implies that he was no longer a Jew in the strict sense. His preaching dealt with the rights of man, and put forward socialistic and communistic demands his religion in the pure consciousness of communion with God. With eschatology, he had nothing whatever to do. It was first interpolated into his teaching by Matthew. The miracles are all to be explained by suggestion and hypnotism. At the marriage at Cana, Jesus noticed that the guests were taking too much, and therefore secretly bade the servants pour out water instead of wine, while he himself said, Drink! This is better wine. In this way, he succeeded in suggesting to a part of the company that they were really drinking wine. The feeding of the multitude is explained by striking out a couple of knots from the numbers. The rising of Lazarus by supposing it a case of premature burial. Jesus himself, when taken down from the cross, was not dead, and the Essenes succeeded in reanimating him. His work is inspired with hatred against Catholicism, but with a real reverence for Jesus. Another mere variant of the plan of Venturini is the fictitious life of Jesus of Pierre Nahor. The sentimental descriptions of nature and the long dialogues characteristic of the lives of Jesus of a hundred years ago are here again in full force. After John had already begun to preach in the neighborhood of the Dead Sea, Jesus, in company with a distinguished Brahman who possessed property at Nazareth and had an influential following in Jerusalem, made a journey to Egypt and was there indoctrinated into all kinds of Egyptian, Essene, and Indian philosophy, thus giving the author, or rather the authoress, 
an opportunity to develop her ideas on the philosophy of religion in didactic dialogues. When he soon afterwards begins to work in Galilee, the young teacher is much aided by the fact that, at the instance of his fellow traveller, he had acquired from Egyptian mendicants a practical acquaintance with the secrets of hypnotism. By his skill, he healed Mary of Magdala, a distinguished courtesan of Tiberius. They had met before at Alexandria. After being cured, she left Tiberius and went to live in a small house, inherited from her mother at Magdala. Jesus himself never went to Tiberius, but the social world of that place took an interest in him, and often had itself rowed to the beach when he was preaching. Rich and pious ladies used to inquire of him where he thought of preaching to the people on a given day, and sent baskets of bread and dried fish to the spot which he indicated, that the multitude might not suffer longer. This is the explanation of the stories about the feeding of the multitudes. The people had no idea whence Jesus suddenly obtained the supplies which he caused the disciples to distribute. When he became aware that the priests had resolved upon his death, he made his friend Joseph of Arimathea, a leading man among the Essenes, promise that he would take him down from the cross as soon as possible and lay him in the grave without other witnesses. Only Nicodemus was to be present. On the cross he put himself into a cataleptic trance. He was taken down from the cross seemingly dead, and came to himself again in the grave. After appearing several times to his disciples, he set out for Nazareth, and dragged his way painfully thither. With a last effort he reached the house of his mysterious old Indian teacher. At the door he falls, helpless, just as the morning dawns. The old slave woman recognizes him and carries him into the house where he dies. Quote, the serene, solemn night withdrew, and day broke in blinding splendor behind Tiberius. Close quote. Nicholas Notowich finds in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, And the child grew, and was in the deserts until the day of his showing unto Israel. A gap in the life of Jesus in spite of the fact that this passage refers to the Baptist, and proposes to fill it by putting Jesus to school with the Brahmins and Buddhists from his thirteenth to his twenty-ninth year. As evidence for this, he refers to statements about Buddhist worship of a certain Isa, which he professes to have found in the monasteries of Little Tibet. The whole thing is, as was shown by the experts, a bald-faced swindle and an impudent invention. To the fictitious lives of Jesus belong also, in the main, the theosophical lives, which equally play fast and loose with the history, though here with a view to proving that Jesus had absorbed the Egyptian and Indian theosophy, and had been indoctrinated with occult science. The theosophists, however, have the advantage of escaping the dilemma between reanimation after a trance and resurrection since they are convinced that it was possible for Jesus to reassume his body after he had really died. But in the touching up and embellishment of the gospel narratives, they outdo even the romancers. Ernest Bosque, writing as a theosophist, makes it the chief aim of his work to describe the oriental origin of Christianity, and ventures to assert that Jesus was not a Semite, but an Arian, the fourth gospel is, of course, the basis of his representation. He does not hesitate, however, to appeal also to the anonymous Revelations, published in 1849, which are a mere plagiarism from Venturini. A work which is written with some ability and with much out-of-the-way learning is Did Jesus Live 100 B.C.? from the Theosophical Publishing Society, 1903. The author compares the Christian tradition with the Jewish, and finds in the latter a reminiscence of a Jesus who lived in the time of Alexander Janias, from 104 to 76 B.C. This person was transferred by the earliest evangelist to the later period, the attempt being facilitated by the fact that during the procuratorship of Pilate, a false prophet had attracted some attention. 
The author, however, only professes to offer it as a hypothesis, and apologizes in advance for the offense which it is likely to cause. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19, Part 1 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer Translated by William Montgomery Chapter 19 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology Bibliography William Vreda the Messianic Secret in the Gospels, forming a contribution also to the understanding of the Gospel of Mark. Göttingen, 1901, 286 pages. Albert Schweitzer, The Secret of the Messiahship and the Passion, A Sketch of the Life of Jesus. Tumingen and Leipzig, 1901, 109 pages. The coincidence between the work of Vreda and the Sketch of the Life of Jesus is not more surprising in regard to the time of their appearance than in regard to the character of their contents. They appeared upon the self-same day, their titles are almost identical, and their agreement in the criticism of the modern historical conception of the life of Jesus extends sometimes to the very phraseology. And yet, they are written from quite different standpoints, one from the point of view of literary criticism, the other from that of the historical recognition of eschatology. It seems to be the fate of the Markan hypothesis that at the decisive periods its problems should always be attacked simultaneously and independently from the literary and the historical sides, and the results declared in two different forms which corroborate each other. So it was in the case of Weisse and Vilke, so it is again now, when, retaining the assumption of the priority of Mark, the historicity of the hitherto accepted view of the life of Jesus, based upon the Markan narrative, is called into question. The meaning of that is that the literary and the eschatological view, which have hitherto been marching parallel on either flank to the advance of modern theology, have now united their forces, brought theology to a halt, surrounded it, and compelled it to give battle. That in the last three or four years so much has been written, in which this enveloping movement has been ignored, does not alter the real position of modern historical theology in the least. The fact is deserving of notice, that during this period the study of the subject has not made a step in advance, but has kept moving to and fro upon the old lines with wearisome iteration and has thrown itself with excessive zeal into the work of popularization, simply because it was incapable of advancing. And even if it professes gratitude to Vreda for the very interesting historical point which he has brought into the discussion, and is also willing to admit that thoroughgoing eschatology has advanced the solution of many problems, these are mere demonstrations which are quite inadequate to raise the blockade of modern theology by the allied forces. Supposing that only a half, nay, only a third, of the critical arguments which are common to Vreda and the sketch of the life of Jesus are sound, then the modern historical view of the history is wholly ruined. The reader of Vreda's book cannot help feeling that here no quarter is given, and any one who goes carefully through the present writer's sketch must come to see that between the modern historical and the eschatological life of Jesus, no compromise is possible. Thoroughgoing skepticism and thoroughgoing eschatology may, in their union, either destroy or be destroyed by modern historical theology, but they cannot combine with it and enable it to advance any more than they can be advanced by it we are confronted with a decisive issue. As with Strauss's Life of Jesus, so with the surprising agreement in the critical basis of these two schools. We are not here considering the respective solutions which they offer. There has entered into the domain of the theology of the day a force with which it cannot possibly ally itself. Its whole territory is threatened. It must either reconquer it, step by step, or else surrender it 
it has no longer the right to advance a single assertion until it has taken up a definite position in regard to the fundamental questions raised by the new criticism. Modern historical theology is no doubt still far from recognizing this. It is warned that the dike is letting in water and sends a couple of masons to repair the leak, as if the leak did not mean that the whole masonry is undermined and must be rebuilt from the foundation. To vary the metaphor, theology comes home to find the broker's marks on all the furniture, and goes on as before quite comfortably, ignoring the fact that it will lose everything if it does not pay its debts. The critical objections which Freda and the sketch agree in bringing against the modern treatment of the subject are as follows. In order to find in Mark the life of Jesus of which it is in search, modern theology is obliged to read between the lines a whole host of things, and those often the most important, and then comes to foist them upon the text by means of psychological conjecture. It is determined to find evidence in Mark of a development of Jesus, a development of the disciples, and a development of the outer circumstances, and professes, in so doing, to be only reproducing the views and indications of the evangelist. In reality, however, there is not a word of all this in the evangelist, and when his interpreters are asked what are the hints and indications on which they base their assertions, they have nothing to offer save argumenta e silentio. Mark knows nothing of any development in Jesus. He knows nothing of any pedagogic considerations which are supposed to have determined the conduct of Jesus towards the disciples and the people. He knows nothing of any conflict in the mind of Jesus between a spiritual and a popular political messianic ideal. He does not know, either, that in this respect there was any difference between the view of Jesus and that of the people. He knows nothing of the idea that the use of the ass at the triumphal entry symbolized a non-political messiahship. He knows nothing of the idea that the question about the messiah's being the son of David had something to do with this alternative being political and non-political. He does not know either that Jesus explained the secret of the passion to the disciples, nor that they had any understanding of it. He only knows that from first to last they were in all respects equally wanting in understanding. He does not know that the first period was a period of success, and the second a period of failure. He represents the Pharisees and Herodians as, from chapter 3, verse 6 onwards, resolved upon the death of Jesus, while the people, down to the very last day when he preached in the temple, are enthusiastically loyal to him. All these things of which the evangelist says nothing, and they are foundations of the modern view, should first be proved, if proved they can be. They ought not to be simply read into the text as something self-evident, for it is just those things which appear so self-evident to the prevailing critical temper, which are in reality the least evident of all. Another hitherto self-evident point, the quote-unquote historical kernel, which it has been customary to extract from the narratives, must be given up until it is proved, if it is capable of proof, that we can and ought to distinguish between the kernel and the husk. We may take all that is reported as either historical or unhistorical, but in respect to the definite predictions of the passion, death, and resurrection, we ought to give up taking the reference to the passion as historical and letting the rest go. We may accept the idea of the atoning death, or we may reject it, but we ought not to ascribe to Jesus a feeble, anemic version of this idea, while setting down to the account of the Pauline theology the interpretation of the passion which we actually find in Mark. Whatever the results obtained by the aid of the historical kernel, the method pursued is the same. Says Vreda, quote, It is detached from its context and transformed into something different. It finally comes to this, that each critic retains whatever portion of the traditional sayings can be fitted into his construction of the facts and his conception of historical possibility, and rejects the rest. 
Close quote. The psychological explanation of motive and the psychological connection of the events and actions which such critics have proposed to find in Mark simply do not exist. That being so, nothing is to be made out of his account by the application of a priori psychology. A vast quantity of treasures of scholarship and erudition, of art and artifice, which the Markan hypothesis has gathered into its storehouse in the two generations of its existence, to aid it in constructing its life of Jesus, has become worthless, and can be of no further service to true historical research. Theology has been simplified. What would become of it if that did not happen every hundred years or so? And the simplification was badly needed, for no one since Strauss had cleared away its impedimenta. Thoroughgoing skepticism and thoroughgoing eschatology, between them, are compelling theology to read the Markan text again with simplicity of mind. The simplicity consists in dispensing with the connecting links with which it has been accustomed to discover between the sections of the narrative, in looking at each one separately, and recognizing that it is difficult to pass from one to the other. The material with which it has hitherto been usual to solder the sections together into a life of Jesus will not stand the temperature test. Exposed to the cold air of critical skepticism, it cracks. When the furnace of eschatology is heated to a certain point, the solderings melt. In both cases, the sections all fall apart. Formerly, it was possible to book through tickets at the Supplementary Psychological Knowledge Office, which enabled those traveling in the interests of Life of Jesus construction to use express trains, thus avoiding the inconvenience of having to stop at every little station, change, and run the risk of missing their connection. The ticket office is now closed. There is a station at the end of each section of the narrative, and the connections are not guaranteed. The fact is, it is not simply that there is no very obvious psychological connection between the sections. In almost every case, there is a positive break in the connection, and there is a great deal in the Markan narrative which is inexplicable and even self-contradictory. In their statement of the problems raised by this want of connection, Vreda and the sketch are in the most exact agreement. That these difficulties are not artificially constructed has been shown by our survey of the history of the attempts to write the life of Jesus, in the course of which these problems emerge one after another, after Bruno Bauer had by anticipation grasped them all in their complexity. How do the demoniacs know that Jesus is the Son of God? Why does the blind man at Jericho address him as the Son of David, when no one else knows his messianic dignity? How was it that these occurrences did not give a new direction to the thoughts of the people in regard to Jesus? How did the messianic entry come about? How was it possible without provoking the interference of the Roman garrison of occupation? Why is it as completely ignored in the subsequent controversies as if it had never taken place? Why was it not brought up at the trial of Jesus? Says Vreda, the messianic acclamation at the entry into Jerusalem is in Mark quite an isolated incident. It has no sequel, neither is there any preparation for it beforehand. Close quote. Why does Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, speak of the parabolic form of discourse as designed to conceal the mystery of the kingdom of God, whereas the explanation which he proceeds to give to the disciples has nothing mysterious about it? What is the mystery of the kingdom of God? Why does Jesus forbid his miracles to be made known, even in cases where there is no apparent purpose for the prohibition? Why is his messiahship a secret, and yet no secret, since it is known not only to the disciples, but to the demoniacs, the blind man at Jericho, the multitude at Jerusalem, which must, as Bruno Bauer expresses it, have fallen from heaven, and to the high priest, why does Jesus reveal his messiahship to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, not at the moment when he sends them forth to preach? How does Peter know without having been told by Jesus that the messiahship belongs to his master? 
Why must it remain a secret until the resurrection? Why does Jesus indicate his messiahship only by the title Son of Man? And why is it that this title is so far from prominent in primitive Christian theology? What is the meaning of the statement that Jesus at Jerusalem discovered a difficulty in the fact that the Messiah was described as at once David's son and David's Lord? How are we to explain the fact that Jesus had to open the eyes of the people to the greatness of the Baptist's office, subsequently to the mission of the Twelve, and to enlighten the disciples themselves in regard to it during the descent from the Mount of Transfiguration? Why should this be described in Matthew chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, as a mystery difficult to grasp? If ye can receive it, and he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What is the meaning of the saying that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than the Baptist? Does the Baptist then not enter into the kingdom of heaven? How is the kingdom of heaven subjected to violence since the days of the Baptist? Who are the violent? What is the Baptist intended to understand from the answer of Jesus? What importance was attached to the miracles by Jesus himself? What office must they have caused the people to attribute to him? Why is the discourse at the sending out of the twelve filled with predictions of persecutions which experience had given no reason to anticipate, and which did not, as a matter of fact, occur? What is the meaning of the saying in Matthew chapter 10 verse 23 about the imminent coming of the Son of Man, seeing that the disciples, after all, returned to Jesus without its being fulfilled? Why does Jesus leave the people just when his work among them is most successful and journey northwards? Why had he, immediately after the sending forth of the twelve, manifested a desire to withdraw himself from the multitude who were longing for salvation. How does the multitude, mentioned in Mark chapter 8 verse 34, suddenly appear at Caesarea Philippi? Why is its presence no longer implied in Mark chapter 9 verse 30? How could Jesus possibly have traveled unrecognized through Galilee? And how could he have avoided being thronged at Capernaum, although he stayed at the house? How came he so suddenly to speak to his disciples of his suffering and dying and rising again, without, moreover, explaining to them either the natural or the moral wherefore? Says Vreda, quote, There is no trace of any attempt on the part of Jesus to break this strange thought gradually to the disciples. The prediction is always flung down before the disciples without preparation. It is, in fact, a characteristic feature of these sayings, that all attempt to aid the understanding of the disciples is lacking. Close quote. Did Jesus journey to Jerusalem with the purpose of working there, or of dying there? How comes it that in Mark chapter 10 verse 39, he holds out to the sons of Zebedee the prospect of drinking his cup and being baptized with his baptism? And how can he, after speaking so decidedly of the necessity of his death, think it possible in Gethsemane that the cup might yet pass from him. Who are the undefined many, for whom, according to Mark chapter 10 verse 45 and chapter 14 verse 24, his death shall serve as a ransom? How came it that Jesus alone was arrested? Why were no witnesses called at his trial to testify that he had given himself out to be the Messiah? How is it that on the morning after his arrest, the temper of the multitude seems to be completely changed, so that no one stirs a finger to help him? In what form does Jesus conceive the resurrection, which he promises to his disciples, to be combined with the coming on the clouds of heaven to which he points his judge? In what relation do these predictions stand to the prospect held out at the time of the sending forth of the twelve, but not realized, of the immediate appearance of the Son of Man? What is the meaning of the further prediction on the way to Gethsemane, from Mark chapter 14, verse 28, that after his resurrection he will go before the disciples into Galilee? How is the other version of this saying, from Mark chapter 16, verse 7, to be explained, according to which it means, as spoken by the angel, 
that the disciples are to journey to Galilee to have their first meeting with the risen Jesus there, whereas on the lips of Jesus it betokened that, just as now as a sufferer he was going before them to Galilee, to Jerusalem, so after his resurrection he would go before them from Jerusalem to Galilee, and what was to happen there? These problems were covered up by the naturalistic psychology as by a light snowdrift. The snow has melted, and they now stand out from the narratives like black points of rock. It is no longer allowable to avoid these questions, or to solve them, each by itself, by softening them down and giving them an interpretation by which the reported facts acquire a quite different significance from that which they bear for the evangelist. Either the Markan text as it stands is historical, and therefore to be retained, or it is not and then it should be given up. What is really unhistorical is any softening down of the wording, and the meaning which it naturally bears. The skeptical and eschatological schools, however, go still farther in company. If the connection in Mark is really no connection, it is important to try to discover whether any principle can be discovered in this want of connection. Can any order be brought into the chaos? To this, the answer is in the affirmative. The complete want of connection with all its self-contradictions is ultimately due to the fact that two representations of the life of Jesus, or, to speak more accurately, of his public ministry, are here crushed into one, a natural and a deliberately supernatural representation. A dogmatic element has intruded itself into the description of this life, something which has no concern with the events which form the outward course of that life. This dogmatic element is the messianic secret of Jesus, and all the secrets and concealments which go along with it. Hence, the irrational and self-contradictory features of the presentation of Jesus, out of which a rational psychology can make only something which is unhistorical and does violence to the text, since it must necessarily get rid of the constant want of connection and self-contradiction which belongs to the essence of the narrative, and portray a Jesus who was the Messiah, not one who at once was and was not Messiah, as the evangelist depicts him. When rational psychology conceives him as one who was Messiah, but not in the sense expected by the people, that is a concession to the self-contradictions of the Markan representation, which, however, does justice neither to the text nor to the history which it records, since the gospel does not contain the faintest hint that the contradiction was of this nature. Up to this point, up to the complete reconstruction of the system which runs through the disconnectedness and the tracing back of the dogmatic element to the messianic secret, there extends a close agreement between thoroughgoing skepticism and thoroughgoing eschatology. The critical arguments are identical. The construction is analogous and based on the same principle. The defenders of the modern psychological view cannot, therefore, play off one school against the other, as one of them proposed to do, but must deal with them both at once. They differ only when they explain whence the system that runs through the disconnectedness comes. Here the ways divide, as Bauer saw long ago, the inconsistency between the public life of Jesus and his messianic claim lies either in the nature of the Jewish messianic conception or in the representation of the evangelist. There is, on the one hand, the eschatological solution which at one stroke raises the Markan account as it stands, with all its disconnectedness and inconsistencies into genuine history. And there is, on the other hand, the literary solution, which regards the incongruous dogmatic element as interpolated by the earliest evangelist into the tradition, and therefore strikes out the messianic claim altogether from the historical life of Jesus. Tertium non datur, but in some respects, it really hardly matters which of the two solutions one adopts. They are both merely wooden towers erected upon the solid main building of the consentient critical induction which offers the enigmas detailed above to modern historical theology. 
It is interesting in this connection that Vreda's skepticism is just as constructive as the eschatological outline of the life of Jesus in the sketch. Bruno Bauer chose the literary solution because he thought that we had no evidence for an eschatological expectation existing at the time of Christ. Freda, though he follows Johannes Weiss in assuming the existence of a Jewish eschatological messianic expectation, finds in the gospel only the Christian conception of the Messiah. He thinks, quote, if Jesus really knew himself to be the Messiah and designated himself as such, the genuine tradition is so closely interwoven with later accretions that it is not easy to recognize it. Close quote. In any case, Jesus cannot, according to Vreda, have spoken of his messianic coming in the way which the synoptists report. The messiahship of Jesus, as we find it in the Gospels, is a product of early Christian theology, correcting history according to its own conceptions. It is therefore necessary to distinguish in Mark between the reported events which constitute the outward course of the history of Jesus and the dogmatic idea which claims to lay down the lines of its inward course. The principle of division is found in the contradictions. The recorded events form, according to Vreda, the following picture. Jesus came forward as a teacher, first and principally in Galilee. He was surrounded by a company of disciples, went about with them, and gave them instruction. To some of them he accorded a special confidence. A larger multitude sometimes attached itself to him, in addition to the disciples. He is fond of discoursing in parables. Besides the teaching, there are the miracles. These make a stir, and he is thronged by the multitudes. He gives special attention to the cases of demoniacs. He is in such close touch with the people that he does not hesitate to associate even with publicans and sinners. Towards the law, he takes up an attitude of some freedom. He encounters the opposition of the Pharisees and the Jewish authorities. They set traps for him and endeavor to bring about his fall. Finally, they succeed when he ventures to show himself not only on Judean soil, but in Jerusalem. He remains passive and is condemned to death. The Roman administration supports the Jewish authorities. Continues Freda, quote, The texture of the Marcan narrative, as we know it, is not complete until to the warp of these general historical notions there is added a strong weft of ideas of a dogmatic character, close quote, the substance of which is that, quote, Jesus, the bearer of a special office to which he was appointed by God, becomes a higher supernatural being. Close quote. If this is the case, however, then, quote, the motives of his conduct are not derived from human characteristics, human aims, and necessities. The one motive which runs throughout is rather a divine decree which lies beyond human understanding. This he seeks to fulfill alike in his actions and his sufferings. The teaching of Jesus is accordingly supernatural. Close quote. On this assumption, the want of understanding of the disciples to whom he communicates, without commentary, unconnected portions of this supernatural knowledge becomes natural and explicable. The people are, moreover, essentially, quote, non-receptive of revelation, close quote. Quote, it is these motifs, and not those which are inherently historical, which give movement and direction to the Marcan narrative. It is they that give the general color. On them, naturally, depends the main interest. It is to them that the thought of the writer is really directed. The consequence is that the general picture offered by the gospel is not an historical representation of the life of Jesus. Only some faded remnants of such an impression have been taken over into the supra-historical religious view. In this sense, the Gospel of Mark belongs to the history of dogma. Close quote. The two conceptions of the life of Jesus, the natural and the supernatural, are brought, not without inconsistencies, into a kind of harmony by means of the idea of intentional secrecy. The messiahship of Jesus is concealed in his life as in a closed dark lantern, which, however, is not quite closed, 
otherwise one could not see that it was there, and allows a few bright beams to escape. The idea of a secret which must remain a secret until the resurrection of Jesus could only arise at a time when nothing was known of a messianic claim of Jesus during his life upon earth, that is to say, at a time when the messiahship of Jesus was thought of as beginning with the resurrection. But that is a weighty piece of indirect historical evidence that Jesus did not really profess to be the messiah at all. The positive fact which is to be inferred from this is that the appearances of the risen Jesus produced a sudden revolution in his disciples' conception of him. The resurrection is, for Vreda, the real messianic event in the life of Jesus. Who is responsible, then, for introducing this singular feature, so destructive of the real historical connection, into the life of Jesus, which is in reality that of a teacher? It is quite impossible, Vreda argues, that the idea of the messianic secret is the invention of Mark. Quote, a thing like that is not done by a single individual. It must, therefore, have been a view which was current in certain circles, and was held by a considerable number, though not necessarily perhaps by a very great number of persons. To say this is not to deny that Mark had a share, and perhaps a considerable share, in the creation of the view which he sets forth. The motifs themselves are doubtless not, in part at least, peculiar to the evangelist, but the concrete embodiment of them is certainly his own work, and to this extent we may speak of a special Markan point of view which manifests itself here and there. Where the line is to be drawn between what is traditional and what is individual cannot always be determined even by a careful examination directed to this end we must leave it commingled as we find it. Close quote. The Markan narrative has therefore arisen from the impulse to give a messianic form to the earthly life of Jesus. This impulse was, however, restrained by the impression and tradition of the non-messianic character of the life of Jesus, which were still strong and vivid, and it was therefore not able wholly to recast the material but could only bore its way into it and force it apart, as the roots of the bramble disintegrate a rock. In the gospel literature which arose on the basis of Mark, the messianic secret becomes gradually of more subordinate importance, and the life of Jesus more messianic in character, until, in the fourth gospel, he openly comes before the people with messianic claims. In estimating the value of this construction, we must not attach too much importance to its a priori assumptions and difficulties. In this respect, Vreda's position is much more precarious than that of his precursor, Bruno Bauer. According to the latter, the interpolation of the messianic secret is the personal, absolutely original act of the evangelist. Vreda thinks of it as a collective act, representing the new conception as molded by the tradition before it was fixed by the evangelist that is very much more difficult to carry through. Tradition alters its materials in a different way from that in which we find them altered in Mark. Tradition transforms from without. Mark's way of drawing secret threads of a different material through the texture of the tradition, without otherwise altering it, is purely literary and could only be the work of an individual person. The creative tradition would have carried out the theory of the messianic secret in the life of Jesus much more boldly and logically, that is to say, at once more arbitrarily and more consistently. The only alternative is to distinguish two stages of tradition in early Christianity, a naive, freely working earlier stage, and a more artificial later stage, confined to a smaller circle of a more literary character. Vreda does, as a matter of fact, propose to find in Mark traces of a simpler and bolder transformation which, leaving aside the messianic secret, makes Jesus an openly professed Messiah, and is therefore of a distinct origin from the conception of the secret Christ. To this tradition may belong, he thinks, the entry into Jerusalem and the confession before the high priest since the narratives naively imply an openly avowed messiahship. The word naively is out of place here. 
a really naive tradition which intended to represent the entry of jesus as messianic would have done so in quite a different way from mark and would not have stultified itself so curiously as we find done even in matthew where the galilean passover pilgrims after the messianic entry answer the question of the people of jerusalem as to who it was whom they were acclaiming with the words this is the prophet jesus from nazareth of galilee from matthew chapter 21 verse 11 end of chapter 19 part 1chapter 19 part 2 of the quest of the historical jesus this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the quest of the historical jesus by albert schweitzer translated by william montgomery chapter 19 part 2 thoroughgoing skepticism and thoroughgoing eschatology the tradition too which makes Jesus acknowledge his messiahship before his judges, is not naive in Vreda's sense, for, if it were, it would not represent the high priest's knowledge of Jesus' messiahship as something so extraordinary and peculiar to himself that he can cite witnesses only for the saying about the temple, not with reference to Jesus' messianic claim, and bases his condemnation only on the fact that Jesus, in answer to his question, acknowledges himself as messiah and jesus does so it should be remarked as in other passages with an appeal to a future justification of his claim the confession before the council is therefore anything but a quote, naive representation of an openly avowed messiahship close quote. the messianic statements in these two passages present precisely the same remarkable character as in all the other cases to which Vreda draws attention. We have not here to do with a different tradition, with a clear messianic light streaming in through the windowpane, but, just as elsewhere, with the rays of a dark lantern. The real point is that Vreda cannot bring these two passages within the lines of the theory of secrecy, and practically admits this by assuming the existence of a second and rather divergent line of tradition. What concerns us is to note that this theory does not suffice to explain the two facts in question. The knowledge of Jesus' messiahship shown by the Galilean Passover pilgrims at the time of the entry into Jerusalem, and the knowledge of the high priest at his trial. We can only touch on the question whether anyone who wished to date back, in some way or other, the messiahship into the life of Jesus, could not have done it much more simply by making Jesus give his closest followers some hints regarding it. Why does the remolder of the history, instead of doing that, have recourse to a supernatural knowledge on the part of the demoniacs and the disciples? For Vreda rightly remarks, as Bruno Bauer and the sketch also do, that the incident of Caesarea Philippi, as represented by Mark, involves a miracle, since Jesus does not, as is generally supposed, reveal his messiahship to Peter. It is Peter who reveals it to Jesus, in Mark chapter 8, verse 29. This fact, however, makes nonsense of the whole theory about the disciples' want of understanding. It will not, therefore, fit into the concealment theory, and Vreda, as a matter of fact, feels obliged to give up that theory as regards this incident. He remarks, quote, this scene can hardly have been created by Mark himself. Close quote. It also, therefore, belongs to another tradition. Here, then, is a third messianic fact, which cannot be brought within the lines of Vreda's literary theory of the messianic secret. And these three facts are precisely the most important of all. Peter's confession, the entry into Jerusalem, and the high priest's knowledge of Jesus' messiahship, in each case, Vreda finds himself obliged to refer these to tradition, instead of to the literary conception of Mark. This tradition undermines his literary hypothesis, 
for the conception of a tradition always involves the possibility of genuine historical elements. Footnote. The difficulties which the incident at Caesarea Philippi places in the way of Vreda's construction may be realized by placing two of his statements side by side. From page 101, quote, From this it is evident that this incident contains no element which cannot be easily understood on the basis of Marx's ideas. Close quote. From page 238, quote, But in another aspect, this incident stands in direct contradiction to the Marcan view of the disciples. It is inconsistent with their general want of understanding, and can therefore hardly have been created by Mark himself. Close quote. End footnote. This tradition undermines his literary hypothesis, for the conception of a tradition always involves the possibility of genuine historical elements. How greatly this inescapable intrusion of tradition weakens the theory of the literary interpolation of the messiahship into the history becomes evident when we consider the story of the Passion. The representation that Jesus was publicly put to death as messiah because he had publicly acknowledged himself to be so, must, like the high priest's knowledge of his claim, be referred to the other tradition, which has nothing to do with the messianic secret, but boldly antedates the messiahship without employing any finesse of that kind. But that strongly tends to confirm the historicity of this tradition, and throws the burden of proof upon those who deny it. It is wholly independent of the hypothesis of secrecy, and in fact directly opposed to it. If, on the other hand, in spite of all the difficulties, the representation that Jesus was condemned to death on account of his messianic claims is dragged by main force into the theory of secrecy, the question arises, what interest had the persons who set up the literary theory of secrecy? in representing Jesus as having been openly put to death as Messiah, and in consequence of his messianic claims? And the answer is, none whatever, quite the contrary. For in doing so, the theory of secrecy stultifies itself. As though one were to develop a photographic plate with painful care, and, just when one had finished, flung open the shutters, so, on this hypothesis, the natural messianic light suddenly shines into the room which ought to be lighted only by the rays of the dark lantern. Here, therefore, the theory of secrecy abandoned the method which it had hitherto followed in regard to the traditional material. For if Jesus was not condemned and crucified at Jerusalem as Messiah, a tradition must have existed which preserved the truth about the last conflicts and the motives of the condemnation. This is supposed to have been here completely set aside by the theory of the secret Messiah, which, instead of drawing its delicate threads through the older tradition, has simply substituted its own representation of events. But in that case, why not do away with the remainder of the public ministry? Why not at least get rid of the public appearance at Jerusalem? How can the crudeness of method shown in the case of the Passion be harmonized with the skillful conservatism towards the non-messianic tradition, which it is obvious that the Marcan circle has scrupulously observed elsewhere. If, according to the original tradition, of which Vreda admits the existence, Jesus went to Jerusalem not to die, but to work there, the dogmatic view, according to which he went to Jerusalem to die, must have struck out the whole account of his sojourn in Jerusalem and his death, in order to put something else in its place. What we now read in the Gospels concerning those last days in Jerusalem cannot be derived from an original tradition, for one who came to work and, according to Vreda, quote, to work with decisive effect, close quote, would not have cast all his preaching into the form of obscure parables of judgment and minatory discourses. That is a style of speech which could be adopted only by one who is determined to force his adversaries to put him to death. Therefore, the narrative of the last days of Jesus must be, from beginning to end, a creation of the dogmatic idea. And, as a matter of fact, Vreda, here in agreement with Vaisa, 
sees grounds for asserting that a sojourn at Jerusalem is presented to us in the Gospels in a very much abridged and weakened version. Close quote. That is a euphemistic expression. For if it was really the dogmatic idea which was responsible for representing Jesus as being condemned as Messiah, it is not a mere case of abridging and weakening down, but of displacing the tradition in favor of a new one. But if Jesus was not condemned as Messiah, on what grounds was he condemned? And again, what interest had those whose concern was to make the Messiahship a secret of his earthly life, in making him die as Messiah, contrary to the received tradition? And what interest could the tradition have had in falsifying history in that way? Even admitting that the prediction of the Passion to the disciples is of a dogmatic character, and is to be regarded as a creation of primitive Christian theology, the historic fact that he died would have been a sufficient fulfillment of those sayings. That he was publicly condemned and crucified as Messiah has nothing to do with the fulfillment of those predictions, and goes far beyond it. To take a more general point, what interest had primitive theology in dating back the messiahship of Jesus to the time of his earthly ministry? None, whatever. Paul shows us with what complete indifference the earthly life of Jesus was regarded by primitive Christianity. The discourses in Acts show an equal indifference, since in them also, Jesus first becomes the Messiah by virtue of his exaltation. To date, the Messiahship earlier was not an undertaking which offered any advantage to primitive theology. In fact, it would only have raised difficulties for it, since it involved the hypothesis of a dual Messiahship, one of earthly humiliation and one of future glory. The fact is, if one reads through the early literature, one becomes aware that so long as theology had an eschatological orientation and was dominated by the expectation of the parousia, the question how Jesus of Nazareth had been the Messiah not only did not exist, but was impossible. Primitive theology is simply a theology of the future, with no interest in history. It was only with the decline of eschatological interest and the change in the orientation of Christianity which was connected therewith, that an interest in the life of Jesus and the historical messiahship arose. That is to say, the Gnostics, who were the first to assert the messiahship of the historical Jesus, and who were obliged to assert it precisely because they denied the eschatological conceptions, forced this view upon the theology of the early church, and compelled it to create in the Logos Christology an un-Gnostic mold, in which to cast the speculative conception of the historical messiahship of Jesus. And that is what we find in the fourth gospel. Prior to the anti-Gnostic controversies, we find in the early Christian literature no conscious dating back of the messiahship of Jesus to his earthly life, and no theological interest at work upon the dogmatic recasting of his history. It is, therefore, difficult to suppose that the messianic secret in Mark that is to say, in the very earliest tradition, was derived from primitive theology. The assertion of the messiahship of Jesus was wholly independent of the latter. The instinct which led Bruno Bauer to explain the messianic secret as the literary invention of Mark himself was therefore quite correct. Once suppose that tradition and primitive theology have anything to do with the matter, and the theory of the interpolation of the messiahship into the history becomes almost impossible to carry through. But Vreda's greatness consists precisely in the fact that he was compelled by his acute perception of the significance of the critical data to set aside the purely literary version of the hypothesis, and make Mark, so to speak, the instrument of the literary realization of the ideas of a definite intellectual circle within the sphere of primitive theology. The positive difficulty which confronts the skeptical theory is to explain how the messianic beliefs of the first generation arose, if Jesus, through his life, was for all, even for the disciples, merely a teacher, and gave even his intimates no hint of the dignity which he claimed for himself. 
it is difficult to eliminate the messiahship from the life of jesus especially from the narrative of the passion it is more difficult still as keim saw long ago to bring it back again after its elimination from the life into the theology of the primitive church in freda's acute and logical thinking this difficulty seems to leap to light since the messianic secret in mark is always connected with the resurrection the date at which the messianic belief of the disciples arose must be the resurrection of jesus Quote, but the idea of dating the messiahship from the resurrection is certainly not a thought of jesus but of the primitive church it presupposes the church's experience of the appearance of the risen jesus Close quote. the psychologist will say that the resurrection appearances however they may be conceived are only intelligible as based upon the expectation of the resurrection and this again as based on references of jesus to the resurrection but leaving psychology aside let us accept the resurrection experiences of the disciples as a pure psychological miracle even so how can the appearances of the risen jesus have suggested to the disciples the idea that jesus the crucified teacher was the messiah apart from any expectations how can this conclusion have resulted for them from the mere quote, fact of the resurrection Close quote. The fact of the appearance did not by any means imply it. In certain circles, indeed, according to Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, in the very highest quarters, the resurrection of the Baptist was believed in, but that did not make John the Baptist the Messiah. The inexplicable thing is that, according to Vreda, the disciples began at once to assert confidently and unanimously that he was the messiah and would before long appear in glory but how did the appearance of the risen jesus suddenly become for them a proof of his messiahship and the basis of their eschatology that vreda fails to explain and so makes this event an historical miracle which in reality is harder to believe than the supernatural event Anyone who holds historical miracles to be just as impossible as any other kind, even when they occur in a critical and skeptical work, will be forced to the conclusion that the messianic eschatological significance attached to the resurrection experience by the disciples implies some kind of messianic eschatological references on the part of the historical Jesus, which gave to the resurrection its messianic eschatological significance. Here, Vreda himself, though without admitting it, postulates some messianic hints on the part of Jesus, since he conceives the judgment of the disciples upon the resurrection to have been not analytical, but synthetic, inasmuch as they add something to it, and that, indeed, is the main thing, which was not implied in the conception of the event as such. Here again, the merit of Vreda's contribution to criticism consists in the fact that he takes the position as it is and does not try to improve it artificially bruno bauer and others supposed that the belief in the messiahship of jesus had slowly solidified out of a kind of gaseous state or had been forced into primitive theology by the literary invention of mark vreda however feels himself obliged to base it upon an historical fact and moreover the same historical fact which is pointed to by the sayings in the synoptics and the pauline theology but in doing so he creates an almost insurmountable difficulty for his hypothesis we can only briefly refer to the question what form the accounts of the resurrection must have taken if the historic fact which underlay them was the first surprised apprehension and recognition of the messiahship of jesus on the part of the disciples the messianic teaching would necessarily in that case have been somehow or other put into the mouth of the risen jesus it is however completely absent because it was already contained in the teaching of jesus during his earthly life the theory of messianic secrecy must therefore have remolded not merely the story of the passion but also that of the resurrection removing the revelation of the messiahship to the disciples from the latter in order to insert it into the public ministry 
Vreda, moreover, will only take account of the Markan text as it stands, not of the historical possibility that the futuristic messiahship, which meets us in the mysterious utterances of Jesus, goes back in some form to a sound tradition. Further, he does not take the eschatological character of the teaching of Jesus into his calculations, but works on the false assumption that he can analyze the Markan text in and by itself, and so discover the principle on which it is composed. He carries out experiments on the law of crystallization of the narrative material in this gospel, but instead of doing so in the natural and historical atmosphere, he does it in an atmosphere artificially neutralized, which contains no trace of contemporary conceptions. Footnote. Certain of the conceptions of which Vreda operates are simply not in accordance with the text, because he gives them a different significance from that which they have in the narrative. Thus, for example, he always takes the resurrection, when it occurs in the mouth of Jesus, as a reference to that resurrection which, as an historical fact, became a matter of apprehended experience to the apostles. But Jesus speaks without any distinction of his resurrection and of his parousia. The conception of the resurrection, therefore, if one is to arrive at it inductively from the Markan text, is most closely bound up with the parousia. The evangelist would thus seem to have made Jesus predict a different kind of resurrection from that which actually happened. The resurrection, according to the Markan text, is an eschatological event and has no reference whatever to Vreda's historical resurrection. Further, if their resurrection experience was the first and fundamental point in the messianic enlightenment of the disciples, why did they only begin to proclaim it some weeks later? This is a problem which was long ago recognized by Rimaris, and which is not solved by merely assuming that the disciples were afraid. End footnote. Consequently, the conclusion, based on the sum of this observation, has in it something arbitrary. Everything which conflicts with the rational construction of the course of the history is referred directly to the theory of the concealment of the messianic secret. But in the carrying out of that theory, a number of self-contradictions, without which it could not subsist, must be recognized and noted. Thus, for example, all the prohibitions, whatever they may refer to, even including the command not to make known his miracles, are referred to the same category as the injunction not to reveal the messianic secret. Footnote. The prohibitions in Mark chapter 1 verses 43 and 44, chapter 5 verse 43, chapter 7 verse 36, and chapter 8 verse 26, are put on the same footing with the really messianic prohibitions in chapter 8 verse 30 and chapter 9 verse 9, with which may be associated also the imposition of silence upon the demoniacs who recognize his messiahship in Mark chapter 1 verse 34 and chapter 3 verse 12. End footnote. But what justification is there for that? It presupposes that, according to Mark, the miracles could be taken as proofs of the messiahship, an idea of which there is no hint whatever in Mark. Vreda argues, quote, The miracles are certainly used by the earliest Christians as evidence of the nature and significance of Christ. I need hardly point to the fact that Mark, not less than Matthew, Luke, and John, must have held the opinion that the miracles of Jesus encountered a widespread and ardent messianic expectation. Close quote. In John, this messianic significance of the miracles is certainly assumed, but then the really eschatological view of things has here fallen into the background. It seems, indeed, as if genuine eschatology excluded the messianic interpretation of the miracles. In Matthew, the miracles of Jesus have nothing whatever to do with the proof of the messiahship. But, as is evident from the saying that Chorazin and Bethsaida, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20-24, through 24, are only an exhibition of mercy intended to awaken repentance, or according to Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, an indication of the nearness of the kingdom of God. They have as little to do with the messianic office as in the Acts of the Apostles. Footnote. 
the narrative in matthew chapter fourteen verses twenty two through thirty three according to which the disciples after seeing jesus walk upon the sea hail him on his coming into the boat as the son of god and the description of the deeds of jesus as deeds of christ in the introduction to the baptist's question in matthew chapter eleven verse two do not cancel the old theory even in matthew because the synoptists differing therein from the fourth evangelist do not represent the demand for a sign as a demand for a messianic sign nor the cures wrought by jesus as messianic proofs of power the action of the demons in crying out upon jesus as the son of god betokens their recognition of him it has nothing to do with the miracles of healing as such End footnote. in mark from first to last there is not a single syllable to suggest that the miracles have a messianic significance even admitting the possibility that the quote, miracles of jesus encountered an ardent messianic expectation close quote, that does not necessarily imply a messianic significance in them to justify that conclusion requires the presupposition that the messiah was expected to be some kind of an earthly man who should do miracles this is presupposed by Vreda, by bruno bauer and by modern theology in general but it has not been proved and it is at variance with eschatology which pictured the messiah to itself as a heavenly being in a world which was already being transformed into something supra-mundane the assumption that the clue to the explanation of the command not to make known the miracles is to be found in the necessity of guarding the secret of the messiahship is therefore not justified the miracles are connected with the kingdom and the nearness of the kingdom not with the messiah but vreda is obliged to refer everything to the messianic secret because he leaves the preaching of the kingdom out of account the same process is repeated in the discussion of the veiling of the mystery of the kingdom of god in the parables of mark chapter four the mystery of the kingdom is for vreda the secret of jesus's messiahship he says quote, we have learned in the meantime that one main element in this mystery is that jesus is the messiah the son of god if jesus according to mark conceals his messiahship we are justified in interpreting the mystrion tis vasilias ton theon in the light of this fact that is one of the weakest points in vreda's whole theory where is there any hint of this in these parables and why should the secret of the kingdom of god contain within it as one of its principal features the secret of the messiahship of jesus mark's account of jesus's parabolic teaching he concludes is completely unhistorical because it is directly opposed to the essential nature of the parables the ultimate reason according to vreda why this whole view of the parables arose was simply quote, because the general opinion was already in existence that jesus had revealed himself to the disciples but concealed himself from the multitude Close quote instead of simply admitting that we are unable to discover what the mystery of the kingdom in mark chapter four is any more than we can understand why it must be veiled and numbering it among the unsolved problems of jesus's preaching of the kingdom vreda forces this chapter inside the lines of his theory of the veiled messiahship the desire of jesus to be alone too and remain unrecognized as in mark chapter seven verse twenty four and chapter 9 verse 30 and following is supposed to have some kind of connection with the veiling of the messiahship he even brings the multitude which in mark chapter 10 verse 47 and following rebukes the blind beggar at jericho who cried out to jesus into the service of his theory on the ground that the beggar had addressed him as son of david but all the narrative says is that they told him to hold his peace to cease making an outcry not that they did so because of his addressing jesus as son of david in an equally arbitrary fashion the surprising introduction of the multitude in mark chapter eight verse thirty four after the incident of caesarea philippi is dragged into the theory of secrecy 
Vreda does not feel the possibility or impossibility of the sudden appearance of the multitude in this locality as an historical problem, any more than he grasps the sudden withdrawal of Jesus from his public ministry as primarily an historical question. Mark is, for him, a writer who is to be judged from a pathological point of view, a writer who, dominated by the fixed idea of introducing everywhere the messianic secret of Jesus, is always creating mysterious and unintelligible situations, even when these do not directly serve the interests of his theory, and who, in some of his descriptions, writes in a rather fairy tale style. When all is said, his treatment of the history scarcely differs from that of the fourth evangelist. The absence of historical prepossessions which Vreda skillfully assumes in his examination of the connection in Mark is not really complete. He is bound to refer everything inexplicable to the principle of the concealment of the messiahship, which is the only principle that he recognizes in the dogmatic stratum of the narrative, and is consequently obliged to deny the historicity of such passages, whereas in reality the veiling of the messiahship is only involved in a few places and is there indicated in clear and simple words. He is unwilling to recognize that there is a second, wider circle of mystery which has to do, not with Jesus' messiahship, but with his preaching of the kingdom, with the mystery of the kingdom of God in a wider sense, and that within this second circle there lie a number of historical problems. Above all, the mission of the twelve, and the inexplicable abandonment of public activity on the part of Jesus, which followed soon afterwards. His mistake consists in endeavoring, by violent methods, to subsume the more general, the mystery of the kingdom of God, under the more special, the mystery of the messiahship. Instead of inserting the latter as the smaller circle within the wider, the secret of the kingdom of God. As he does not deal with the teaching of Jesus, he has no occasion to take account of the secret of the kingdom of God. That is the more remarkable because corresponding to one fundamental idea of the messianic secret, there is a parallel, more general dogmatic conception in Jesus' preaching of the kingdom. For if Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, gives the disciples nothing to take with them on their mission but predictions of suffering, if, at the very beginning of his ministry, he closes the Beatitudes with a blessing upon the persecuted, if, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and following, he warns the people that they will have to choose between life and life, between death and death, if, in short, from the first, he loses no opportunity of preaching about suffering and following him in his sufferings, that is just as much a matter of dogma as his own sufferings and predictions of sufferings. For in both cases, the necessity of suffering, the necessity of facing death, is not a necessity of the historical situation, not a necessity which arises out of the circumstances. It is an assertion put forth without empirical basis, a prophecy of storm while the sky is blue, since neither Jesus nor the people to whom he spoke were undergoing any persecution, and when his fate overtook him, not even the disciples were involved in it. It is distinctly remarkable that, except for a few meager references, the enigmatic character of Jesus' constant predictions of suffering has not been discussed in the life of Jesus' literature. Footnote. It is always assumed as self-evident that Jesus is speaking of the sufferings and persecutions which would take place after his death, or that the evangelist, in making him speak in this way, is thinking of later persecutions. There is no hint of that in the text. End footnote. What has now to be done, therefore, is, in contradistinction to Vreda, to make a critical examination of the dogmatic element in the life of Jesus on the assumption that the atmosphere of the time was saturated with eschatology, that is, to keep an even closer touch with facts than Vreda does, and moreover, to proceed not from the particular to the general, but from the general to the particular carefully considering whether the dogmatic element is not precisely the historical element. For, after all, why should not Jesus think in terms of doctrine, and make history in action, 
just as well as a poor evangelist can do it on paper, under the pressure of the theological interests of the primitive community. Once again, however, we must repeat that the critical analysis and the assertion of a system running through the disorder are the same in the eschatological as in the skeptical hypothesis, only that in the eschatological analysis a number of problems come more clearly to light. The two constructions are related like the bones and cartilage of the body. The general structure is the same, only that in the case of the one, a solid substance, lime, is distributed even in the minutest portions, giving it firmness and solidity, while in the other case this is lacking. This reinforcing substance is the eschatological world view. How is it to be explained that Vreda, in spite of the eschatological school, in spite of Johannes Weiss, could, in critically investigating the connecting principle of the life of Jesus, simply leave eschatology out of the account? The blame rests with the eschatological school itself, for it applied the eschatological explanation only to the preaching of Jesus, and not even to the whole of this, but only to the messianic secret, instead of using it also to throw light upon the whole public work of Jesus, the connection and want of connection between the events. It represented Jesus as thinking and speaking eschatologically in some of the most important passages of his teaching but for the rest gave as uneschatological a presentation of his life as modern historical theology has done. The teaching of Jesus and the history of Jesus were set in different keys. Instead of destroying the modern historical scheme of the life of Jesus, or subjecting it to a rigorous examination, and thereby undertaking the performance of a highly valuable service to criticism, the eschatological theory confined itself within the limits of New Testament theology, and left it to Vreda to reveal, one after another, by a laborious, purely critical method, the difficulties which, from its point of view, it might have grasped historically at a single glance. It inevitably follows that Vreda is unjust to Johannes Weiss and Johannes Weiss towards Vreda. Footnote that the eschatological school showed a certain timidity in drawing the consequences of its recognition of the character of the preaching of Jesus and examining the tradition from the eschatological standpoint can be seen from Johannes Weiss's work, The Earliest Gospel, from 1903. Ingenious and interesting as this work is in detail, one is surprised to find the author of The Preaching of Jesus here endeavoring to distinguish between Mark and Ur Marcus to point to examples of Pauline influence, to exhibit clearly the tendencies which guided, respectively, the original evangelist and the redactor. All this as if he did not possess in his eschatological view of the preaching of Jesus a dominant conception which gives him a clue to quite a different psychology from that which he actually implies. Against Vreda, he brings forward many arguments which are worthy of attention but he can hardly be said to have refuted him, because it is impossible for Weiss to treat the question in the exact form in which it was raised by Vreda. End footnote. It is quite inexplicable from the eschatological school, with its clear perception of the eschatological element in the preaching of the kingdom of God, did not also hit upon the thoughts of the dogmatic element in the history of Jesus eschatology is simply dogmatic history, history as molded by theological beliefs, which breaks in upon the natural course of history and abrogates it. Is it not even, a priori, the only conceivable view that the conduct of one who looked forward to his messianic parousia in the near future should be determined, not by the natural course of events, but by that expectation? The chaotic confusion of the narratives ought to have suggested the thought that the events had been thrown into this confusion by the volcanic force of an incalculable personality, not by some kind of carelessness or freak of the tradition. End of chapter 19, part 2
Chapter 19, Part 3 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 3 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. A very little consideration suffices to show that there is something quite incomprehensible in the public ministry of Jesus taken as a whole. According to Mark, it lasted less than a year, for since he speaks of only one Passover journey, we may conclude that no other Passover fell within the period of Jesus' activity as a teacher. If it is proposed to assume that he allowed a Passover to go by without going up to Jerusalem, his adversaries, who took him to task about hand washings and about rubbing the ears of corn on the Sabbath, would certainly have made a most serious matter of this, and we should have to suppose that the evangelist, for some reason or other, thought fit to suppress the fact. That is to say, the burden of proof lies upon those who assert a longer duration for the ministry of Jesus. Until they have succeeded in proving it, we may assume something like the following course of events. Jesus, in going up to a Passover, came in contact with a movement initiated by John the Baptist in Judea, and, after the lapse of a little time, if we bring into the reckoning the forty days' sojourn in the wilderness, mentioned in Mark chapter 1 verse 13, a few weeks later, appeared in Galilee, proclaiming the near approach of the kingdom of God. According to Mark, he had known himself since his baptism to be the Messiah and from the historical point of view that does not matter, since history is concerned with the first announcement of the messiahship, not with inward psychological processes. Footnote. Vreda certainly goes too far in asserting that even in Mark's version, the experience at the baptism is conceived as an open miracle, perceptible to others. The way in which the revelations to the prophets are recounted in the Old Testament does not make in favor of this. Otherwise, we should have to suppose that the evangelist described the incident as a miracle which took place in the presence of a multitude, without perceiving that in this case the messianic secret was a secret no longer. If so, the story of the baptism stands on the same footing as the story of the messianic entry. It is a revelation of the messiahship which has absolutely no results. End footnote. This work of preaching the kingdom was continued until the sending forth of the twelve, that is to say, at the most for a few weeks. Perhaps in the saying, The harvest is great, but the laborers are few, with which Jesus closes his work prior to sending forth the disciples, there lies an allusion to the actual state of the natural fields. The flocking of the people to him after the mission of the twelve when a great multitude thronged about him for several days during his journey along the northern shore of the lake, can be more naturally explained if the harvest had just been brought in. However this may be, it is certain that Jesus, in the midst of his initial success, left Galilee, journeyed northwards, and only resumed his work as a teacher in Judea on the way to Jerusalem. Of his public ministry, therefore, a large section falls out, being cancelled by a period of inexplicable concealment. It dwindles to a few weeks of preaching here and there in Galilee, and a few days of his sojourn in Jerusalem. Footnote. The statement of Mark that Jesus, coming out of the north, appeared for a moment again in Decapolis and Capernaum, and then started off to the north once more, from Mark chapter 8 verse 31 through chapter 8 verse 27, may here provisionally be left out of account, since it stands in relation with the twofold account of the feeding of the multitude. So too, the enigmatic appearance and disappearance of the people, from Mark chapter 8 verse 34 through chapter 9 verse 30, may here be passed over. These statements make no difference to the fact that Jesus really broke off his work in Galilee shortly after the mission of the twelve, since they imply at most a quite transient contact with the people. End footnote. But in that case, the public life of Jesus becomes practically unintelligible. 
the explanation that his cause in Galilee was lost, and that he was obliged to flee, has not the slightest foundation in the text. That was recognized even by Kine, the inventor of the successful and unsuccessful periods of the life of Jesus, as is shown by his suggestion that the evangelists had intentionally removed the traces of failure from the decisive period which led up to the northern journey. The controversy over the washing of hands in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23, to which appeal is always made, is really a defeat for the Pharisees. The theory of the desertion of the Galileans, which appears with more or less artistic variations in all modern lives of Jesus, owes its existence not to any other confirmatory fact, but simply to the circumstance that Mark makes the simple statement, and Jesus departed and went into the region of Tyre, from Mark chapter 7 verse 24, without offering any explanation of this decision. The only conclusion which the text warrants is that Mark mentioned no reason because he knew of none. The decision of Jesus did not rest upon the recorded facts, since it ignores these, but upon considerations lying outside the history. His life at this period was dominated by a dogmatic idea, which rendered him indifferent to all else, even to the happy and successful work as a teacher which was opening before him. How could Jesus, the teacher, abandon at that moment a people so anxious to learn and so eager for salvation? His action suggests a doubt whether he really felt himself to be a teacher. If all the controversial discourses and sayings and answers to questions, which were, so to speak, wrung from him, were subtracted from the sum of his utterances, how much of the didactic preaching of Jesus would be left over? But even the supposed didactic preaching is not really that of a teacher, since the purpose of his parables was, according to Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, not to reveal, but to conceal, and of the kingdom of God he spoke only in parables, Mark chapter 4, verse 34. Perhaps, however, we are not justified in extending the theory of concealment, simply because it is mentioned in connection with the first parable, to all the parables which he ever spoke, for it is never mentioned again. It could hardly indeed be applied to the parables with a moral, like that, for instance, of the pearl of great price. It is equally inapplicable to the parables of coming judgment uttered at Jerusalem, in which he explicitly exhorts the people to be prepared and watchful in view of the coming of judgment and of the kingdom. But here, too, it is deserving of notice that Jesus whenever he desires to make known anything further concerning the kingdom of God than just its near approach, seems to be confined, as it were, by a higher law, to the parabolic form of discourse. It is as though, for reasons which we cannot grasp, his teaching lay under certain limitations. It appears as a kind of accessory aspect of his vocation. Thus, it was possible for him to give up his work as a teacher, even at the moment when it promised the greatest success. Accordingly, the fact of his always speaking in parables, and of his taking the inexplicable resolution, both point back to a mysterious presupposition, which greatly reduces the importance of Jesus' work as a teacher. One reason for this limitation is distinctly stated in Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, viz. predestination. Jesus knows that the truth which he offers is exclusively for those who have been definitely chosen, that the general and public announcement of his message could only thwart the plans of God, since the chosen are already winning their salvation from God. Only the phrase, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and its variants, belong to the public preaching. And this, therefore, is the only message which he commits to his disciples when sending them forth. What this repentance, supplementary to the law, the special ethic of the interval before the coming of the kingdom is, in its positive acceptation, he explains in the Sermon on the Mount. But all that goes beyond that simple phrase must be publicly presented only in parables, in order that those only who are shown to possess predestination by having the initial knowledge which enables them to understand the parables, 
may receive a more advanced knowledge which is imparted to them in a measure corresponding to their original degree of knowledge unto him that hath shall be given and from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath from mark chapter 4 verse 24 through 25 the predestination view goes along with the eschatology it is pushed to its utmost consequences in the closing incident of the parable of the marriage of the king's son from matthew chapter 22 verses 1 through 14 where the man who in response to a publicly issued invitation sits down at the table of the king but is recognized from his appearance as not called is thrown out into perdition many are called but few are chosen the ethical idea of salvation and the predestinarian limitation of acceptance to the elect are constantly in conflict in the mind of jesus in one case however he finds relief in the thought of predestination when the rich young man turned away not having strength to give up his possessions for the sake of following jesus as he had been commanded to do jesus and his disciples were forced to draw the conclusion that he like other rich men was lost and could not enter into the kingdom of god but immediately afterwards jesus makes the suggestion with men it is impossible but not with god for with god all things are possible from mark chapter 10 verses 17 through 27 that is he will not give up the hope that the young man in spite of appearances which are against him will be found to have belonged to the kingdom of god solely in virtue of the secret all-powerful will of god of a conversion of the young man there is no question in the beatitudes on the other hand the argument is reversed the predestination is inferred from its outward manifestation it may seem to us inconceivable but they are really predestinarian in form blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are the meek blessed are the peacemakers that does not mean that by virtue of their being poor in spirit meek peace-loving they deserve the kingdom jesus does not intend the saying as an injunction or exhortation but as a simple statement of fact in their being poor in spirit in their meekness in their love of peace it is made manifest that they are predestined to the kingdom by the possession of these qualities they are marked as belonging to it in the case of others as in matthew chapter 5 verses 10 through 12 the predestination to the kingdom is made manifest by the persecutions which befall them in this world these are the light of the world which already shines among men for the glory of god from matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 15 the kingdom cannot be earned what happens is that men are called to it and show themselves to be called to it on careful examination it appears that the idea of reward in the sayings of jesus is not really an idea of reward because it is revealed against a background of predestination for the present it is sufficient to note the fact that the eschatological predestinarian view brings a mysterious element of dogma not merely into the teaching but also into the public ministry of jesus to take another point what is the mystery of the kingdom of god it must consist of something more than merely its near approach and something of extreme importance otherwise jesus would be here indulging in mere mystery mongering the saying about the candle which he puts upon the stand in order that what was hidden may be revealed to those who have ears to hear implies that he is making a tremendous revelation to those who understand the parables about the growth of the seed the mystery must therefore contain the explanation why the kingdom must now come and how men are to know how near it is for the general fact that it is very near had already been openly proclaimed both by the baptist and by jesus the mystery therefore must consist of something more than that in these parables it is not the idea of development but of the apparent absence of causation which occupies the foremost place the description aims at suggesting the question how and by what power incomparably great and glorious results can be infallibly produced by an insignificant fact without human aid a man sowed seed much of it was lost 
but the little that fell onto good ground brought forth a harvest, thirty, sixty, an hundredfold, which left no trace of the loss in the sowing. How did that come about? A man sows seed, and does not trouble any further about it, cannot indeed do anything to help it, but he knows that after a definite time, the glorious harvest which arises out of the seed will stand before him. By what power is that effected? An extremely minute grain of mustard seed is planted in the earth, and there necessarily arises out of it a great bush, which cannot certainly have been contained in the grain of seed. How was that? What the parables emphasize is, therefore, so to speak, the in itself negative, inadequate character of the initial fact, upon which, as by a miracle, there follows in the appointed time, through the power of God, some great thing. They lay stress, not upon the natural, but upon the miraculous character of such occurrences. But what is the initial fact of the parables? It is the sowing. It is not said that, by the man who sows the seed, Jesus means himself, the man has no importance. In the parable of the mustard seed, he is not even mentioned. All that is asserted is that the initial fact is already present, as certainly present as the time of the sowing is past at the moment when Jesus speaks. That being so, the kingdom of God must follow as certainly as harvest follows seed sowing. As a man believes in the harvest without being able to explain it, simply because the seed has been sown, so, with the same absolute confidence, he may believe in the kingdom of God. And the initial fact which is symbolized? Jesus can only mean a fact which was actually in existence, the movement of repentance evoked by the Baptist and now intensified by his own preaching. That necessarily involves the bringing in of the kingdom by the power of God, as man's sowing necessitates the giving of the harvest by the same infinite power. Anyone who knows this sees with different eyes the corn growing in the fields and the harvest ripening, for he sees the one fact in the other, and awaits along with the earthly harvest the heavenly, the revelation of the kingdom of God. If we look into the thought more closely, we see that the coming of the kingdom of God is not only symbolically or analogically, but also really and temporally connected with the harvest. The harvest ripening upon earth is the last. With it comes also the kingdom of God which brings in the new age. When the reapers are sent into the fields, the Lord in heaven will cause his harvest to be reaped by the holy angels. If the three parables of Mark chapter 4 contain the mystery of the kingdom of God, and are therefore capable of being summed up in a single formula, this can be nothing else than the joyful exhortation. Ye who have eyes to see, read, in the harvest which is ripening upon earth, what is being prepared in heaven. The eager eschatological hope was to regard the natural process as the last of its kind, and to see in it a special significance in view of the event of which it was to give the signal. The analogical and temporal parallelism becomes complete if we assume that the movement initiated by the Baptist began in the spring, and notice that Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, before sending out the disciples to make a speedy proclamation of the nearness of the kingdom of God, uttered the remarkable saying about the rich harvest. It seems like a final expression of the thought contained in the parables about the seed and its promise and finds its most natural explanation in the supposition that the harvest was actually at hand. Whatever may be thought of this attempt to divine historically the secret of the kingdom of God, there is one thing that cannot be got away from, viz. that the initial fact to which Jesus points, under the figure of the sowing, is somehow or other connected with the eschatological preaching of repentance, which had been begun by the Baptist. That may be the more confidently asserted because Jesus, in another mysterious saying, describes the days of the Baptist as a time which makes preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God. He says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 12, From the days of John the Baptist, even until now, 
the kingdom of heaven is subjected to violence, and the violent wrest it to themselves. The saying has nothing to do with the entering of individuals into the kingdom. It simply asserts that since the coming of the Baptist, a certain number of persons are engaging in forcing on and compelling the coming of the kingdom. Jesus' expectation of the kingdom is an expectation based upon a fact which exercises an active influence upon the kingdom of God. It is not he and not the Baptist who were working at the coming of the kingdom. It is the host of penitence which is wringing it from God, so that it may now come at any moment. The eschatological insight of Johannes Weiss made an end of the modern view that Jesus founded the kingdom. It did away with all activity, as exercised upon the kingdom of God, and made the part of Jesus purely a waiting one. Now the activity comes back into the preaching of the kingdom, but this time eschatologically conditioned. The secret of the kingdom of God, which Jesus unveils in the parables about confident expectation in Mark chapter 4, and declares in so many words in the eulogy on the Baptist from Matthew chapter 11, amounts to this, that in the movement to which the Baptist gave the first impulse, and which still continued, there was an initial fact which was drawing after it the coming of the kingdom, in a fashion which was miraculous, unintelligible, but unfailingly certain, since the sufficient cause for it lay in the power and purpose of God. It should be observed that Jesus, in these parables, as well as in the related saying at the sending forth of the twelve, uses the formula, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. From Mark chapter 4, verse 23, and Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. Thereby signifying that in this utterance there lies concealed a supernatural knowledge concerning the plans of God, which only those who have ears to hear, that is, the foreordained, can detect. For others, these sayings are unintelligible. If this genuinely historical interpretation of the mystery of the kingdom of God is correct, Jesus must have expected the coming of the kingdom at harvest time. And that is just what he did expect. It is for that reason that he sends out his disciples to make known in Israel, as speedily as may be, what is about to happen. That in this he is actuated by a dogmatic idea becomes clear when we notice that, according to Mark, the mission of the twelve followed immediately on the rejection at Nazareth. The unreceptiveness of the Nazarenes had made no impression upon him. He was only astonished at their unbelief, from Mark chapter 6, verse 6. This passage is often interpreted to mean that he was astonished to find his miracle-working power fail him. There is no hint of that in the text. What he is astonished at is that in his native town there were so few believers, that is, elect, knowing as he does that the kingdom of God may appear at any moment. But that fact makes no difference whatever to the nearness of the coming of the kingdom. The evangelist, therefore, places the rejection at Nazareth and the mission of the twelve side by side, simply because he found them in this temporal connection in the tradition. If he had been working by association of ideas, he would not have arrived at this order. The want of connection, the impossibility of applying any natural explanation, is just what is historical, because the course of the history was determined not by outward events, but by the decisions of Jesus, and these were determined by dogmatic, eschatological considerations. To how great an extent this was the case in regard to the mission of the twelve is clearly seen from the charge which Jesus gave them. He tells them in plain words, from Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, that he does not expect to see them back in the present age. The parousia of the Son of Man, which is logically and temporally identical with the dawn of the kingdom, will take place before they shall have completed a hasty journey through the cities of Israel to announce it. That the words mean this and nothing else, that they ought not to be in any way weakened down, should be sufficiently evident. This is the form in which Jesus reveals to them the secret of the kingdom of God. A few days later, he utters the saying about the violent who, 
since the days of John the Baptist, are forcing on the coming of the kingdom. It is equally clear, and here the dogmatic considerations which guided the resolutions of Jesus become still more prominent, that this prediction was not fulfilled. The disciples returned to him, and the appearing of the Son of Man had not taken place. The actual history disavowed the dogmatic history on which the action of Jesus had been based. An event of supernatural history which must take place, and must take place at that particular point of time, failed to come about. That was, for Jesus, who lived wholly in the dogmatic history, the first historical occurrence, the central event which closed the former period of his activity and gave the coming period a new character. To this extent, modern theology is justified when it distinguishes two periods in the life of Jesus, an earlier in which he is surrounded by the people, a later in which he is deserted by them, and travels about with the twelve only. It is a sound observation that the two periods are sharply distinguished by the attitude of Jesus. To explain this difference of attitude, which they thought themselves bound to account for on natural historical grounds, theologians of the modern historical school invented the theory of growing opposition and waning support. Weisse, no doubt, had expressed himself in direct opposition to this theory. Footnote. Weisse found that there was no hint in the sources of the desertion of the people, since, according to these, Jesus was opposed only by the Pharisees, not by the people. The abandonment of the Galilean work and the departure to Jerusalem must, he thought, have been due to some unrecorded fact which revealed to Jesus that the time had come to act in this way. Perhaps, he adds, it was the waning of Jesus' miracle-working power which caused the change in his attitude, since it is remarkable that he performed no further miracles during his sojourn at Jerusalem. End footnote. Keim, who gave it its place in theology, was aware that in setting it up he was going against the plain sense of the text. Later writers lost this consciousness, just as in the first and third gospel the significance of the messianic secret in Mark gradually faded away. They imagined that they could find the basis of fact for the theory in the texts, but did not realize that they only believed the desertion of the multitude and the flights and retirements of Jesus because they could not otherwise explain historically the alteration in his conduct, his withdrawal from public work, and his resolve to die. The thoroughgoing eschatological school makes better work of it. They recognize in the non-occurrence of the parousia promised in Matthew chapter 10 verse 23, the historic fact in the estimation of Jesus, which in some way determined the alteration in his plans and his attitude towards the multitude. The whole history of Christianity down to the present day, that is to say, the real inner history of it, is based on the delay of the parousia, the non-occurrence of the parousia, the abandonment of eschatology, the progress and completion of the de-eschatologizing of religion, which has been connected therewith. It should be noted that the non-fulfillment of Matthew chapter 10 verse 23 is the first postponement of the parousia. We have, therefore, here the first significant date in the history of Christianity. It gives to the work of Jesus a new direction, otherwise inexplicable. Here we recognize also why the Markan hypothesis, in constructing its view of the life of Jesus, found itself obliged to have recourse, more and more, to the help of modern psychology, and thus necessarily became more and more unhistorical. The fact which alone makes possible an understanding of the whole is lacking in this gospel. Without Matthew chapter 10 and chapter 11, everything remains enigmatic. For this reason, Bruno Bauer and Vreda are in their own way the only consistent representatives of the Markan hypothesis from the point of view of historical criticism, when they arrive at the result that the Markan account is inherently unintelligible. Keim, with his strong sense of historical reality, rightly felt that the plan of the life of Jesus should not be constructed exclusively on the basis of Mark. The recognition that Mark alone gives an inadequate basis, 
is more important than any Urmarcus theories, for which it is impossible to discover a literary foundation, or find an historical use. A simple induction from the facts takes us beyond Mark. In the discourse material of Matthew, which the modern historical school thought they could sift in here and there, wherever there seemed to be room for it, there lie hidden certain facts, facts which never happened, but are all the more important for that. Why Mark describes the events and discourses in the neighborhood of the Mission of the Twelve with such careful authentication is a literary question which the historical study of the life of Jesus may leave open, the more so since, even as a literary question, it is insoluble. The prediction of the parousia of the Son of Man is not the only one which remained unfulfilled. There is the prediction of sufferings which is connected with it. To put it more accurately, the prediction of the appearing of the Son of Man in Matthew chapter 10 verse 23 runs up into a prediction of sufferings, which, working up to a climax, forms the remainder of the discourse at the sending forth of the disciples. This prediction of sufferings has as little to do with objective history as the prediction of the parousia. Consequently, none of the lives of Jesus, which follow the lines of a natural psychology, from Weisse down to Oskar Holtzmann, can make anything of it. Footnote. The most logical attitude in regard to it is Bousset's, who proposes to treat the mission and everything connected with it as a confused and unintelligible tradition. End footnote. They either strike it out or transfer it to the last gloomy epoch of the life of Jesus, regard it as an unintelligible anticipation, or put it down to the account of primitive theology, which serves as a scrap heap for everything for which they cannot find a place in the historical life of Jesus. In the texts, it is quite evident that Jesus is not speaking of sufferings after his death, but of sufferings which will befall them as soon as they have gone forth from him. The death of Jesus is not here presupposed, but only the parousia of the Son of Man, and it is implied that these will occur just after these sufferings and bring them to a close. If the theology of the primitive church had remolded the tradition, as is always being asserted, it would have made Jesus give his followers directions for their conduct after his death. That we do not find anything of this kind is the best proof that there can be no question of a remolding of the life of Jesus by primitive theology. How easy it would have been for the early church to scatter here and there through the discourses of Jesus, directions which were only to be applied after his death. But the simple fact is that it did not do so. The sufferings of which the prospect is held out at the sending forth are doubly, trebly, nay, four times over, unhistorical. In the first place, and this is the only point which modern historical theology has noticed, because there is not a shadow of a suggestion in the outward circumstances of anything which could form a natural occasion for the predictions of, and exhortations relating to, sufferings. In the second place, and this has been overlooked by modern theology because it has already declared them to be unhistorical in its own characteristic fashion, viz. by striking them out, because they were not fulfilled. In the third place, and this has not entered into the mind of modern theology at all, because these sayings were spoken in the closest connection with the promise of the parousia, and are placed in the closest connection with that event. In the fourth place, because the description of that which is to befall the disciples is quite without any basis in experience. A time of general dissension will begin, in which brothers will rise up against brothers, and fathers against sons, and children against their parents, to cause them to be put to death. Matthew chapter 10 verse 21. And the disciples shall be hated of all men for his name's sake. Let them strive to hold out to the end, that is, to the coming of the Son of Man, in order that they may be saved. From Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. But why should they suddenly be hated and persecuted for the name of Jesus, seeing that this name played no part whatever in their preaching? That is simply inconceivable. The relation of Jesus to the Son of Man, the fact, that is to say, that it is He who is to be manifested as Son of Man, 
must therefore in some way or other become known in the interval, not, however, through the disciples, but by some other means of revelation. A kind of supernatural illumination will suddenly make known all that Jesus has been keeping secret regarding the kingdom of God and his position in the kingdom. This illumination will arise as suddenly and without preparation as the spirit of strife. And as a matter of fact, Jesus predicts to the disciples in the same discourse that to their own surprise a supernatural wisdom will suddenly speak from their lips, so that it will be not they, but the Spirit of God who will answer the great ones of the earth. As the Spirit is for Jesus and early Christian theology something concrete which is to descend upon the elect among mankind only in consequence of a definite event, the outpouring of the Spirit which, according to the prophecy of Joel, should precede the day of judgment. Jesus must have anticipated that this would occur during the absence of his disciples, in the midst of the time of strife and confusion. To put it differently, the whole of the discourse at the sending forth of the twelve, taken in the clear sense of the words, is a prediction of the events of the time of the end, events which are immediately at hand, in which the supernatural eschatological course of history will break through into the natural course. The expectation of sufferings is therefore doctrinal and unhistorical, as is, precisely in the same way, the expectation of the pouring forth of the Spirit uttered at the same time. The parousia of the Son of Man is to be preceded, according to the messianic dogma, by a time of strife and confusion, as it were, the birth throes of the Messiah, and the outpouring of the Spirit. It should be noticed that, according to Joel chapters 3 and 4, the outpouring of the Spirit, along with the miraculous signs, forms the prelude to the judgment, and also that in the same context, Joel chapter 3 verse 13, the judgment is described as the harvest day of God. Footnote. Joel chapter 3 verse 13. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. In the Apocalypse of John, too, the last judgment is described as the heavenly harvest. Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Revelation chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. The most remarkable parallel to the discourse at the sending forth of the disciples is offered by the Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch. Behold, the days come when the time of the world shall be ripe, and the harvest of the sowing of the good and of the evil shall come, when the Almighty shall bring upon the earth and upon its inhabitants and upon their rulers confusion of spirit and terror that makes the heart stand still and they shall hate one another, and provoke one another to war. And the despised shall have power over them of reputation, and the mean shall exalt themselves over them that are highly esteemed. And the many shall be at the mercy of the few, and all who shall be saved, and shall escape the before-mentioned dangers, shall be given into the hands of my servant, the Messiah. Chapter 70, verses 2, 3, and 9. The connection between the ideas of harvest and of judgment was therefore one of the stock features of the apocalyptic writings. And as the apocalypse of Baruch dates from the period about A.D. 70, it may be assumed that this association of ideas was also current in the Jewish apocalyptic of the time of Jesus. Here is a basis for understanding the secret of the kingdom of God in the parables of sowing and reaping, historically and in accordance with the ideas of the time. What Jesus did was to make known to those who understood him that the coming earthly harvest was the last, and was also the token of the coming heavenly harvest. The eschatological interpretation is immensely strengthened by these parallels. End footnote. Here we have a remarkable parallel to the saying about the harvest in Matthew chapter 9 verse 38 which forms the introduction to the discourse at the sending forth of the disciples. There is only one point in which the predicted course of eschatological events is incomplete. The appearance of Elias is not mentioned. End of chapter 19, part 3
Chapter 19, Part 4 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 4 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. Jesus could not prophesy to the disciples the parousia of the Son of Man without pointing them, at the same time, to the pre-eschatological events which must first occur. He must open to them a part of the secret of the kingdom of God, viz., the nearness of the harvest, that they might not be taken by surprise and caused to doubt by these events. Thus, this discourse is historical as a whole and down to the smallest detail precisely because, according to the view of modern theology, it must be judged unhistorical. It is, in fact, full of eschatological dogma. Jesus had no need to instruct the disciples as to what they were to teach, for they had only to utter a cry. But concerning the events which should supervene, it was necessary that he should give them information. Therefore, the discourse does not consist of instruction, but of predictions of sufferings and of the parousia. That being so, we may judge with what right the modern psychological theology dismisses the great Matthean discourses offhand as mere composite structures. Just let anyone try to show how the evangelist, when he was racking his brains over the task of making a discourse at the sending forth of the disciples, half by the method of piecing it together out of traditional sayings and primitive theology, and half by inventing it, lighted on the curious idea of making Jesus speak entirely of inopportune and unpractical matters, and of then going on to provide the evidence that they never happened. The foretelling of the sufferings that belong to the eschatological distress is part and parcel of the preaching of the approach of the kingdom of God, and embodies the secret of the kingdom. It is for that reason that the thought of suffering appears at the end of the Beatitudes, and in the closing petition of the Lord's Prayer. For the pyrosmos, which is there in view, is not an individual psychological temptation, but the general eschatological time of tribulation, from which God is besought to exempt those who pray so earnestly for the coming of the kingdom, and not to expose them to that tribulation by way of putting them to the test. There followed neither the sufferings, nor the outpouring of the Spirit, nor the parousia of the Son of Man. The disciples returned safe and sound, and full of a proud satisfaction. For one promise had been realized, the power which had been given them over the demons. But from the moment when they rejoined him, all his thoughts and efforts were devoted to getting rid of the people in order to be alone with them. From Mark chapter 6, verses 30-33. through 33. Previously, during their absence, he had, almost in open speech, taught the multitude concerning the Baptist, concerning that which was to precede the coming of the kingdom, and concerning the judgment which should come upon the impenitent, even upon whole towns of them, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24. Because, in spite of the miracles which they had witnessed, they had not recognized the day of grace and diligently used it for repentance. At the same time, he rejoined before them over all those whom God had enlightened that they might see what was going forward, and had called them to his side, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. And now, suddenly, the moment the disciples return, his one thought is to get away from the people. They, however, follow him and overtake him on the shores of the lake. He puts the Jordan between himself and them by crossing to Bethsaida. They also came to Bethsaida. He returns to Capernaum. They do the same. Since in Galilee it is impossible for him to be alone, and he absolutely must be alone, he slips away to the north. Once more, modern theology was right. He really does flee, not, however, from hostile scribes, but from the people who dog his footsteps in order to await in his company the appearing of the kingdom of God and of the Son of Man, to await it in vain. Footnote. With what right does modern critical theology tear apart even the discourse in Matthew chapter 11, 
in order to make the cry of jubilation into the cry with which Jesus saluted the return of his disciples, and to find lodgment for their woes upon Chorazin and Bethsaida somewhere else in an appropriately gloomy context. Is not all this apparently disconnected material held together by an inner bond of connection, the secret of the kingdom of God which is imminently impending over Jesus and the people? Or is Jesus expected to preach like one who has a thesis to maintain, and seeks about for the most logical arrangement. Does not a certain lack of orderly connection belong to the very idea of prophetic speech? End footnote. In Strauss's first Life of Jesus, the question is thrown out whether, in view of Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus did not think of his parousia as a transformation which should take place during his lifetime. Gilani bases his work on this possibility as on an established historical fact. Dalman takes this hypothesis to be the necessary correlative of the interpretation of the self-designation Son of Man on the basis of Daniel and the Apocalypses. If Jesus, he argues, designated himself in this futuristic sense as the Son of Man who comes from heaven, he must have assumed that he would first be transported thither. Quote, a man who had died or been wrapped away from the earth might perhaps be brought into the world again in this way, or one who had never been on earth might so descend thither. Close quote. But as this conception of transformation and removal seems to Dahlman untenable in the case of Jesus, he treats it as a reductio ad absurdum of the eschatological interpretation of the title. But why? If Jesus as a man walking in a natural body upon earth predicts to his disciples the parousia of the Son of Man in the immediate future, with the secret conviction that he himself was to be revealed as the Son of Man, he must have made precisely this assumption that he would first be supernaturally removed and transformed. He thought of himself, as any one must who believes in the immediate coming of the last things, as living in two different conditions, the present and the future condition, into which he is to be transferred at the coming of the new supernatural world. We learn later that the disciples, on the way up to Jerusalem, were entirely possessed by the thought of what they should be when this transformation took place. They contend as to who shall have the highest position, from Mark chapter 11, verse 33. James and John wished Jesus to promise them in advance the thrones on his right hand and on his left, from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 37. He, moreover, does not rebuke them for indulging such thoughts, but only tells them how much, in the present age, of service humiliation and suffering is necessary to constitute a claim to such places in the future age, and that it does not in the last resort belong to him to allot the places on his left and on his right, but they shall be given to those for whom they are prepared. Therefore, perhaps, not to any of his disciples. From Mark chapter 10 verse 40. At this point, therefore, the knowledge and will of Jesus are thwarted and limited by the predestinarianism which is bound up with eschatology. It is quite mistaken, however, to speak as modern theology does, of the service he required as belonging to the new ethic of the kingdom of God. There is, for Jesus, no ethic of the kingdom of God, for in the kingdom of God all natural relationships, even, for example, the distinction of sex, from Mark chapter 12, verses 25 and 26, are abolished, Temptation and sin no longer exist. All is rain, a rain which has gradations, Jesus speaks of the least in the kingdom of God, according as it has been determined in each individual case from all eternity, and according as each, by his self-humiliation and refusal to rule in the present age, has proved his fitness for bearing rule in the future kingdom. For the loftier stations, however, it is necessary to have proved oneself in persecution and suffering. Accordingly, Jesus asks the sons of Zebedee whether, since they claim these thrones on his right hand and on his left, 
they feel themselves strong enough to drink of his cup and be baptized with his baptism from mark chapter 10 verse 38 to serve to humble oneself to incur persecution and death belong to the ethic of the interim just as much as does penitence they are indeed only a higher form of penitence a vivid eschatological expectation is therefore impossible to conceive apart from the idea of a metamorphosis the resurrection is only a special case of this metamorphosis the form in which the new condition of things is realized in the case of those who are already dead the resurrection the metamorphosis and the parousia of the son of man take place simultaneously and are one and the same act footnote if therefore jesus at a later point predicted to his disciples his resurrection he means by that not a single isolated act but a complex occurrence consisting of his metamorphosis translation to heaven and parousia as the son of man and with this is associated the general eschatological resurrection of the dead it is therefore one and the same thing whether he speaks of his resurrection or of his coming on the clouds of heaven End footnote. it is therefore quite indifferent whether a man loses his life shortly before the parousia in order to find his life if that is what is ordained for him that signifies only that he will undergo the eschatological metamorphosis with the dead instead of with the living the pauline eschatology recognizes both conceptions side by side in such a way however that the resurrection is subordinated to the metamorphosis he says in first corinthians chapter fifteen verse fifty one and following behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed the apostle himself desires to be one of those who live to experience the metamorphosis and to be clothed with a heavenly mode of existence from second corinthians chapter five verse one and following the metamorphosis however and the resurrection are for those who are in christ connected with a being caught up into the clouds of heaven from first thessalonians chapter four verse fifteen and following therefore paul also makes one and the same event of the metamorphosis resurrection and translation in seeking clues to the eschatology of jesus scholars have passed over the eschatology which lies closest to it that of paul but why is it not identical with that of jesus at least in so far that both are jewish eschatology did not rimerus long ago declare that the eschatology of the primitive christian community was identical with the jewish and only went beyond it in claiming a definite knowledge on a single point which was unessential to the nature and course of the expected events in knowing that is who the son of man should be that christians drew no distinction between their eschatology and the jewish is evident from the whole character of the earlier apocalyptic literature and not least from the apocalypse of john after all what alteration did the belief that jesus was the son of man who was to be revealed make in the general scheme of the course of apocalyptic events from the rabbinic literature little help is to be derived towards the understanding of the world of thought in which jesus lived and his view of his own person the latest researches may be said to have made that clear a few moral maxims a few halting parables that is all that can be produced in the way of parallels even the conception which is there suggested of the hidden coming and the work of the messiah is of little importance we find the same ideas in the mouth of trypho in justin's dialogue and that makes their jewish character doubtful that jesus of nazareth knew himself to be the son of man who was to be revealed is for us the great fact of his self-consciousness which is not to be further explained whether there had been any kind of preparation for it in contemporary theology or not the self-consciousness of jesus cannot in fact be illustrated or explained 
All that can be explained is the eschatological view, in which the man who possessed that self-consciousness saw reflected in advance the coming events, both those of a more general character and those which especially related to himself. Footnote. The title of Baldensperger's book, The Self-Consciousness of Jesus in the Light of the Messianic Hopes of His Times, really contains a promise which is impossible of fulfillment. The contemporary Messianic Hopes can only explain the hopes of Jesus so far as they correspond thereto, not his view of his own person, in which he is absolutely original. End footnote. The eschatology of Jesus can therefore only be interpreted by the aid of the curiously intermittent Jewish apocalyptic literature of the period between Daniel and the Bar Kokhba rising. What else, indeed, are the synoptic gospels, the Pauline letters, the Christian apocalypses, than products of Jewish apocalyptic, belonging, moreover, to its greatest and most flourishing period? Historically regarded, the Baptist, Jesus, and Paul are simply the culminating manifestations of Jewish apocalyptic thought. The usual representation is the exact converse of the truth. Writers describe Jewish eschatology in order to illustrate the ideas of Jesus. But what is this Jewish eschatology after all? It is an eschatology with a great gap in it, because the culminating period, with the documents which relate to it, has been left out. The true historian will describe the eschatology of the Baptist, of Jesus, and of Paul in order to explain Jewish eschatology. It is nothing less than a misfortune for the science of New Testament theology that no real attempt has hitherto been made to write the history of Jewish eschatology as it really was, that is, with the inclusion of the Baptist, of Jesus, and of Paul. All this has had to be said in order to justify the apparently self-evident assertion that Mark, Matthew, and Paul are the best sources for the Jewish eschatology of the time of Jesus. They represent a phase, which even in detail is self-explanatory, of that Jewish apocalyptic hope which manifested itself from time to time. We are, therefore, justified in first reconstructing the Jewish apocalyptic of the time independently out of these documents, that is to say, in bringing the details of the discourses of Jesus into an eschatological system, and then on the basis of this system, endeavoring to explain the apparently disconnected events in the history of his public life. The lines of connection which run backwards towards the Psalms of Solomon, Enoch, and Daniel, and forwards towards the Apocalypses of Baruch and Enoch, are extremely important for the understanding of certain general conceptions. On the other hand, it is impossible to overemphasize the uniqueness of the point of view from which the eschatology of the time of the Baptist, of Jesus, and of Paul presents itself to us. In the first place, men feel themselves so close to the coming events that they only see what lies nearest to them. The imaginative development of detail entirely ceases. In the second place, it appears to us as though seen, so to speak, from within, passed through the medium of powerful minds like those of the Baptist and Jesus. That is why it is so great and simple. On the other hand, a certain complication arises from the fact that it now intersects actual history. All these are original features of it, which are not found in the Jewish apocalyptic writings of the preceding and following periods. And that is why these documents give us so little help in regard to the characteristic detail of the eschatology of Jesus and his contemporaries. A further point to be noticed is that the eschatology of the time of Jesus shows the influence of the eschatology of the ancient prophets in a way which is not paralleled either before or after. Compare the synoptic eschatology with that of the Psalms of Solomon. In place of the legal righteousness, which, since the return from the exile, had formed the link of connection between the present and the future, we find the prophetic ethic, the demand for a general repentance, even in the case of the Baptist. In the apocalypses of Baruch and Ezra, we see, especially in the theological character of the latter, the persistent traces of this ethical deepening of apocalyptic. But even in individual conceptions, the apocalyptic of the Baptist, 
and of the period which he introduces, reaches back to the eschatology of the prophetic writings. The pouring forth of the Spirit and the figure of Elias, who comes again to earth, play a great role in it. The difficulty is, indeed, consciously felt of combining the two eschatologies and bringing the prophetic within the Danielic. How, it is asked, can the son of David be at the same time the Danielic son of man Messiah, at once David's son and David's Lord? It is inadequate to speak of a synthesis of the two eschatologies. What has happened is nothing less than the remolding, the elevation of the Daniel Enoch apocalyptic by the spirit and conceptions belonging to the ancient prophetic hope. A great simplification and deepening of eschatology begins to show itself even in the Psalms of Solomon. The conception of righteousness which the writer applies is, in spite of its legal aspect, of an ethical, prophetic character. It is an eschatology associated with great historical events, the eschatology of a Phariseeism which is fighting for a cause, and has therefore a certain inward greatness. Footnote. The fact that in the Psalms of Solomon the Messiah is designated by the ancient prophetic name of the Son of David is significant of the rising influence of the ancient prophetic literature. This designation has nothing whatever to do with a political ideal of a kingly messiah. This Davidic king and his kingdom are, in their character and the manner of their coming, every whit as supernatural as the Son of Man and his coming. The same historical fact was read into both Daniel and the prophets. End footnote. Between the Psalms of Solomon and the appearance of the Baptist, there lies the decadence of Phariseeism. At this point, there suddenly appears an eschatological movement detached from Phariseeism, which was declining into an external legalism, a movement resting on a basis of its own, and thoroughly penetrated with the spirit of the ancient prophets. The ultimate differentia of this eschatology is that it was not, like the other apocalyptic movements, called into existence by historical events. The apocalypse of Daniel was called forth by the religious oppression of Antiochus, the Psalms of Solomon by the civil strife at Jerusalem, and the first appearance of the Roman power under Pompey, fourth Ezra and Baruch by the destruction of Jerusalem. Footnotes Enoch is an offshoot of the Danielic apocalyptic writings. The earliest portion, the apocalypse of the ten weeks, is independent of Daniel and of contemporary origin. The similitudes, which, with their description of the judgment of the Son of Man, are so important in connection with the thoughts of Jesus, may be placed in 80 to 70 BC. They do not presuppose the taking of Jerusalem by Pompey. The Psalms of Solomon are therefore a decade later than the similitudes. The Apocalypse of Baruch seems to have been composed not very long after the fall of Jerusalem. Fourth Ezra is twenty to thirty years later. The Psalms of Solomon form the last document of Jewish eschatology before the coming of the Baptist. For almost a hundred years, from 60 BC until AD 30, we have no information regarding eschatological movements. And do the Psalms of Solomon really point to a deep eschatological movement at the time of the taking of Jerusalem by Pompey? Hardly, I think. It is to be noticed in studying the times of Jesus that the surrounding circumstances have no eschatological character. The fall of Jerusalem marks the next turning point in the history of the apocalyptic hope, as Baruch and 4th Ezra show. End footnotes. On the contrary, the indifference shown by the Roman administration towards the movement proves that the Romans knew nothing of a condition of great and general messianic excitement among the Jewish people. The conduct of the Pharisaic party also, and the indifference of the great mass of the people, show that there can have been no question at that time of a national movement. What is really remarkable about this wave of apocalyptic enthusiasm is the fact that it was called forth not by external events, but solely by the appearance of two great personalities, and subsides with their disappearance, without leaving among the people generally any trace, except a feeling of hatred towards the new sect. 
the baptist and jesus are not therefore born upon the current of a general eschatological movement the period offers no events calculated to give an impulse to eschatological enthusiasm they themselves set the times in motion by acting by creating eschatological facts it is this mighty creative force which constitutes the difficulty in grasping historically the eschatology of jesus and the baptist instead of literary artifice speaking out of a distant imaginary past there now enter into the field of eschatology men living acting men it was the only time when that ever happened in jewish eschatology there is silence all around the baptist appears and cries repent for the kingdom of god is at hand soon after that comes jesus and in the knowledge that he is the coming son of man lays hold of the wheel of the world to set it moving on the last revolution which is to bring all ordinary history to a close it refuses to turn and he throws himself upon it then it does turn and crushes him instead of bringing in the eschatological conditions he has destroyed them the wheel rolls onward and the mangled body of the one immeasurably great man who was strong enough to think of himself as the spiritual ruler of mankind and to bend history to his purpose is hanging upon it still that is his victory and his reign these considerations regarding the distinctive character of the synoptic eschatology were necessary in order to explain the significance of the sending forth of the disciples and the discourse which jesus uttered upon that occasion jesus's purpose is to set in motion the eschatological development of history to let loose the final woes the confusion and strife from which shall issue the parousia and so to introduce the supramundane phase of the eschatological drama that is his task for which he has authority here below that is why he says in the same discourse think not that i am come to send peace on the earth i am not come to send peace but a sword from matthew chapter 10 verse 34 it was with a view to this initial movement that he chose his disciples they are not his helpers in the work of teaching we never see them in that capacity and he did not prepare them to carry on that work after his death the very fact that he chooses just twelve shows that it is a dogmatic idea which he has in mind he chooses them as those who are destined to hurl the firebrand into the world and are afterwards as those who have been the comrades of the unrecognized messiah before he came to his kingdom to be associates in ruling and judging it footnote jesus promises them expressly that at the appearing of the son of man they shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel from matthew chapter nineteen verse twenty eight it is to their part in the judgment that belong also the authority to bind and to loose which he entrusts to them first to peter personally from matthew chapter sixteen verse nineteen and afterwards to all the twelve from matthew chapter eighteen verse eighteen in such a way too that their present decisions will be somehow or other binding at the judgment or does the upon earth refer only to the fact that the messianic last judgment will be held on earth i give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven from matthew chapter sixteen verse nineteen why should these words not be historical is it because in the same context jesus speaks of the church which he will found upon the rock discipleship but if one has once got a clear idea from paul second clement the epistle to the hebrews and the shepherd of hermas what the pre-existing church was which was to appear in the last times it will no longer appear impossible that jesus might have spoken of the church against which the gates of hell shall not prevail of course if the passage is given an uneschatological reference to the church as we know it it loses all real meaning and becomes a treasure trove to the roman catholic exegete and a terror to the protestant End footnote End of chapter nineteen part four
Chapter 19, Part 5 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 5 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. But what was to be the fate of the future Son of Man during the messianic woes of the last times? It appears as if it was appointed for him to share the persecution and the suffering. He says that those who shall be saved must take their cross and follow him, from Matthew chapter 10 verse 38, that his followers must be willing to lose their lives for his sake, and that only those who in this time of terror confess their allegiance to him shall be confessed by him before his heavenly father from matthew chapter 10 verse 32 similarly in the last of the beatitudes he had pronounced those blessed who were despised and persecuted for his sake from matthew chapter 5 verses 11 and 12 as the future bearer of this supreme rule he must go through the deepest humiliation there is danger that his followers may doubt him therefore the last words of his message to the baptist just at the time when he sent forth the twelve is blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me from matthew chapter eleven verse six if he makes a point of familiarizing others with the thought that in the time of tribulation they may even lose their lives he must have recognized that this possibility was still more strongly present in his own case it is possible that in the enigmatic saying about the disciples fasting when the bridegroom is taken away from them from mark chapter 2 verse 20 there is a hint of what jesus expected in that case suffering death and resurrection must have been closely united in the messianic consciousness from the first so much however is certain viz that the thought of suffering formed part at the time of the sending forth of the disciples of the mystery of the kingdom of god and of the messiahship of jesus and that in the form that jesus and all the elect were to be brought low in the pyrasmos at the time of the death struggle against the evil world power which would arise against them brought down it might be even to death it mattered as little in his own case as in that of others whether at the time of the parousia he should be one of those who should be metamorphosed or one who had died and risen again the question arises however how this self-consciousness of jesus could remain concealed it is true the miracles had nothing to do with the messiahship since no one expected the messiah to come as an earthly miracle worker in the present age on the contrary it would have been the greatest of miracles if any one had recognized the messiah as an earthly miracle worker how far the cries of the demoniacs who addressed him as messiah were intelligible by the people must remain an open question what is clear is that his messiahship did not become known in this way even to his disciples and yet in all his speech and action the messianic consciousness shines forth one might indeed speak of the acts of his messianic consciousness the beatitudes nay the whole of the sermon on the mount with the authoritative i forever breaking through bears witness to the high dignity which he ascribed to himself did not this i set the people thinking what must they have thought when at the close of this discourse he spoke of people who at the day of judgment would call upon him as lord and appeal to the works which they had done in his name and who yet were destined to be rejected because he would not recognize them from matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23 what must they thought of him when he pronounced those blessed who were persecuted and despised for his sake from matthew chapter 5 verse 11 and 12 by what authority did this man forgive sins from mark chapter 2 verse 5 and following in the discourse at the sending forth of the disciples the i is still more prominent he demands of men that in the trials to come they shall confess him that they shall love him more than father or mother bear their cross after him and follow him to the death 
since it is only for such that he can entreat his heavenly Father, from Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and following. Admitting that the expression, Heavenly Father, contained no riddle for the listening disciples, since he had taught them to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, we have still to ask, who was he whose yea or nay should prevail with God to determine the fate of men at the judgment? And yet they found it hard, nay, impossible, to think of him as Messiah. They guessed him to be a prophet. Some thought of Elias, some of John the Baptist risen from the dead, as appears clearly from the answer of the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. Footnote that he could be taken for the Baptist risen from the dead shows how short a time before the death of the Baptist his ministry had begun. He only became known, as the Baptist's question shows, at the time of the mission of the disciples. Herod first heard of him after the death of the Baptist. Had he known anything of Jesus beforehand, it would have been impossible for him suddenly to identify him with the Baptist risen from the dead. This elementary consideration has been overlooked in all calculations of the length of the public ministry of Jesus. End footnote. The Messiah was a supernatural personality who was to appear in the last times, and who was not expected upon earth before that. At this point, a difficulty presents itself. How could Jesus be Elias for the people? Did they not hold John the Baptist to be Elias? Not in the least. Jesus was the first and the only person who attributed this office to him. And, moreover, he declares it to the people as something mysterious, difficult to understand. If ye can receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. From Matthew chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. In making this revelation, he is communicating to them a piece of supernatural knowledge, opening up a part of the mystery of the kingdom of God. Therefore, he uses the same formula of emphasis as when making known in parables the mystery of the kingdom of God, from Mark chapter 4. The disciples were not with him at this time, and therefore did not learn what was the role of John the Baptist. When a little later, in descending from the Mount of Transfiguration, he predicted to the three who formed the inner circle of his followers the resurrection of the Son of Man, they came to him with difficulties about the rising from the dead. How could this be possible when, according to the Pharisees and scribes, Elias must come first? Whereupon Jesus explains to them that the preacher of repentance whom Herod had put to death had been Elias. From Mark chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. Why did not the people take the Baptist to be Elias? In the first place, no doubt, because he did not describe himself as such. In the next place, because he did no miracle. He was only a natural man without any evidence of supernatural power, only a prophet. In the third place, and that was the decisive point, he had himself pointed forward to the coming of Elias. He who was to come, he whom he preached, was not the Messiah, but Elias. He describes him not as a supernatural personality, not as a judge, not as one who will be manifested at the unveiling of the heavenly world, but as one who, in his work, shall resemble himself, only much greater, one who, like himself, baptizes, though with the Holy Spirit. Had it ever been represented as the work of the Messiah to baptize? Before the last judgment, so it was inferred from Joel, the great outpouring of the Spirit was to take place. Before the last judgment, so taught Malachi, Elias was to come. Until these events had occurred, the manifestation of the Son of Man was not to be looked for. Men's thoughts were fixed, therefore, not on the Messiah, but upon Elias and the outpouring of the Spirit. The Baptist, in his preaching, combines both ideas— and predicts the coming of the Great One who shall baptize with the Holy Spirit, i.e., who brings about the outpouring of the Spirit. His own preaching was only designed to secure that, at his coming, that Great One should find a community sanctified and prepared to receive the Spirit. When he heard in the prison of one who did great wonders and signs, 
he desired to learn with certainty whether this was he who was to come. If this question is taken as referring to the messiahship, the whole narrative loses its meaning and upsets the theory of the messianic secret, since, in this case at least, one person had become aware, independently, of the office which belonged to Jesus, not to mention all the ineptitudes involved in making the Baptist here speak in doubt and confusion. Moreover, on this false interpretation of the question, the point of Jesus' discourse is lost. For in this case, it is not clear why he says to the people afterwards, If ye can receive it, John himself is Elias. This revelation presupposes that Jesus and the people who had heard the question which had been addressed to him also gave it its only natural meaning, referring it to Jesus as the bearer of the office of Elias. That even the first evangelist gives the episode a messianic setting by introducing it with the words, When John heard in the prison of the works of the Christ, does not alter the facts of the body of the narrative. The sequel directly contradicts the introduction. And this interpretation fully explains the evasive answer of Jesus, in which exegesis has always recognized a certain reserve without ever being able to make it intelligible why Jesus did not simply send him the message, Yes, I am he. Where to, however, according to modern theology, he would have needed to add, But another kind of Messiah from him whom you expect. The fact was, the Baptist had put him in an extremely difficult position. He could not answer that he was Elias if he held himself to be the Messiah. On the other hand, he could not and would not disclose to him, and still less to the messengers and the listening multitude, the secret of his Messiahship. Therefore, he sends this obscure message, which only contains a confirmation of the facts which John had already heard and closes with a warning, come what may, not to be offended in him. Of this, the Baptist was to make what he could. It mattered, in fact, little how John understood the message. The time was much more advanced than he supposed. The hammer of the world's clock had risen to strike the last hour. All that he needed to know was that he had no cause to doubt. In revealing to the people the true office of the Baptist, Jesus unveiled to them almost the whole mystery of the kingdom of God, and nearly disclosed the secret of his messiahship. For if Elias was already present, was not the coming of the kingdom close at hand? And if John was Elias, who was Jesus? There could be only one answer, the Messiah. But this seemed impossible, because Messiah was expected as a supernatural personality. The eulogy on the Baptist is, historically regarded, identical in content with the prediction of the parousia in the discourse at the sending forth of the disciples. For after the coming of Elias, there must follow immediately the judgment and the other events belonging to the last time. Now we can understand why, in the enumeration of the events of the last time in the discourse to the twelve, the coming of Elias is not mentioned. We see here, too, how, in the thought of Jesus, messianic doctrine forces its way into history and simply abolishes the historic aspect of the events. The Baptist had not held himself to be Elias. The people had not thought of attributing this office to him. The description of Elias did not fit him at all, since he had done none of those things which Elias was to do. And yet Jesus makes him Elias, simply because he expected his own manifestation as son of man, and before that it was necessary that Elias must first have to come. And even when John was dead, Jesus still told the disciples that in him Elias had come, although the death of Elias was not contemplated in the eschatological doctrine and was in fact unthinkable. But Jesus must somehow drag or force the eschatological events into the framework of the actual occurrences. Thus, the conception of the dogmatic element in the narrative widens in an unexpected fashion. And even what before seemed natural becomes, on a closer examination, doctrinal. The Baptist is made into Elias solely by the force of Jesus' messianic consciousness. 
A short time afterwards, immediately upon the return of the disciples, he spoke and acted before their eyes in a way which presupposed the messianic secret. The people had been dogging his steps. At a lonely spot on the shores of the lake they surrounded him, and he taught them about many things. From Mark chapter 6, verses 30-34. through 34. The day was drawing to a close, but they held closely to him without troubling about food. In the evening, before sending them away, he fed them. Visa, long ago, had constantly emphasized the fact that the feeding of the multitude was one of the greatest historical problems, because this narrative, like that of the Transfiguration, is very firmly riveted to its historical setting, and, therefore, imperatively demands explanation. How is the historical element in it to be got at? Certainly not by seeking to explain the apparently miraculous in it on natural lines, by representing that at the bidding of Jesus people brought out the baskets of provision which they had been concealing, and thus importing into the tradition a natural fact which, so far from being hinted at in the narrative, is actually excluded by it. Our solution is that the whole is historical, except the closing remark that they were all filled. Jesus distributed the provisions which he and his disciples had with them among the multitude, so that each received a very little after he had first offered thanks. The significance lies in the giving of thanks and in the fact that they had received from him consecrated food. Because he is the future Messiah, this meal becomes, without their knowledge, the messianic feast. With the morsel of bread which he gives his disciples to distribute to the people, he consecrates them as partakers in the coming messianic feast, and gives them the guarantee that they, who had shared his table in the time of his obscurity, would also share it in the time of his glory. In the prayer, he gave thanks not only for the food, but also for the coming kingdom and all its blessings. It is the counterpart of the Lord's Prayer, where he so strangely inserts the petition for daily bread between the petitions for the coming of the kingdom and the deliverance from the pyrasmos. The feeding of the multitude was more than a love feast, a fellowship meal. It was from the point of view of Jesus a sacrament of salvation. We never realize sufficiently that in a period when the judgment and the glory were expected as close at hand, one thought arising out of this expectation must have acquired special prominence. How, namely, a man could obtain a guarantee of coming scatheless through the judgment, of being saved and received into the kingdom, of being signed and sealed for deliverance amid the coming trial as the chosen people in Egypt had a sign revealed to them from God, by means of which they might be manifest as those who were to be spared. But once we do realize this, we can understand why the thought of signing and sealing runs through the whole of the apocalyptic literature. It is found as early as the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. There, God is making preparation for judgment. The day of visitation of the city is at hand. But first the Lord calls unto the man clothed with linen, who had the rider's ink horn by his side, and said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Only after that does he give command to those who are charged with the judgment to begin, adding, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. From Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 and 6. In the fifteenth of the Psalms of Solomon, the last eschatological writing before the movement initiated by the Baptist, it is expressly said in the description of the judgment that the saints of God bear a sign upon them which saves them. In the Pauline theology, very striking prominence is given to the thought of being sealed unto salvation. The apostle is conscious of bearing about with him in his body the marks of Jesus, from Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, the dying of Jesus, from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. This sign is received in baptism, since it is a baptism into the death of Christ. 
in this act the recipient is in a certain sense really buried with him and thenceforth walks among men as one who belongs even here below to risen humanity from romans chapter six verse one and following baptism is the seal the earnest of the spirit the pledge of that which is to come from second corinthians chapter one verse twenty two ephesians chapter one verses thirteen and fourteen and ephesians chapter four verse thirty this conception of baptism as a salvation in view of that which was to come goes down through the whole of ancient theology its preaching might really be summed up in the words keep your baptism holy and without blemish in the shepherd of hermas even the spirits of the men of the past must receive the seal which is the water in order that they may bear the name of god upon them that is why the tower is built over the water and the stones which are brought up out of the deep are rolled through the water in the apocalypse of john the thought of sealing stands prominently in the foreground the locusts receive power to hurt those only who have not the seal of god on their foreheads from revelation chapter nine verses four and five the beast in revelation chapter thirteen verse sixteen and following compels men to bear his mark only those who will not accept it are to reign with christ from revelation chapter twenty verse four the chosen hundred and forty four thousand bear the name of god and the name of the lamb upon their foreheads from revelation chapter fourteen verse one assurance of salvation in a time of eschatological expectation demanded some kind of security for the future of which the earnest could be possessed in the present and with this the predestinarian thought of election was in complete accord if we find the thought of being sealed unto salvation previously in the psalms of solomon and subsequently in the same signification in paul in the apocalypse of john and down to the shepherd of hermas it may be assumed in advance that it will be found in some form or other in the so strongly eschatological teaching of jesus and the baptist it may be said indeed to dominate completely the eschatological preaching of the baptist for this preaching does not confine itself to the declaration of the nearness of the kingdom and the demand for repentance but leads up to an act to which it gives a special reference in relation to the forgiveness of sins and the outpouring of the spirit it is a mistake to regard baptism with water as a symbolic act in the modern sense and make the baptist decry his own wares by saying i baptize only with water but the other can baptize with the holy spirit he is not contrasting the two baptisms but connecting them he who is baptized by him has the certainty that he will share in the outpouring of the spirit which shall precede the judgment and at the judgment shall receive forgiveness of sins as one who is signed with the mark of repentance the object of being baptized by him is to secure baptism with the spirit later the forgiveness of sins associated with baptism is proleptic it is to be realized at the judgment the baptist himself did not forgive sin footnote that the baptism of john was essentially an act which gave a claim to something future may be seen from the fact that jesus speaks of his sufferings and death as a special baptism and that the sons of zebedee whether they are willing for the sake of gaining the thrones on his right hand and his left to undergo this baptism if the baptism of john had had no real sacramental significance it would be unintelligible that jesus should use this metaphor End footnote. if he had done so how could such offence have been taken when jesus claimed for himself the right to forgive sins in the present from mark chapter two verse ten the baptism of john was therefore an eschatological sacrament pointing forward to the pouring forth of the spirit and to the judgment a provision for salvation hence the wrath of the baptist when he saw pharisees and sadducees crowding to his baptism ye generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth now fruits meet for repentance from matthew chapter three verses seven and eight by the reception of baptism that is they are saved from the judgment 
as a cleansing unto salvation it is a divine institution a revealed means of grace that is why the question of jesus whether the baptism of john was from heaven or from men placed the scribes at jerusalem in so awkward a dilemma from mark chapter 11 verse 30 the authority of jesus however goes farther than that of the baptist as the messiah who is to come he can give even here below to those who gather about him a right to partake in the messianic feast by this distribution of food to them only they do not know what is happening to them and he cannot solve the riddle for them the supper at the lake of gennesaret was a veiled eschatological sacrament neither the disciples nor the multitude understood what was happening since they did not know who he was who thus made them his guests footnote the thought of the messianic feast is found in isaiah chapter fifty five verse one and following and chapter sixty five verse twelve and following it is very strongly marked in isaiah chapter twenty five verses six through eight a passage which perhaps dates from the time of alexander the great Quote, and yahweh of hosts will prepare upon this mountain for all peoples a feast of fat things a feast of wine on the lees of fat things prepared with marrow of wine on the lees well refined he shall destroy in this mountain among all peoples the veil which has veiled all people and the covering which has covered all nations he shall destroy death for ever and the lord yahweh shall wipe away the tears from off all faces and the reproach of his people shall disappear from the earth Close quote. in enoch chapter twenty four and chapter twenty five the conception of the messianic feast is connected with that of the tree of life which shall offer its fruits to the elect upon the mountain of the king similarly in the testament of levi chapter twenty eight verse eleven the decisive passage is in enoch chapter sixty two verse fourteen after the parousia of the son of man and after the judgment the elect who have been saved quote, shall eat with the son of man shall sit down and rise up with him to all eternity Close quote. jesus's references to the messianic feast are therefore not merely images but point to a reality in matthew chapter eight verses eleven and twelve he prophesies that many shall come from the east and from the west to sit at meat with abraham isaac and jacob in matthew chapter twenty two verses one through fourteen the messianic feast is pictured as a royal marriage in matthew chapter twenty five verses one through thirteen as a marriage feast the apocalypse is dominated by the thought of the feast in all its forms in revelation chapter two verse seven it appears in connection with the thought of the tree of life in chapter two verse seventeen it is pictured as a feeding with manna in chapter three verse twenty one it is the feast which the lord will celebrate with his followers in chapter seven verses sixteen and seventeen there is an allusion to the lamb who shall feed his own so that they shall no more hunger or thirst chapter nineteen describes the marriage feast of the lamb the messianic feast therefore played a dominant part in the conception of blessedness from enoch to the apocalypse of john from this we can estimate what sacramental significance a guarantee of taking part in that feast must have had the meaning of celebration was obvious in itself and was made manifest in the conduct of it the sacramental effect was wholly independent of the apprehension and comprehension of the recipient therefore in this also the meal at the lakeside was a true sacrament End footnote. this meal must have been transformed by tradition into a miracle a result which may have been in part due to the references to the wonders of the messianic feast which were doubtless contained in the prayers not to speak of the eschatological enthusiasm which then prevailed universally did not the disciples believe that on the same evening when they had been commanded to take jesus into their ship at the mouth of the jordan to which point he had walked along the shore did they not believe that they saw him come walking towards them upon the waves of the sea the impulse to the introduction of the miraculous into the narrative came from the unintelligible element with which the men who surrounded jesus 
were at this time confronted. Footnote. Weisse rightly remarks that the task of the historian in dealing with Mark must consist in explaining how such myths could be accepted by a chronicler who stood so relatively near the events as our Mark does. End footnote. End of chapter 19, part 5. Chapter 19, Part 6 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 6 Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. The Last Supper at Jerusalem had the same sacramental significance as that at the lake. Towards the end of the meal, Jesus, after giving thanks, distributes the bread and wine. This had as little to do with the satisfaction of hunger as the distribution to the Galilean believers. The act of Jesus is an end in itself, and the significance of the celebration consists in the fact that it is he himself who makes the distribution. In Jerusalem, however, they understood what was meant, and he explained it to them explicitly by telling them that he would drink no more of the fruit of the vine until he drank it new in the kingdom of God. The mysterious images which he used at the time of the distribution concerning the atoning significance of his death do not touch the essence of the celebration. They are only discourses accompanying it. On this interpretation, therefore, we may think of baptism and the Lord's Supper as from the first eschatological sacraments in the eschatological movement which later detached itself from Judaism under the name of Christianity. That explains why we find them both in Paul and in the earliest theology as sacramental acts, not as symbolic ceremonies, and find them dominating the whole Christian doctrine. Apart from the assumption of the eschatological sacraments, we can only make the history of dogma begin with a fall from the earlier pure theology into the sacramental magical, without being able to adduce a single syllable in support of the idea that after the death of Jesus, baptism and the Lord's Supper existed even for an hour as symbolical actions. Paul, indeed, makes this supposition wholly impossible. In any case, the adoption of the baptism of John in Christian practice cannot be explained except on the assumption that it was the sacrament of the eschatological community, a revealed means of securing salvation, which was not altered in the slightest by the messiahship of Jesus. How else could we explain the fact that baptism, without any commandment of Jesus, and without Jesus' ever having been baptized, was taken over, as a matter of course, into Christianity, and was given a special reference to the receiving of the Spirit. It is no use proposing to explain it as having been instituted as a symbolical repetition of the baptism of Jesus, thought of as an anointing to the Messiahship. There is not a single passage in ancient theology to support such a theory, and we may point also to the fact that Paul never refers to the baptism of Jesus in explaining the character of Christian baptism, never, in fact, makes any distinct reference to it. And how could baptism, if it had been a symbolical repetition of the baptism of Jesus, have ever acquired this magic sacramental sense of salvation? Nothing shows more clearly than the dual character of ancient baptism, which makes it the guarantee both of the reception of the Spirit and of deliverance from the judgment, that it is nothing else than the eschatological baptism of John with a single difference. Baptism with water and baptism with the Spirit are now connected not only logically, but also in point of time, seeing that since the day of Pentecost the period of the outpouring of the Spirit is present. The two portions of the eschatological sacrament, which in the Baptist's preaching were distinguished in point of time, because he did not expect the outpouring of the Spirit until some future period, are now brought together, since one eschatological condition, the baptism of the Spirit, is now present. The Christianizing of baptism 
consisted in this and in nothing else, though Paul carried it a stage farther when he formed the conception of baptism as a mystic partaking in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thus, the thoroughgoing eschatological interpretation of the life of Jesus puts into the hands of those who are reconstructing the history of dogma in the earliest times an explanation of the conception of the sacraments, of which they had been able hitherto only to note the presence of an X, of which the origin was undiscoverable, and for which they possessed no equation by which it could be evaluated. If Christianity, as the religion of historically revealed mysteries, was able to lay hold upon Hellenism and overcome it, the reason of this was that it was already in its purely eschatological beginnings a religion of sacraments, a religion of eschatological sacraments, since Jesus had recognized a divine institution in the baptism of John, and had himself performed a sacramental action in the distribution of food at the lake of Gennesareth, and at the Last Supper. This being so, the feeding of the multitude also belongs to the dogmatic element in the history. But no one had previously recognized it as what it really was, an indirect disclosure of the messianic secret, just as no one had understood the full significance of Jesus' description of the Baptist as Elias. But how does Peter, at Caesarea Philippi, know the secret of his master? What he there declares is not a conviction which had gradually dawned on him and slowly grown through various stages of probability and certainty. The real character of this incident has been interpreted with remarkable penetration by Vreda. The incident itself, he says, is to be understood in quite as supernatural a fashion in Mark as in Matthew. But on the other hand, one does not receive the impression that the writer intends to represent the confession as a merit or a discovery of Peter. Quote, For according to the text of Mark, Jesus shows no trace of joy or surprise at this confession. His only answer consists of the command to say nothing about his messiahship. Close quote. Keim, whom Vreda quotes, had received a similar impression from the Markan account, and had supposed that Jesus had actually found the confession of Peter inopportune. How is all this to be explained, the supernatural knowledge of Peter and the rather curt fashion in which Jesus receives his declaration? It might be worth while to put the story of the transfiguration side by side with the incident at Caesarea Philippi, since there the divine sonship of Jesus is a second time revealed to the three Peter, James, and John, and the revelation is made supernaturally by a voice from heaven. It is rather striking that Mark does not seem to be conscious that he is reporting something which the disciples knew already. At the beginning of the actual transfiguration, Peter still addresses Jesus simply as Rabbi, from Mark chapter 9 verse 5. And what does it mean when Jesus, during the descent from the mountain, forbids them to speak to any man concerning that which they have seen until the resurrection of the Son of Man. That would exclude even the other disciples who knew only the secret of his messiahship. But why should they not be told of the divine confirmation of that which Peter had declared at Caesarea Philippi and Jesus had admitted? What has the transfiguration to do with the resurrection of the dead? And why are the thoughts of the disciples suddenly busied, not with what they have seen, not with the fact that the Son of Man shall rise from the dead, but simply with the possibility of the rising from the dead, the difficulty being that Elias was not yet present. Those who see in the transfiguration a projection backwards of the Pauline theology into the gospel history do not realize what are the principal points and difficulties of the narrative. The problem lies in the conversation during the descent, Against the messiahship of Jesus, against his rising from the dead, they have only one objection to suggest. Elias had not yet come. We see here, in the first place, the importance of the revelation which Jesus had made to the people in declaring to them the secret that the Baptist is Elias. From the standpoint of the eschatological expectation, no one could recognize Elias in the Baptist, unless he knew of the messiahship of Jesus and no one could believe in the messiahship and resurrection of Jesus, that is, in his parousia, 
without presupposing that Elias had in some way or other already come. This was therefore the primary difficulty of the disciples, the stumbling block which Jesus must remove for them by making the same revelation concerning the Baptist to them as to the people. It is also once more abundantly clear that expectation was directed at that time primarily to the coming of Elias. Footnote. It is to be noticed that the cry of Jesus from the cross, Eli, Eli, was immediately interpreted by the bystanders as referring to Elias. End footnote. But since the whole eschatological movement arose out of the Baptist's preaching, the natural conclusion is that by him who was to come after and baptize with the Holy Spirit, John meant not the Messiah, but Elias. But if the non-appearance of Elias was the primary difficulty of the disciples in connection with the messiahship of Jesus and all that it implied, why does it only strike the three, and moreover all three of them together, now and not at Caesarea Philippi? Footnote. From this difficulty we can see, too, how impossible it was for any of them to have arrived gradually at the knowledge of the messiahship of Jesus. End footnote. How could Peter there have declared it, and here be still laboring with the rest over the difficulty which stood in the way of his own declaration? To make the narrative coherent, the transfiguration, as being a revelation of the messiahship, ought to precede the incident at Caesarea Philippi. Now let us look at the connection in which it actually occurs. It falls in that inexplicable section from Mark chapter 8 verse 34, through chapter 9, verse 30, in which the multitude suddenly appears in the company of Jesus, who is sojourning in a Gentile district, only to disappear again, equally enigmatically afterwards, when he sets out for Galilee, instead of accompanying him back to their own country. In this section, everything points to the situation during the days at Bethsaida after the return of the disciples from their mission. Jesus is surrounded by the people, while what he desires is to be alone with his immediate followers. The disciples make use of the healing powers which he had bestowed upon them when sending them forth, and have the experience of finding that they are not in all cases adequate. From Mark chapter 9, verses 14-29. through 29. The mountain, to which he takes the three, is not a mountain in the north, or, as some have suggested, an imaginary mountain of the evangelist, but the same to which Jesus went up to pray and to be alone on the evening of the feeding of the multitude, from Mark chapter 6, verse 46, and chapter 9, verse 2. The house to which he goes after his return from the transfiguration is therefore to be placed at Bethsaida. Another thing which points to a sojourn at Bethsaida after the feeding of the multitude is the story of the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. The circumstances, therefore, which we have to presuppose, are that Jesus is surrounded and thronged by the people at Bethsaida. In order to be alone, he once more puts the Jordan between himself and the multitude, and goes with the three to the mountain where he had prayed after the feeding of the five thousand. This is the only way in which we can understand how the people failed to follow him, and he was able, really, to carry out his plan. But how could this story be torn out of its natural context and its scene removed to Caesarea Philippi, where it is both on external and internal grounds impossible? What we need to notice is the Markan account of the events which followed the sending forth of the disciples. We have two stories of the feeding of the multitude with a crossing of the lake after each. From Mark chapter 6, verses 31-56, through 56, and Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 22. Two stories of Jesus going away towards the north with the same motive, that of being alone and unrecognized. The first time, after the controversy about the washing of hands, his course is directed towards Tyre, from Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. The second time, after the demand for a sign, he goes into the district of Caesarea Philippi, from Mark chapter 8, verse 27. The scene of the controversy about the washing of hands is some locality in the plain of Gennesareth, from Mark chapter 6, verse 53 and following. 
Dalman Utha is named as the place where the sign was demanded, from Mark chapter 8, verse 10 and following. The most natural conclusion is to identify the two cases of feeding the multitude and the two journeys northwards. In that case, we should have in the section, Mark chapter 6, verse 31, through chapter 9, verse 30, two sets of narratives worked into one another, both recounting how Jesus, after the disciples came back to him, went with them from Capernaum to the northern shore of the lake, was there surprised by the multitude, and, after the meal which he gave them, crossed the Jordan by boat to Bethsaida, stayed there for a while, and then returned again by ship to the country of Gennesareth, and was there again overtaken and surrounded by the people. Then, after some controversial encounters with the scribes, who, at the report of his miracles, had come down from Jerusalem, from Mark chapter 7 verse 1, left Galilee and went again northwards. The seams at the joining of the narratives can be recognized in Mark chapter 7 verse 31, where Jesus is suddenly transferred from the north to Decapolis, and in the sayings in Mark chapter 8 verse 14 and following, which makes explicit reference to the two miracles of feeding the multitude. Whether the evangelist himself worked these two sets of narratives together, or whether he found them already united, cannot be determined, and is not of any direct historical interest. The disorder is, in any case, so complete that we cannot fully reconstruct each of the separate sets of narratives. The external reasons why the narratives of Mark chapter 8 verse 34 through chapter 9 verse 30, of which the scene is on the northern shore of the lake, are placed in this way after the incident of Caesarea Philippi, are not difficult to grasp. The section contains an impressive discourse to the people on following Jesus in his sufferings, crucifixion, and death from Mark chapter 8 verse 34 through chapter 9 verse 1. For this reason, the whole series of scenes is attached to the revelation of the secret of the suffering of the Son of Man, and the redactor did not stop to think how the people could suddenly appear, and as suddenly disappear again. The statement too, he called the people with the disciples, from Mark chapter 8 verse 34, helped to mislead him into inserting the section at this point although this very remark points to the circumstances of the time just after the return of the disciples, when Jesus was sometimes alone with the disciples, and sometimes calls the eager multitude about him. The whole scene belongs, therefore, to the days which he spent at Bethsaida, and originally followed immediately upon the crossing of the lake, after the feeding of the multitude. It was after Jesus had been six days surrounded by the people, not six days after the revelation at Caesarea Philippi, that the transfiguration took place, in Mark chapter 9 verse 2. On this assumption, all the difficulties of the incident at Caesarea Philippi are cleared up in a moment. There is no longer anything strange in the fact that Peter declares to Jesus who he really is, while Jesus appears neither surprised nor especially rejoiced at the insight of his disciple. The transfiguration had, in fact, been the revelation of the secret of the messiahship to the three who constituted the inner circle of the disciples. Footnote. It is typical of the constant agreement of the critical conclusions in thoroughgoing skepticism and thoroughgoing eschatology that Vreda also observes, quote, The transfiguration and Peter's confession are closely connected in content. Close quote. He also clearly perceives the inconsistency in the fact that Peter, at Caesarea Philippi, gives evidence of possessing a knowledge which he and his fellow disciples do not show elsewhere, but the fact that it is Peter, not Jesus, who reveals the messianic secret, constitutes a very serious difficulty for Vreda's reading of the facts, since this assumes Jesus to have been the revealer of it. End footnote. And Jesus had not himself revealed it to them. What had happened was that in a state of rapture common to them all, in which they had seen the Master in a glorious transfiguration, they had seen him talking with Moses and Elias, and had heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. We must always make a fresh effort to realize to ourselves that Jesus and his immediate followers were, at that time, 
in an enthusiastic state of intense eschatological expectation. We must picture them among the people, who were filled with penitence for their sins, and with faith in the kingdom, hourly expecting the coming of the kingdom, and the revelation of Jesus as the Son of Man, seeing in the eager multitude itself a sign that their reckoning of the time was correct. Thus, the psychological conditions were present for a common ecstatic experience such as is described in the account of the transfiguration. In this ecstasy, the three heard the voice from heaven saying who he was. Therefore, the Matthean report, according to which Jesus praises Simon, because flesh and blood have not revealed it to him, but the Father who is in heaven, is not really at variance with the briefer Markan account, since it rightly indicates the source of Peter's knowledge. Nevertheless, Jesus was astonished, for Peter here disregarded the command given during the descent from the Mount of Transfiguration. He had betrayed to the twelve Jesus' consciousness of his messiahship. One receives the impression that Jesus did not put the question to the disciples in order to reveal himself to them as messiah, and that the impulsive speech of Peter, upon whose silence he had counted because of his command, and to whom he had not specially addressed the question, he was forced to take a different line of action in regard to the twelve from what he had intended. It is probable that he had never had the intention of revealing the secret of his messiahship to the disciples. Otherwise, he would not have kept it from them at the time of their mission, when he did not expect them to return before the parousia. Even at the transfiguration, the three do not learn it from his lips but in a state of ecstasy, an ecstasy which he shared with them. At Caesarea Philippi it is not he, but Peter, who reveals his messiahship. We may say, therefore, that Jesus did not voluntarily give up his messianic secret. It was wrung from him by the pressure of events. However that may be, from Caesarea Philippi onwards it was known to the other disciples through Peter. What Jesus himself revealed to them was the secret of his sufferings. Flyderer and Vreda were quite right in pointing to the clear and definite predictions of the suffering, death, and resurrection as the historically inexplicable element in our reports, since the necessity of Jesus' death, by which modern theology endeavors to make his resolve and his predictions intelligible, is not a necessity which arises out of the historical course of events. There was not present any natural ground for such a resolve on the part of Jesus. Had he returned to Galilee, he would immediately have had the multitudes flocking after him again. In order to make the historical possibility of the resolve to suffer and the prediction of the sufferings in some measure intelligible, modern theology has to ignore the prediction of the resurrection which is bound up with them, for this is dogmatic. That is, however, not permissible. We must, as Freda insists, take the words as they are, and must not even indulge in ingenious explanations of the three days. Therefore, the resolve to suffer and to die are dogmatic. Therefore, according to him, they are unhistorical, and only to be explained by a literary hypothesis. But the thoroughgoing eschatological school says they are dogmatic and therefore historical, because they find their explanation in eschatological conceptions. Vreda held that the messianic conception implied in the Markan narrative is not the Jewish messianic conception, just because of the thought of suffering and death which it involves. No stress must be laid on the fact that in 4th Ezra chapter 7 verse 29, the Christ dies and rises again, because his death takes place at the end of the messianic kingdom. Footnote. Quote, After these years shall my son, the Christ, die, together with all who have the breath of men. Then shall the age be changed into the primeval silence, seven days as at the first beginning, so that no man shall be left. After seven days shall the age, which now sleeps, awake, and perishability shall itself perish. End footnote. 
The Jewish Messiah is essentially a glorious being who shall appear in the last time. True, but the case in which the Messiah should be present prior to the parousia should cause the final tribulations to come upon the earth and should himself undergo them does not arise in the Jewish eschatology as described from without. It first arises with the self-consciousness of Jesus. Therefore, the Jewish conception of the Messiah has no information to give us upon this point. In order to understand Jesus' resolve to suffer, we must first recognize that the mystery of this suffering is involved in the mystery of the kingdom of God, since the kingdom of God cannot come until the pyrasmos has taken place. This certainty of suffering is quite independent of the historic circumstances, as the beatitude on the persecuted in the Sermon on the Mount and the predictions in the discourse at the sending forth of the Twelve clearly show. Jesus' prediction of his own sufferings at Caesarea Philippi is precisely as unintelligible, precisely as dogmatic, and therefore precisely as historical as their prediction to the disciples at the time of their mission. The must-be of the sufferings is the same, the coming of the kingdom and of the parousia, which are dependent upon the pyrasmos, having first taken place. In the first period, Jesus' thoughts concerning his own sufferings were included in the more general thought of the sufferings which formed part of the mystery of the kingdom of God. The exhortations to hold steadfastly to him in the time of trial, and not to lose faith in him, certainly tended to suggest that he thought of himself as the central point amid these conflicts and confusions, and reckoned on the possibility of his own death as much as on that of others. Upon this point, nothing more definite can be said, since the mystery of Jesus' own sufferings does not detach itself from the mystery of the sufferings connected with the kingdom of God until after the messianic secret is made known at Caesarea Philippi. What is certain is that, for him, suffering was always associated with the messianic secret, since he placed his parousia at the end of the pre-messianic tribulations in which he was to have his part. The suffering, death, and resurrection, of which the secret was revealed at Caesarea Philippi, are not, therefore, in themselves new or surprising. Footnote. Difficult problems are involved in the prediction of the resurrection in Mark chapter 14, verse 28. Jesus there promises his disciples that he will go before them into Galilee. That cannot mean that he will go alone into Galilee before them, and that they shall there meet with him, their risen master, what he contemplates is that he shall return with them, at their head, from Jerusalem to Galilee. Was it that the manifestation of the Son of Man and of the judgment should take place there? So much is clear. The saying, far from directing the disciples to go away to Galilee, chains them to Jerusalem, there to await him who should lead them home. It should not, therefore, be claimed as supporting the tradition of the Galilean appearances. We find it corrected by the saying of the young man at the grave, who says to the women, Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Here the idea of following in point of time is foisted upon the words, He goeth before you whereas in the original the word has a purely local sense, corresponding to the kai ein proagon autos o aisus in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. But the correction is itself meaningless, since the visions took place in Jerusalem. We have, therefore, in this passage, a more detailed indication of the way in which Jesus thought of the events subsequent to his resurrection. The interpretation of this unfulfilled saying is, however, wholly impossible for us. It was not less so for the earliest tradition, as is shown by the attempt to give it a meaning by the correction. End footnote. The novelty lies in the form in which they are conceived. The tribulation, so far as Jesus is concerned, is now connected with an historic event. He will go to Jerusalem, there to suffer at the hands of the authorities. For the future, however, he no longer speaks of the general tribulation which he is to bring upon the earth, nor of the sufferings which await his followers, 
nor of the sufferings in which they must rally round him. In the predictions of the Passion, there is no word of that. At Jerusalem, there is no word of that. This thought disappears once for all. In the secret of his Passion, which Jesus reveals to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi, the pre-Messianic tribulation is for others set aside, abolished, concentrated upon himself alone, and that in the form that they are fulfilled in his own passion and death at Jerusalem. That was the new conviction that had dawned upon him. He must suffer for others that the kingdom might come. End of chapter 19, part 6「Chapter 19, Part 7 of the Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer, translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 19, Part 7, Thoroughgoing Skepticism and Thoroughgoing Eschatology. This change was due to the non-fulfillment of the promises made in the discourse at the sending forth of the Twelve. He had thought then that to let loose the final tribulation and so compel the coming of the kingdom. And the cataclysm had not occurred. He had expected it also after the return of the disciples. In Bethsaida, in speaking to the multitude which he had consecrated by the foretaste of the messianic feast, as also to the disciples at the time of their mission, he had turned their thoughts to things to come, and had adjured them to be prepared to suffer with him, to give up their lives, not to be ashamed of him in his humiliation, since otherwise the Son of Man would be ashamed of them when he came in glory. From Mark chapter 8, verse 34, through chapter 9, verse 1. Footnote. Here it is evident also, from the form taken by the prophecy of the sufferings, that the section Mark chapter 8 verse 34 and following cannot possibly come after the revelation at Caesarea Philippi, since in it, it is the thought of the general sufferings which is implied. For the same reason, the predictions of suffering and tribulation in the synoptic apocalypse in Mark chapter 13 cannot be derived from Jesus. End footnote. In leaving Galilee, he abandoned the hope that the final tribulation would begin of itself. If it delays, that means that there is still something to be done, and yet another of the violent must lay violent hands upon the kingdom of God. The movement of repentance had not been sufficient. When, in accordance with his commission, by sending forth the disciples with their message, he hurled the firebrand which should kindle the fiery trials of the last time, the flame went out. He had not succeeded in sending the sword on earth and stirring up the conflict. And until the time of trial had come, the coming of the kingdom and his own manifestation as son of man were impossible. That meant not that the kingdom was not near at hand, but that God had appointed otherwise in regard to the time of trial. He had heard the Lord's prayer in which Jesus and his followers prayed for the coming of the kingdom and at the same time for deliverance from the pyrasmos. The time of trial was not come. Therefore, God in his mercy and omnipotence had eliminated it from the series of eschatological events, and appointed to him, whose commission had been to bring it about, instead to accomplish it in his own person. As he who was to rule over the members of the kingdom in the future age, he was appointed to serve them in the present, to give his life for them, the many, from Mark chapter 10 verse 45 and chapter 14 verse 24, and to make in his own blood the atonement which they would have had to render in the tribulation. The kingdom could not come until the debt which weighed upon the world was discharged. Until then, not only the now living believers, but the chosen of all generations since the beginning of the world wait for their manifestation in glory. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the countless unknown who should come from the east and from the west to sit at tables with them at the messianic feast. From Matthew chapter 8 verse 11. The enigmatic poloi, for whom Jesus dies, are those predestined to the kingdom. 
since his death must at least compel the coming of the kingdom. Footnote. Weisse and Bruno Bauer had long ago pointed out how curious it was that Jesus, in the sayings about his sufferings, spoke of many instead of speaking of his own or the believers. Weisse found in the words the thought that Jesus died for the nation as a whole, Bruno Bauer that the for many, in the words of Jesus, was delivered from the view of the later theology of the Christian community. This explanation is certainly wrong, for so soon as the words of Jesus come into any kind of contact with early theology, the many disappear to give place to the believers. In the Pauline words of institution, the form is, My body for you, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Johannes Weiss follows in the footsteps of Weisse when he interprets the many as the nation. He gives, however, quite a false turn to this interpretation by arguing that the many cannot include the disciples, since they, quote, who in faith and penitence have received the tidings of the kingdom of God no longer need a special means of deliverance such as this, Close quote. They are the chosen, to them the kingdom is assured. But a ransom, a special means of salvation, is needful for the mass of the people, who in their blindness have incurred the guilt of rejecting the Messiah. For this grave sin, which is nevertheless to some extent excused as due to ignorance, there is a unique atoning sacrifice, the death of the Messiah. This theory is based on a distinction of which there is no hint in the teaching of Jesus, and it takes no account of the predestinarianism which is an integral part of eschatology, and which, in fact, dominated the thoughts of Jesus. The Lord is conscious that he dies only for the elect. For others, his death can avail nothing, not even their own repentance. Moreover, he does not die in order that this one or that one may come into the kingdom of God. He provides the atonement in order that the kingdom itself may come. Until the kingdom comes, even the elect cannot possess it. End footnote. This thought Jesus found in the prophecies of Isaiah, which spoke of the suffering servant of the Lord. The mysterious description of him who, in his humiliation, was despised and misunderstood, who, nevertheless, bears the guilt of others and afterwards is made manifest in what he has done for them, points, he feels, to himself. And since he found it there set down that he must suffer unrecognized, and that those for whom he suffered should doubt him, his suffering should, nay, must, remain a mystery. In that case, those who doubted him would not bring condemnation upon themselves. He no longer needs to abjure them for their own sakes, to be faithful to him, and to stand by him even amid reproach and humiliation. He can calmly predict to his disciples that they shall all be offended in him and shall flee. From Mark chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. He can tell Peter, who boasts that he will die with him, that before the dawn he shall deny him thrice. From Mark chapter 14, verses 29 through 31. All that is so set down in the scripture. They must doubt him. But now they shall not lose their blessedness, for he bears all sins and transgressions. That too is buried in the atonement which he offers. Therefore, also, there is no need for them to understand his secret. He speaks of it to them without any explanation. It is sufficient that they should know why he goes up to Jerusalem. They, on their part, are thinking only of the coming transformation of all things, as their conversation shows. The prospect which he has opened up to them is clear enough. The only thing that they do not understand is why he must first die at Jerusalem. The first time that Peter ventured to speak to him about it, he had turned on him with cruel harshness, had almost cursed him. From Mark chapter 8, verses 32 and 33. From that time forward, they no longer cared to ask him anything about it. The new thought of his own passion 
has its basis therefore in the authority with which jesus was armed to bring about the beginning of the final tribulation ethically regarded his taking the suffering upon himself is an act of mercy and compassion towards those who would otherwise have had to bear these tribulations and perhaps would not have stood the test historically regarded the thought of his sufferings involves the same lofty treatment both of history and eschatology as was manifested in the identification of the baptist with elias for now he identifies his condemnation and execution which are to take place on natural lines with the predicted pre-messianic tribulations this imperious forcing of eschatology into history is also its destruction its assertion and abandonment at the same time towards passover therefore jesus sets out for jerusalem solely in order to die there footnote one might use it as a principle of division by which to classify the lives of jesus whether they make him go to jerusalem to work or to die here as in so many other places vice's clearness of perception is surprising jesus's journey was according to him a pilgrimage to death not to the passover End footnote. says vreda quote, it is beyond question the opinion of mark that jesus went to jerusalem because he had decided to die it is obvious even from the details of the story Close quote. It is therefore a mistake to speak of Jesus as teaching in Jerusalem. He has no intention of doing so. As a prophet, he foretells in veiled parabolic form the offense which must come, from Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12, exhorts men to watch for the parousia, pictures the nature of the judgment which the Son of Man shall hold, and, for the rest, thinks only how he can so provoke the Pharisees and the rulers that they will be compelled to get rid of him. That is why he violently cleanses the temple and attacks the Pharisees in the presence of the people with passionate invective. From the revelation at Caesarea Philippi onward, all that belongs to the history of Jesus, in the strict sense, are the events which lead up to his death, or, to put it more accurately, the events in which he himself is the sole actor. The other things which happen, the questions which are laid before him for decision, the episodic incidents which occur in those days, have nothing to do with the real life of Jesus, since they contribute nothing to the decisive issue, but merely form the anecdotic fringes of the real outward and inward event, the deliberate bringing down of death upon himself. It is in truth surprising that he succeeded in transforming into history this resolve which had its roots in dogma, and really dying alone. Is it not almost unintelligible that his disciples were not involved in his fate? Not even the disciple who smote with a sword was arrested along with him. From Mark chapter 14 verse 47. Peter, recognized in the court of the high priest's house as one who had been with Jesus the Nazarene, is allowed to go free for a moment indeed jesus believes that the three are destined to share his fate not from any outward necessity but because they had professed themselves able to suffer the last extremities with him the sons of zebedee when he asked them whether in order to sit at his right hand and his left they are prepared to drink his cup and be baptized with his baptism had declared that they were and thereupon he had predicted that they should do so. From Mark chapter 10, verse 38 and 39. Peter, again, had that very night, in spite of the warning of Jesus, sworn that he would go even unto death with him. From Mark chapter 14, verse 30 and 31. Hence, he is conscious of a higher possibility that these three are to go through the trial with him. He takes them with him to Gethsemane, and bids them remain near him and watch with him and since they do not perceive the danger of the hour he adjures them to watch and pray they are to pray that they may not have to pass through the trial since though the spirit is willing the flesh is weak amid his own sore distress 
he is anxious about them and their capacity to share his trial as they declared their willingness to do so. Footnote. That ye enter not into temptation is the content of the prayer that they are to offer while watching with him. End footnote. Here also it is once more made clear that for Jesus the necessity of his death is grounded in dogma, not in external historical facts. Above the dogmatic eschatological necessity, however, there stands the omnipotence of God, which is bound by no limitations. As Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, had taught his followers to pray for deliverance from the pyrasmos, and, as in his fears for the three, he bids them pray for the same thing, so now he himself prays for deliverance, even in this last moment, when he knows that the armed band which is coming to arrest him is already on the way. Literal history does not exist for him, only the will of God, and this is exalted even above eschatological necessity. But how did this exact agreement between the fate of Jesus and his predictions come about? Why did the authorities strike at him only, not at his whole following, not even at the disciples? He was arrested and condemned on account of his messianic claims. But how did the high priest know that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah? And why does he put the accusation as a direct question without calling witnesses in support of it? Why was the attempt first made to bring up a saying about the temple which could be interpreted as blasphemy in order to condemn him on this ground? From Mark chapter 14, verses 57 through 59. Before that again, as is evident from Mark's account, they had brought up a whole crowd of witnesses in the hope of securing evidence sufficient to justify his condemnation, and the attempt had not succeeded. It was only after all these attempts had failed that the high priest brought his accusation concerning the messianic claim, and he did so without citing the three necessary witnesses. Why so? Because he had not got them. The condemnation of Jesus depended on his own admission. That was why they had endeavored to convict him upon other charges. Footnote. As long ago as 1880, H. W. Blebby had emphasized this circumstance as significant. The injustice in the trial of Jesus consisted, according to him, in the fact that he was condemned on his own admission without any witnesses being called. Dahlmann, it is true, will not admit that this technical error was very serious. But the really important point is not whether the condemnation was legal or not. It is the significant fact that the high priest called no witnesses. Why did he not call any? This question was obscured for Blebby and Dahlman by other problems. End footnote. This wholly unintelligible feature of the trial confirms what is evident also from the discourses and attitude of Jesus at Jerusalem, viz. that he had not been held by the multitude to be the Messiah, that the idea of his making such claims had not for a moment occurred to them, lay in the fact for them quite beyond the range of possibility. Therefore, he cannot have made a messianic entry. According to Habe, Brandt, Wellhausen, Dahlmann, and Vreda, the ovation at the entry had no messianic character whatever. It is wholly mistaken, as Vreda quite rightly remarks, to represent matters as if the messianic ovation were forced upon Jesus, that he accepted it with inner repugnance and in silent passivity. For that would involve the supposition that the people had for a moment regarded him as Messiah, and then afterwards had shown themselves as completely without any suspicion of his messiahship, as though they had in the interval drunk of the waters of Lethe. The exact opposite is true. Jesus himself made the preparations for the messianic entry. Its messianic features were due to his arrangements. He made a point of riding upon the ass, not because he was weary, but because he desired that the messianic prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 should be secretly fulfilled. The entry is therefore a messianic act on the part of Jesus, an action in which his consciousness of his office breaks through, as it did at the sending forth of the disciples, 
in the explanation that the Baptist was Elias, and in the feeding of the multitude. But others can have had no suspicion of his messianic significance, of that which was going on before their eyes. The entry into Jerusalem was therefore messianic for Jesus, but not messianic for the people. But what was he for the people? Here, Vreda's theory that he was a teacher again refutes itself. In the triumphal entry, there is more than the ovation offered to the teacher. The jubilations have reference to him who is to come. It is to him that the acclamations are offered, and because of him that the people rejoice in the nearness of the kingdom, as in Mark the cries of jubilation show. For here, as Dalman rightly remarks, there is actually no mention of the Messiah. Jesus, therefore, made his entry into Jerusalem as the prophet, as Elias. That is confirmed by Matthew, chapter 21, verse 11, although Matthew gives a messianic coloring to the entry itself by bringing in the acclamation in which he was designated the son of David, just as, conversely, he reports the Baptist's question rightly and introduces it wrongly by making the Baptist hear of the works of the Christ. Was Mark conscious, one wonders, that it was not a messianic entry that he was reporting? We do not know. It is not inherently impossible that, as Vreda asserts, quote, he had no real view concerning the historical life of Jesus, close quote, did not know whether Jesus was recognized as Messiah, and took no interest in the question from an historical point of view. Fortunately for us, for that is why he simply hands on tradition and does not write a life of Jesus. The Markan hypothesis went astray in conceiving this gospel as a life of Jesus written with either complete or partial historical consciousness, and interpreting it on these lines, on the sole ground that it only brings in the name Son of Man twice prior to the incident at Caesarea Philippi. The life of Jesus cannot be arrived at by following the arrangement of a single gospel, but only on the basis of the tradition which is preserved more or less faithfully in the earliest pair of synoptic gospels. Questions of literary priority, indeed literary questions in general, have, in the last resort, as Kime remarked long ago, nothing to do with the gaining of a clear idea of the course of events since the evangelists had not themselves a clear idea of it before their minds. It can only be arrived at hypothetically by an experimental reconstruction based on the necessary inner connection of the incidents. But who could possibly have had, in early times, a clear conception of the life of Jesus? Even its most critical moments were totally unintelligible to the disciples who had themselves shared in the experiences and who were the only sources for the tradition. They were simply swept through the events by the momentum of the purpose of Jesus. That is why the tradition is incoherent. The reality had been incoherent, too, since it was only the secret messianic self-consciousness of Jesus which created alike the events and their connection. Every life of Jesus remains, therefore, a reconstruction on the basis of a more or less accurate insight into the nature of the dynamic self-consciousness of Jesus which created the history. The people, whatever Mark may have thought, did not offer Jesus a messianic ovation at all. It was he who, in the conviction that they were wholly unable to recognize it, played with his messianic self-consciousness before their eyes, just as he did at the time after the sending forth of the disciples, when, as now, he thought the end at hand. It was in the same way, too, that he closed the invective against the Pharisees with the words, I say unto you, ye shall see me no more until ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. From Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. This saying implies his parousia. Similarly, he is playing with his secret in that crucial question regarding the messiahship in Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 37. There is no question of disassociating the Davidic sonship from the messiahship. Footnote. That would have been to utter a heresy which would alone have sufficed to secure his condemnation. It would certainly have been brought up as a charge against him. End footnote. 
He asks only, how can the Christ, in virtue of his descent from David, be, as his son, inferior to David, and yet be addressed by David in the psalm as his Lord? The answer is, by reason of the metamorphosis and parousia in which natural relationships are abolished, and the scion of David's line, who is the predestined son of man, shall take possession of his unique glory. Far from rejecting the Davidic sonship in this saying, Jesus, on the contrary, presupposes his possession of it. That raises the question whether he did not really, during his lifetime, regard himself as a descendant of David, and whether he was not regarded as such. Paul, who otherwise shows no interest in the earthly phase of the existence of the Lord, certainly implies his descent from David. The blind man at Jericho, too, cries out to the Nazarene prophet as son of David, in Mark chapter 10, verse 47. But in doing so, he does not mean to address Jesus as Messiah, for afterwards, when he is brought to him, he simply calls him Rabbi, in Mark chapter 10, verse 51. And the people thought nothing further about what he had said. When the expectant people bid him keep silence, they do not do so because the expression, son of David, offends them, but because his clamor annoys them. Jesus, however, was struck by this cry, stood still and caused him, as he was standing timidly behind the eager multitude, to be brought to him. It is possible, of course, that this address is a mere mistake in the tradition, the same tradition which unsuspectingly brought the expression, son of man, at the wrong place. So much, however, is certain. The people were not made aware of the messiahship of Jesus by the cry of the blind man any more than by the outcries of the demoniacs. The entry into Jerusalem was not a messianic ovation. All that history is concerned with is that this fact should not be admitted on all hands. Except Jesus and the disciples, therefore, no one knew the secret of his messiahship even in those days at Jerusalem. But the high priest suddenly showed himself in possession of it. How? Through the betrayal of Judas. For a hundred and fifty years, the question has been historically discussed why Judas betrayed his master. That the main question for history was, what he betrayed, was suspected by few, and they touched on it only in a timid kind of way. Indeed, the problems of the trial of Jesus may be said to have been non-existent for criticism. The traitorous act of Judas cannot have consisted in informing the Sanhedrin where Jesus was to be found at a suitable place for an arrest. They could have had that information more cheaply by causing Jesus to be watched by spies. But Mark expressly says that Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, did not yet know of a favorable opportunity for the arrest, but was seeking such an opportunity. Mark chapter 14 verses 10 and 11 and Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. In the betrayal, therefore, there were two points, a more general and a more special. The general fact by which he gave Jesus into their power, and the undertaking to let them know of the next opportunity when they could arrest him quietly without publicity. The betrayal by which he brought his master to death, in consequence of which the rulers decided upon the arrest, knowing that their cause was safe in any case, was the betrayal of the messianic secret. Jesus died because two of his disciples had broken his command of silence. Peter, when he made known the secret of the messiahship to the twelve at Caesarea Philippi, Judas Iscariot by communicating it to the high priest. But the difficulty was that Judas was the sole witness. Therefore, the betrayal was useless so far as the actual trial was concerned, unless Jesus admitted the charge. So they first tried to secure his condemnation on other grounds, and only when these attempts broke down did the high priest put, in the form of a question, the charge in support of which he could have brought no witnesses. But Jesus immediately admitted it, and strengthened the admission by an allusion to his parousia in the near future as son of man. The betrayal and the trial can only be rightly understood when it is realized that the public knew nothing whatever of the secret of the messiahship. Footnote. 
When it is assumed that the messianic claims of Jesus were generally known during those last days at Jerusalem, there is a temptation to explain the absence of witnesses in regard to them by supposing that they were too much a matter of common knowledge to require evidence. But in that case, why should the high priest not have fulfilled the prescribed formalities? Why make such efforts first to establish a different charge? Thus, the obscure and unintelligible procedure at the trial of Jesus becomes, in the end, the clearest proof that the public knew nothing of the messiahship of Jesus. End footnote. It is the same in regard to the scene in the presence of Pilate. The people on that morning knew nothing of the trial of Jesus, but came to Pilate with the sole object of asking the release of a prisoner, as was the custom at the feast. From Mark chapter 15, verses 6 through 9. The idea then occurs to Pilate, who was just about to hand over, willingly enough, this troublesome fellow and prophet to the priestly faction, to play off the people against the priests and work on the multitude to petition for the release of Jesus. In this way, he would have secured himself on both sides. He would have condemned Jesus to please the priests, and after condemning him, would have released him to please the people. The priests are greatly embarrassed by the presence of the multitude. They had done everything so quickly and quietly that they might well have hoped to get Jesus crucified before anyone knew what was happening or had had time to wonder at his non-appearance in the temple. The priests, therefore, go among the people and induce them not to agree to the procurator's proposal. How? By telling them why he was condemned, by revealing to them the messianic secret. That makes him at once, from a prophet worthy of honor, into a deluded enthusiast and blasphemer. That was the explanation of the fickleness of the Jerusalem mob, which is always so eloquently described without any evidence for it except this single inexplicable case. At midday of the same day, it was the fourteenth Nisan, on the evening of which the paschal lamb was eaten, Jesus cried aloud and expired. He had chosen to remain fully conscious to the last. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Quest of the Historical Jesus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Quest of the Historical Jesus by Albert Schweitzer. Translated by William Montgomery. Chapter 20 Results. Those who are fond of talking about negative theology can find their account here. There is nothing more negative than the result of the critical study of the life of Jesus. The Jesus of Nazareth who came forward publicly as the Messiah, who preached the ethic of the kingdom of God, who founded the kingdom of heaven upon earth, and died to give his work its final consecration, never had any existence. He is a figure designed by rationalism, endowed with life by liberalism, and clothed by modern theology in an historical garb. This image has not been destroyed from without. It has fallen to pieces, cleft and disintegrated, by the concrete historical problems which came to the surface one after another, and in spite of all the artifice, art, artificiality, and violence which was applied to them, refused to be planed down to fit the design on which the Jesus of the theology of the last hundred and thirty years had been constructed, and were no sooner covered over than they appeared again in a new form. The thoroughgoing skeptical and the thoroughgoing eschatological school have only completed the work of destruction by linking the problems into a system, and so making an end of the divide et impura of modern theology, which undertook to solve each of them separately, that is, in a less difficult form. Henceforth, it is no longer permissible to take one problem out of the series and dispose of it by itself, since the weight of the whole hangs upon each. Whatever the ultimate solution may be, the historical Jesus, of whom the criticism of the future, taking as its starting point the problems which have been recognized and admitted, will draw the portrait, 
can never render modern theology the services which it claimed from its own half-historical, half-modern Jesus. He will be a Jesus, who was Messiah, and lived as such, either on the ground of a literary fiction of the earliest evangelist, or on the ground of a purely eschatological messianic conception. In either case, he will not be a Jesus Christ to whom the religion of the present can ascribe, according to its long-cherished custom, its own thoughts and ideas, as it did with the Jesus of its own making. Nor will he be a figure which can be made by a popular historical treatment so sympathetic and universally intelligible to the multitude. The historical Jesus will be, to our time, a stranger and an enigma. The study of the life of Jesus has had a curious history. It set out in quest of the historical Jesus, believing that when it had found him, it could bring him straight into our time as a teacher and savior. It loosed the bands by which he had been riveted for centuries to the stony rocks of ecclesiastical doctrine, and rejoiced to see life and movement coming into the figure once more, and the historical Jesus advancing, as it seemed, to meet it. But he does not stay. He passes by our time and returns to his own. What surprised and dismayed the theology of the last forty years was that, despite all forced and arbitrary interpretations, it could not keep him in our time, but had to let him go. He returned to his own time, not owing to the application of any historical ingenuity, but by the same inevitable necessity by which the liberated pendulum returns to its original position. The historical foundation of Christianity, as built up by rationalistic, by liberal, and by modern theology, no longer exists. But that does not mean that Christianity has lost its historical foundation. The work which historical theology thought itself bound to carry out, and which fell to pieces just as it was nearing completion, was only the brick facing of the real immovable historical foundation which is independent of any historical confirmation or justification. Jesus means something to our world because a mighty spiritual force streams forth from him and flows through our time also. This fact can neither be shaken nor confirmed by any historical discovery. It is the solid foundation of Christianity. The mistake was to suppose that Jesus could come to mean more to our time by entering into it as a man like ourselves. That is not possible. First, because such a Jesus never existed. Secondly, because, although historical knowledge can no doubt introduce greater clearness into an existing spiritual life, it cannot call spiritual life into existence. History can destroy the present. It can reconcile the present with the past, can even, to a certain extent, transport the present into the past. But to contribute to the making of the present is not given unto it. But it is impossible to overestimate the value of what German research upon the life of Jesus has accomplished. It is a uniquely great expression of sincerity, one of the most significant events in the whole mental and spiritual life of humanity. What has been done for the religious life of the present and the immediate future by scholars such as P. W. Schmidt, Bousset, Hulliker, Weinel, Wernle, and their pupil Franzen, and the others who have been called to the task of bringing to the knowledge of wider circles, in a form which is popular without being superficial, the results of religious historical study, only becomes evident when one examines the literature and social culture of the Latin nations, who have been scarcely, if at all, touched by the influence of these thinkers. And yet, the time of doubt was bound to come. We modern theologians are too proud of our historical method, too proud of our historical Jesus, too confident in our belief in the spiritual gains which our historical theology can bring to the world. The thought that we could build up by the increase of historical knowledge a new and vigorous Christianity and set free new spiritual forces rules us like a fixed idea and prevents us from seeing that the task which we have grappled with and in some measure discharged is only one of the intellectual preliminaries of the great religious task. We thought that it was for us 
to lead our time by a roundabout way through the historical Jesus, as we understood him, in order to bring it to the Jesus who is a spiritual power in the present. This roundabout way has now been closed by genuine history. There was a danger of our thrusting ourselves between men and the Gospels, and refusing to leave the individual man alone with the sayings of Jesus. There was a danger that we should offer them a Jesus who was too small, because we had forced him into conformity with our human standards and human psychology. To see that, one need only read the lives of Jesus written since the sixties, and notice what they have made of the great imperious sayings of the Lord, how they have weakened down his imperative, world-condemning demands upon individuals, that he might not come into conflict with our ethical ideals and might tune his denial of the world to our acceptance of it. Many of the greatest sayings are found lying in a corner like explosive shells from which the charges have been removed. No small portion of elemental religious power needed to be drawn off from his sayings to prevent them from conflicting with our system of religious world acceptance. We have made Jesus hold another language with our time from that which he really held. In the process, we ourselves have been enfeebled, and we robbed our own thoughts of their vigor in order to project them back into history and make them speak to us out of the past. It is nothing less than a misfortune for modern theology that it mixes history with everything and ends by being proud of the skill with which it finds its own thoughts, even to its beggarly pseudo-metaphysic with which it has banished genuine speculative metaphysic from the sphere of religion, in Jesus, and represents him as expressing them. It had almost deserved the reproach, He who putteth his hand to the plough and looketh back is not fit for the kingdom of God. It was no small matter, therefore, that in the course of the critical study of the life of Jesus, after a resistance lasting for two generations, during which first one expedient was tried and then another, theology was forced by genuine history to begin to doubt the artificial history with which it had thought to give new life to our Christianity, and to yield to the facts which, as Vreda strikingly said, are sometimes the most radical critics of all. History will force it to find a way to transcend history, and to fight for the lordship and rule of Jesus over this world, with weapons tempered in a different forge. We are experiencing what Paul experienced. In the very moment when we were coming nearer to the historical Jesus than men had ever come before, and were already stretching out our hands to draw him into our own time, we have been obliged to give up the attempt and acknowledge our failure in that paradoxical saying, If we have known Christ after the flesh, yet henceforth know we him no more. And further, we must be prepared to find that the historical knowledge of the personality and life of Jesus will not be a help, but perhaps even an offense to religion. But the truth is, it is not Jesus as historically known, but Jesus as spiritually arisen within men, who is significant for our time and can help it. Not the historical Jesus, but the spirit which goes forth from him, and in the spirits of men strives for new influence and rule, is that which overcomes the world. It is not given to history to disengage that which is abiding and eternal in the being of Jesus from the historical forms in which it worked itself out, and to introduce it into our world as a living influence. It has toiled in vain at this undertaking. As a water plant is beautiful so long as it is growing in water, but once torn from its roots, withers and becomes unrecognizable, so it is with the historical Jesus when he is wrenched loose from the soil of eschatology, and the attempt is made to conceive him historically as a being not subject to temporal conditions. The abiding and eternal in Jesus is absolutely independent of historical knowledge, and can only be understood by contact with his spirit which is still at work in the world. In proportion as we have the spirit of Jesus, we have the true knowledge of Jesus. Jesus, as a concrete historical personality, remains a stranger to our time, but his spirit, which lies hidden in his words, 
is known in simplicity, and its influence is direct. Every saying contains in its own way the whole Jesus. The very strangeness and unconditionedness in which he stands before us makes it easier for individuals to find their own personal standpoint in regard to him. Men feared that to admit the claims of eschatology would abolish the significance of his words for our time, and hence there was a feverish eagerness to discover in them any elements that might be considered not eschatologically conditioned. When any sayings are found, of which the wording did not absolutely imply an eschatological connection, there was great jubilation. These, at least, had been saved uninjured from the coming debacle. But in reality, that which is eternal in the words of Jesus is due to the very fact that they are based on an eschatological world view, and contain the expression of a mind for which the contemporary world, with its historical and social circumstances, no longer had any existence. They are appropriate, therefore, to any world, for in every world they raise the man who dares to meet their challenge, and does not turn and twist them into meaninglessness above his world and his time, making him inwardly free, so that he is fitted to be, in his own world and in his own time, a simple channel for the power of Jesus. Modern lives of Jesus are too general in their scope. They aim at influencing, by giving a complete impression of the life of Jesus, a whole community. But the historical Jesus, as he is depicted in the Gospels, influenced individuals by the individual word. They understood him so far as it was necessary for them to understand, without forming any conception of his life as a whole, since this in its ultimate aims remained a mystery even for the disciples. Because it is thus preoccupied with the general, the universal, modern theology is determined to find its world-accepting ethic in the teaching of Jesus. Therein lies its weakness. The world affirms itself automatically. The modern spirit cannot but affirm it. But why, on that account, abolish the conflict between modern life and the world-affirming spirit which inspires it as a whole, and the world-negating spirit of Jesus? Why spare the spirit of the individual man its appointed task of fighting its way through the world negation of Jesus, of contending with him at every step over the value of material and intellectual goods, a conflict in which it may never rest? For the general, for the institutions of society, the rule is affirmation of the world, in conscious opposition to the view of Jesus, on the ground that the world has affirmed itself. This general affirmation of the world, however, if it is to be Christian, must in the individual spirit be Christianized and transfigured by the personal rejection of the world, which is preached in the sayings of Jesus. It is only by means of the tension thus set up that religious energy can be communicated to our time. There was a danger that modern theology, for the sake of peace, would deny the world negation in the sayings of Jesus, with which Protestantism was out of sympathy, and thus unstring the bow and make Protestantism a mere sociological instead of a religious force. There was perhaps also a danger of inward insincerity, in the fact that it refused to admit to itself and others that it maintained its affirmation of the world in opposition to the sayings of Jesus, simply because it could not do otherwise. For that reason, it is a good thing that the true historical Jesus should overthrow the modern Jesus, should rise up against the modern spirit and send upon earth not peace but a sword. He was not a teacher, not a casuist. He was an imperious ruler. It was because he was so in his inmost being that he could think of himself as the son of man. That was only the temporally conditioned expression of the fact that he was an authoritative ruler. The names in which men expressed their recognition of him as such, Messiah, Son of Man, Son of God, have become for us historical parables. We can find no designation which expresses what he is for us. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name. As of old by the lakeside, he came to those men who knew him not. 
he speaks to us the same word, follow thou me, and sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill in our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship. And, as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. End of the Quest of the Historical Jesus, a critical study of its progress from Rimaris to Vreda. Translated from the German by William Montgomery. Recorded for LibriVox by Joe Dickerson, September 2010.